Chapter 41 Gunning for Ode An eye blink, and they were in London. The dead men turned in all directions, silenced weapons already locked and loaded, while Tanith moved to the alley wall. Valkyrie stood beside Fletcher, realized she was holding her breath, and started breathing again. Tanith ran her hands over the bricks. Just give me a second, she murmured. Without taking his eyes off the rooftops, Ghastly frowned. You said you knew how to get us through. I know how to get us through from the other side, she said. I just have to find out how to do it from this one. The more seconds that dragged by, the more Valkyrie expected the alley to fill with cleavers. Ghastly and Ravel were keeping their mouths shut, but she could tell they were furious. Saracen, Skullduggery said, I don't suppose you could help her out, could you? Saracen shook his head. I have no idea how to get us through, I'm afraid, although I can tell you that if we do get through, there isn't an army laying in wait for us. Oh, well, that's something. Found it, Tanit said. See? Told you I could do it. Everyone face the wall now. When you start to tingle, walk on through. They formed up, and Skullduggery looked at Fletcher. The moment we're inside, teleport out. When we're in position, we'll signal you. Fletcher nodded, gave a good luck wink to Valkyrie, and then a light hit them, and Valkyrie felt her whole body start to buzz. Skullduggery was in front of her, and the light was making him glow so much he was almost transparent. Suddenly they were all moving, walking forward through the wall, and Valkyrie couldn't help it. She closed her eyes as she passed through the bricks. When she opened them, they were standing in a dimly lit storeroom, and none of them were glowing any more. No words were spoken. Saracen moved to the door, nodded to the others, and they swarmed out into the corridor, weapons ready to fire. Valkyrie stayed in the middle. She'd been through the door enough times with Skullduggery to know what to do in situations like this. But it was very different going through with a team. At any given moment, there were guns pointed in five or six different directions. When it was just the two of them, Skullduggery would scan all corners, check all doorways, and clear all rooms. As a squad, though, they all seemed to rely on Saracen's hand signals for which rooms were empty and which rooms were occupied. Obeying without question, they avoided every possible confrontation. Saracen Rue knows things, they'd said. They hadn't been exaggerating. Their passage through the building was done in silence. Even the way they moved was silent, their quick footsteps strangely muted on the polished floor. Security cameras were disabled as they went. Almost one minute after they had arrived, they split up without a word. Valkyrie and Skullduggery took the stairs towards the repository, avoiding all sorcerers who passed. They reached a corner and peered round. At the doors to the repository, a boy of around fifteen was standing beside a cleaver. While the cleaver stood straight and unmoving, the boy was obviously having a hard time keeping still. Valkyrie felt Skullduggery's arm encircle her waist, pull her tight to his side. They waited there for the boy to get so bored that he started to look around. And then he did it. The boy glanced at the cleaver beside him, taking his eyes off the corridor, and Skullduggery lunged taking Valkyrie with him. They flew towards the repository. The cleaver snapped his head round, but it was too late. Valkyrie slammed into the boy, and Skullduggery collided with the cleaver. Such was the force of the collision that the repository doors burst open and all four of them fell through. Valkyrie rolled with the boy, glimpsing his wide eyes, the shock on his face. She got to her feet, hauled him up. He tried to hit her, but she caught his arm, pinned it between them. He struggled, but she was stronger than he was. She didn't want to hurt him. He was still in training. He was just doing what he was told. But then he opened his mouth to shout, and she didn't have a choice. Her gauntlet-clad elbow cracked into his jaw, and he was suddenly a dead weight in her arms. She laid him on the floor and turned to Skullduggery just as he managed to get the cleaver in his sleeper hold. When the cleaver's struggles ceased, Skullduggery dumped him on the ground and straightened his tie. 
The repository was bigger than the one in Ireland, but as Valkyrie walked the aisles, she decided that the artifacts on display were simply not as impressive, and there were a lot of gaps on those shelves. She reached the end of the first row, saw an empty glass case of a few steps. A plaque on the side informed her that it was meant to hold the God-Killer sword, and she wondered why they hadn't bothered removing it yet. Tanith had stolen the sword and Sanguid had melted it down. No matter how much they hoped and prayed, that case was going to remain empty. She started down the second row, scanning the shelves. She got to the end, to where Skullduggery had shackled the cleaver and the boy, and then Skullduggery walked out of the aisle to her right. Found one, he said, tossing her the cloaking sphere. They moved to the doors, and she twisted the hemispheres away from each other. A bubble of invisibility enveloped them as they stepped out. Staying close, they jogged the length of the corridor, took the stairs up. They passed a half-dozen mages, each one as oblivious to their presence as the last. When they got to the top floor, their progress slowed, as Skullduggery had to deactivate each security measure they came across. Finally, they made it to a set of white marble steps that led up to another corridor, this one decorated with paintings on the walls. A dark-haired girl dressed in black, around Valkyrie's age, stood at the base of the steps with her eyes fixed on the floor as an older mage scolded her. "'You have an assignment,' he was saying. "'Do you know what that is? We brought you in here with the others because we thought that you were up to the task.' "'You want to work in the sanctuary once your training is complete, don't you?' The girl muttered something. "'What was that? I didn't hear you, Ivy.' "'Yes,' the girl said suddenly. "'And is this how you intend to achieve that goal, by slacking off?' Ivy shrugged. "'It's boring.' The mage stiffened. "'What?' She looked at him. "'It's boring. Standing in the same place for hours, I got bored. "'So you went for a walk?' I just want to be near the action. There is no action, Ivy. Everyone on guard duty is as bored as you are, but they don't let it affect them. They do their duty. You should feel honoured. You're the last sentry before the Grand Mage's office. I expect more from you. Do you understand? Yeah, Ivy said, then added, a sir for good measure. The mage sighed. Return to your post. I'll be back shortly. The mage walked off, passing within an arm's reach of Valkyrie, and Ivy rolled her eyes at his back, then plodded up the steps. I'll take him out, Skullduggery said. You take the girl. Skullduggery stepped out of the bubble and hurried after the mage. Valkyrie reduced the size of the bubble so that it was just big enough to conceal her, then put the sphere in her jacket pocket. She climbed the steps and stood right in front of Ivy for a moment. Such an odd feeling, to be this close to someone without them knowing. She moved around behind, loosened her arms in her sleeves, and stepped up for a sleeper hold. Then the sphere fell from her pocket and bounced on the floor, and she looked down at it as it rolled away. The instant she was out of the bubble, the sphere vanished from sight. She looked up again. Ivy was staring at her. A moment. Valkyrie moved, but Ivy was faster. Her hand shot out, the heel of her palm smacking into Valkyrie's cheek. Valkyrie stumbled, absorbed two knee shots to the belly without much trouble, but was too slow to avoid the elbow that slammed into her ear. She reeled, cursing with the pain, and Ivy jumped on her back, legs wrapped round her while she went for a sleeper hold of her own. Immediately Valkyrie tucked her chin to her chest, but Ivy's arm tightened across her face instead. Valkyrie staggered. The pressure increased. Her jaw felt like it was about to dislocate. Valkyrie bent over, tried to throw Ivy off, but her hooks were in good and tight. The pain from the face crank was making her eyes water. Her mouth was open. She couldn't close it. She tilted again, almost losing her balance, almost falling. She couldn't fall. If she fell, it was game over. At least standing, she had a chance of shaking Ivy off. Ivy's weight shifted slightly. She was trying desperately to stay in place, but gravity was dragging her forward. Valkyrie shook herself harder. 
she stopped trying to pull the arms away from her face, and instead she went to Ivy's feet, dragging them slowly apart. She gave another jerk, and Ivy slid off her back, and the pressure was gone. She straightened, gasping. But Ivy pushed at the air, and Valkyrie crunched into the wall. She rebounded, stumbled towards Ivy as she stood, and went for the stick on her back. Her hand grasped at empty space, and Ivy hit her right on the chin. The world spun, and Valkyrie's knees gave out, and she fell. The stick was lying on the ground next to her head. I just want to tell you, Ivy said, standing over her, that I am a huge fan. She kicked, and Valkyrie tumbled down the steps and sprawled out across the floor. We're the same age, actually, Ivy continued, walking down after her. You're a few months older, but we're basically the same age. We kind of look alike, too, don't we? You're a bit taller, but we could be sisters if people didn't know us. They'd probably think we're sisters. Valkyrie got to her hands and knees, and Ivy slammed a kick into her ribs. I used to hear all the stories about you and Skullduggery. I mean, you were my age, you hadn't even had your surge, but you were out there, saving the world and fighting the faceless ones and remnants and... Okay, this is going to sound really lame, but it's because of you that I decided to be an elemental. Ivy waved her hand, and Valkyrie shot off the ground, flipping head over heels into a wall. She crashed to the ground. I had wanted to be an energy thrower, Ivy continued, because my friend was going to be an energy thrower, so I thought I'd do it too. But then you came along, and I mean, yeah, okay, you do a little necromancy, but really, you're an elemental, right? Like, that's what you're going to choose when all this is over, isn't it? Have you ever tried energy throwing? It is so cool. Valkyrie pulled herself up and a stream of energy burst from Ivy's hand and struck her shoulder, spinning her on the spot. But if you become an elemental after the surge, then I want to as well. It'd be another thing we have in common. Wouldn't it be great? Maybe we could team up sometime. That would be amazing. Valkyrie backed away. I know I probably sound like the biggest nerd in the world, Ivy laughed. But you've just... You've inspired me the way no one has before. I heard you were doing all this fight training, so I started to do fight training. Ivy lunged with a jab straight to Valkyrie's nose, followed it with an elbow to the side of the face, and then she grabbed her, hip threw her to the floor. We're even dressed alike, she continued, as Valkyrie struggled to get up. But your clothes are those special kind, aren't they? They protect you? Yeah, they're really hard to get, so... She blushed. And I can't believe... I'm about to ask this, but do you think maybe you could talk to your tailor for me, get him to make me some clothes? Do you think he would? Valkyrie got to one knee, wiped her eyes to clear them, and felt her nose. It was tender to the touch. A trickle of blood ran down to her lip. Make you clothes? she muttered. What size are you? Ivy's eyes widened in delight and her hands went to her mouth. You'll ask him? You'd do that for me? You have no idea how much that... The moment Ivy took her hands away from her face, Valkyrie's fist found her jaw. Ivy pinwheeled back, hit the wall, and slid along it, doing her best to stay upright. You have issues, Valkyrie told her. Seriously. You do. Ivy lurched towards her. Then her eyes rolled back in her head, and she dropped, unconscious. Resisting the urge to kick her, Valkyrie wiped the blood from her nose and went back to pick up her stick. Then she walked from wall to wall in a tight pattern, eyes on the floor, until she stepped through the invisibility bubble and the cloaking sphere appeared in front of her. She deactivated it, put it in her pocket, made sure it wouldn't fall out this time. You look a little worse for wear, Skullduggery said as he strolled back. Valkyrie scowled at Ivy's unconscious form. She cheated. She was better than me, Skullduggery shrugged. And yet you're standing and she isn't. You even managed to stop her from sounding the alarm. 
She didn't even try to, Valkyrie said. She was too busy yapping. Apparently I'm her hero. There really is no accounting for taste, he responded, starting down the corridor. She walked beside him. Shut up. I'm a great role model. I have many admirable features. Tight trousers don't count. What? Now there are criteria. They quietened down as they approached the door to Ode's office. Skullduggery took off his hat, laid it on the ground, and then pulled his gun from its holster. Valkyrie's hand went to the door handle. At Skullduggery's nod, she twisted and pushed it open, and Skullduggery stormed in. Ode lurched to his feet behind his desk as Skullduggery pushed at the air and managed to brace his open palm against the rippling onslaught, deflecting it around him. Valkyrie darted to one side, whipping shadows at Ode's arm, but the air moved sharply and cut through the tendril. Even as it dissipated, a column of air slammed into her chest and drove her back. She tumbled, glimpsing Skullduggery jumping over the desk and colliding with Ode. Shadows coiling round her hand, she crossed to the desk in three strides, only relaxing when she saw Skullduggery's gun jammed beneath the Grand Mage's chin. Hello, Cathurnus, Skullduggery said. Chapter 42 Misdirection His free hand taking hold of Ode's robe, Skullduggery pulled him to his feet. Valkyrie hurried around shackling the old man's hands behind his back. Only then did Skullduggery step away, but he kept his gun leveled. You're not going to win, Ode said, his face tight. War isn't about winning or losing, Skullduggery replied. It's about playing the... Oh no, wait. It is about winning or losing. And we're winning. We have you, don't we? I am not the Supreme Council, said Ode. No, but you're a pretty big piece. So what are you going to do? Parade me around in chains? Execute me? It doesn't matter. The others will not stop until you are defeated. Nonsense. The others will stop when this becomes a war they cannot afford to fight. They'll stop when they run out of leaders. They'll stop when they run out of supporters. There are many reasons they'll stop, Cathernus. You just have to use your imagination. Glib answers won't win this war. But that's all you have, isn't it? How do you expect to get me out of here? Do you even have a plan? Someone like you— Valkyrie took a hood from her pocket and pulled it over Ode's head. The moment it was in place, his words were muted. He could be screaming at the top of his voice— but no one would hear it. Thank you, Skullduggery said to her. I fear he was about to start insulting me. I couldn't let that happen, she said. Your ego is a fragile and delicate thing. You see, you understand me. A bubble of invisibility enveloped them again, and they hurried through the sanctuary. No alarms raised yet, which was a good sign. When they got to the great chamber, Saracen was already here, a bag slung over his shoulder. He had found a sigil carved into the wall and was in the process of making his own adjustments, which would render it inert. Ghastly and Ravel led Lori Reticent into the great chamber, her head covered like odes. Vex and Shudder came next. Palava Graves, unconscious and carried over Shudder's shoulder. He put up a foot? Vex asked. He wouldn't stop screaming. Shudder answered. Have all of the sigils been found? There should be another one over there somewhere, Saracen said, nodding to the wall on his left, but not looking up from what he was doing. Ravel hurried over, started running his hand over the wall's surface. Encounter any resistance? Skullduggery asked. Some, said Ghastly. We probably don't have an awful lot of time. An alarm started wailing. Though I could be wrong. Skullduggery drew his gun and Valkyrie joined him at the doorway. Cleavers and sorcerers ran by. Skullduggery closed the door and splayed his hand, the air pressure keeping it tightly shut. How are the sigils coming along, gentlemen? Disabled, said Saracen, 
running over to help Ravel just as he found the last one. The door handle turned. Someone knocked, and a man's voice called. Eh, uh, hello? Valkyrie looked at Skaldaggery, looked back at the others, looked at Skaldaggery again. Hello, Skaldaggery said, speaking loudly to be heard over the alarm. Hi, said the man. The door's locked. Is it? Yes. That's funny, said Skaldaggery. Hold on a moment. He reached out, jiggled the handle a few times, then stepped back. Yes, it's locked. You wouldn't happen to have the key, would you? There was a delay in response from the other side. I'm sorry, the man called. Who am I speaking with? Skaldaggery tilted his head. Who am I speaking with? This is Oscar Nightfall. Are you sure? What? Are you sure you are who you say you are? This is the Great Chamber, after all. It's a very important place for very important people. It is not beyond the realms of possibility that someone, and I'm not saying that this applies to you in particular, but someone could conceivably lie about who they are in order to gain access to this room. I have to be vigilant, especially now. There's a war on, you know. Oscar Nightfall sounded puzzled. Who are you? Me? I'm nobody. I'm a cleaner. I'm one of the cleaners. I was cleaning the thrones, and the door shut behind me. Now I can't get out. Could you try and find a key? What's your name? Give me your name. No, it's mine. Tell me your name. My name is Oscar Nightfall. What? No, it isn't. That's my name. It is? Since when? Since I took it. You didn't ask me if you could take it. I was using it first. Open this door immediately. I don't have the key. I'll fetch the cleavers. I found the key. It was in the keyhole. It's always the last place you look, isn't it? I'm unlocking the door now. Here we go. Skullduggery relaxed the air pressure, opened the door, and pulled Oscar Nightfall inside. Valkyrie stuck out her foot, and Oscar stumbled over it, and Vex shoved him to Ghastly, and Ghastly punched him. Oscar fell down and didn't get up again. Skullduggery closed the door once more. Sigil? he asked. Ravel and Saracen walked over. Disabled, Ravel said, pressing a flat piece of black metal he'd taken from his pocket. A moment later, Fletcher appeared, wincing at the volume of the alarm. That is loud, he said. Everyone ready? Down, Skullduggery barked, swinging his gun round. Fletcher vanished, and Valkyrie saw the cleaver behind him, climbing from the hidden compartment in the floor. Skullduggery thought better of firing his gun, and he pushed at the air. The cleaver wove through the rippling space, and Skullduggery sprang at him, even as two more cleavers emerged from the compartments on either side. One of them dodged Vex's energy stream, and the other slashed at Ghastly as he ran up. Valkyrie hurried to the elders, making sure they didn't run off. Fletcher was beside her. Three more cleavers climbed through. Behind them, the doors burst open. Sorcerers spilled into the chamber. Valkyrie grabbed the Grand Mage and spun him round, kicked at the back of his leg to bring him to his knees. Her fingers curled, sharpened shadows pressing into his throat beneath the hood. Nobody move, she shouted. The fighting froze. All eyes turned to her. Anyone tries anything, she said, and I'll take his head off and Fletcher will teleport us out of here before you can blink. Skullduggery? Gentlemen? Skullduggery picked himself up, his fallen gun drifting into its holster. The other dead men backed away from their opponents, taking the elders with them. A sorcerer Valkyrie had met once stepped forward slowly. His name was Scarecrow something. Severn, she remembered. We can't allow you to take them, said Scarecrow Severn. The elders would rather die than be used against their own people. And I don't believe you kill the Grand Mage, Valkyrie. We all know you. We all know you're a decent and honourable person. Desperate times, said Fletcher. We can all go a little crazy. Skullduggery moved closer to Valkyrie, and all around the room weapons were raised. Not one more step, said Scarecrow. Any of you. One more step means we attack. 
Then we seem to be at an impasse, said Ravel. If you move, violence erupts. If we move, violence erupts also. That's a lot of erupting violence. You can leave, said Scarecrow. The elders remain with us, but you can teleport out of here. That way nobody gets hurt. Oscar's a little hurt, said Vex. But nobody likes him. Beneath his hood, Palava Graves was shaking his head quickly. He was ignored. How about a compromise, Skullduggery said. We'll leave you with Elder Graves, and we'll just take the other two. Scarecrow gave a little smile. Sorry, Skullduggery. No compromises. Ravel sighed. But we've gone to all this trouble. We got in here, split up, sneaked around, got all three of your bosses. If we leave empty-handed, what's the point? It's a tad anticlimactic, is all I'm saying. You won't be leaving here empty-handed. You'll be leaving here with your lives. And you won't even have to kill any of us along the way. Well, friends, Erskine, you don't want to kill me, do you? I'm not sure, said Ravel. You are pretty smug right now. Palaver Graves tried standing, but Shudder put one hand to his shoulder and kept him down. Scarecrow lowered his weapon. Everyone else kept theirs raised. I don't like what the Supreme Council is doing, he said, but I agree with what they say. Ireland is too unstable. It needs help. I'm not going to get into an argument with you because I know I won't win. I don't like this war as necessary as it may be. I don't like fighting my friends. I'll fight, and I'll kill if I have to, but if I'm given a fair chance to avoid it, I'll take it. Someone was making their way through the crowd. Valkyrie tensed. A slender woman appeared by Scarecrow's side. Pardon the intrusion, she said. Scarecrow glanced at her, frowning. Er, this is our administrator. Merriwin hyphenate bash. Merriwin, can this wait? We're kind of in the middle of a standoff. I understand that, Mr. Seven, said Merriwin. But I have just heard some news that may facilitate the departure of the dead men at their earliest convenience. If I may? Scarecrow hesitated then. Sure. Go ahead. Merriwin's eyes moved over the dead men. You will, of course, doubt what I am about to tell you, but I assure you it is the truth. Your allies, the councils of both the Australian and African sanctuaries, have been killed. It was the result of no military action undertaken by us or our colleagues on the Supreme Council, although my knowledge of their plans is admittedly limited. Ghastly stared at her. What? Grand Mage Carrick and his elders were caught in a bomb blast as they met with their military advisers. Grand Mage Ubuntu and his elders were slaughtered in their beds. Nobody has been arrested or detained for their assassinations. When? Skullduggery asked. Less than five minutes ago, Merriwan said. Both sets of assassinations occurred within moments of each other. Ravel's frown deepened. Something this sneaky... This brutal has Renato Bishahalani's fingerprints all over it. And if Bishahalani was involved, then Ode was involved. You don't know that, Scarecrow said. If the Supreme Council didn't do this, then who the hell did? There are plenty of suspects, said Scarecrow. What about the warlocks? They've been making trouble, right? It could have been them. If the warlocks were behind this, Skullduggery said, it wouldn't be just the elders who were killed. Their entire sanctuaries would be devoid of life and dripping with blood. Ode shook his head. Valkyrie hesitated, then pulled off the hood. We didn't do this, Ode said immediately. I give you my word. I had no knowledge of any planned action against Carrick or Ubuntu, and I am willing to bet my life that Bishop Halani didn't either. You're on your knees in the hands of your enemies, Shudder murmured. Your word means little. Ode shifted round to look at Skullduggery and Ravel. Damn it, we didn't do this. We didn't want them dead. We just wanted them to stay out of the fighting. 
How does this help us? Their sorcerers are going to be calling for our blood now. Their deaths mean we now have three cradles of magic fully invested in this war, and that is not what we wanted. We'll have our sensitives pick through your mind, said Ghastly. They'll get to the truth. Scarecrow took another step forward. I told you, he said, you're not taking them. Release them, and we'll let you leave. And there you have my word. Anton Shudder, is my word good enough for you? Shudder observed Scarecrow for the longest time and nodded. Aye, he said. Valkyrie stayed where she was and only stepped away from Ode when Skullduggery nodded to her. The elders were left where they were and the dead men surrounded Fletcher. Palaver scrambled to his feet, shaking his head violently until someone pulled the hood off. They're not after us, he screeched. They took something from the science archive. Stop them! And then they teleported. Chapter 43 Undercover Keeping the town safe, Scapegrace embarked on his nightly patrol with narrowed eyes and a keen sense of smell. Evil had an aroma, a stench, and if there was anything that would lead him to Silas Nadir, it would be his nose. Maybe. He quite liked having a nose, but he had spent so long without one, as a head in a jar, that there was perhaps a slim chance that he was putting too much faith in his new one. Could noses smell evil? He didn't know. We should probably hold hands, said Thrasher. Scapegrace scowled at him. What? We're undercover, sir. We're a loving couple out for a midnight stroll. That's what loving couples do. We're not holding hands. It might look suspicious if we don't, sir. Against his better judgment, Scapegrace allowed Thrasher to take his hand, and they walked on. Beautiful night, isn't it? said Thrasher. Shut up. Oh, but we should talk, sir. It might look suspicious if we don't talk. Scapegrace glowered. Fine. Yes, it's a nice night. The moon is nice. The stars are nice. The town is nice. Everything is nice. Do you see yourself settling down here, master? What? A car approached. We should kiss, sir. We are not kissing. It might look suspicious if we don't kiss. The car was getting closer, and Thrasher turned to him and leaned in, lips pursed, and Scapegrace leaned back, lips in a tight line. Thrasher's eyes were closed, his eyebrows raised. Scapegrace put a hand to the idiot's face and pushed back. The car passed, and in the swoop of the headlights, Scapegrace saw something. A figure stole through the shadows ahead of them. Slim, dressed in black, a woman. Scapegrace shoved Thrasher away and crept after his quarry. An acolyte of Silas Nadir, perhaps? Scapegrace had heard stories about the kind of lunatics who were drawn to serial killers. Maybe this woman wasn't the only one. Maybe there were dozens, hundreds. Could this entire town be one big cult, obeying Silas Nadir's every poisonous word? Scapegrace forced himself to keep going. Fear had no place in the heart of Roar Haven's protector. With Thrasher stumbling around behind him, Scapegrace followed the woman to a clearing behind a short row of houses. He squatted down as the woman stopped walking. Thrasher hunkered down beside him and stared at the woman. Is that... is that Madame Mist? he whispered. Even as he asked the question, Scapegrace saw the black veil, and he sagged. Madame Mist was an elder. She was scary and made his insides go cold but she wouldn't have anything to do with someone like Nadir. Disappointed, he was about to turn round and head back when a man appeared before Mist, his image flickering. That's shunting, Thrasher whispered excitedly. That's what he looks like. That must be him, sir. That's Silas Nadir. The man stopped flickering. He was small 
slim, wearing a long coat and carrying an umbrella that was dripping wet, as if he'd just been in a rainstorm. Scapegrace gazed into the face of his arch-nemesis. He couldn't really see a whole lot because of the distance and the fact that it was dark, but that in no way detracted from the drama of the moment. Some words were said, and the man handed the umbrella to Mist, who held it over her head despite the clear night sky. Then the man took hold of her other hand, and she flickered and vanished, leaving him alone in the clearing. Scapegrace pulled on his mask, and Thrasher did the same. As the man started walking, they crept after him, keeping low and sticking to the shadows. They moved parallel to him for the most part, then Scapegrace gave a series of sharp hand signals. "'Is there something wrong with your hand, master?' Thrasher whispered. Scapegrace scowled. "'Let's rush him!' "'Oh!' said Thrasher, suddenly sounding even more nervous than usual. "'Okay, if you think that's wise!' Scapegrace didn't bother answering him. They crept closer and closer, and then Scapegrace led the charge, slamming into the man from behind. Thrasher came with him, roaring in fear, and they all went down. Scapegrace rolled clear of the scuffle, then shoved Thrasher on top of the struggling man. "'Get off me!' the man cried. Scapegrace sneered down at him. "'You'd like that, wouldn't you?' "'Yes!' the man gasped. "'Village idiot, stay where you are!' Thrasher whimpered something about Muscle Man, but did what he was told. Scapegrace put a foot on Thrasher's back, pressed down, and the man gasped again. "'What do you people want?' "'Justice,' said Scapegrace. "'A world where the innocent are free to enjoy their lives, "'save from the knowledge that they won't be horribly killed "'by a crazed, dimension-hopping serial killer.' "'You... you think I'm Silas Nadir?' "'I know you are Silas Nadir. "'I am not Silas Nadir. "'That's something only Silas Nadir would say.' "'No, it isn't. "'That's something that anyone who isn't Silas Nadir would say.' Scapegrace frowned. That made sense. Then he shook his head. Nice try, Nadir, but you won't defeat me with logic. I am the dark and stormy night. I am Roarhaven's protector, and logic holds no sway over me. I am not Nadir, you idiot. Then who are you? And where did you send Madame Mist? The man glared. You saw that? Scapegrace sneered again. I see all. Then you're a dead woman, the sneer dropped. I'm sorry? I don't know who you are, but if you've been spying on Madame Mist, then you don't have long to live. Once she hears about this, she will hunt you down. There is nowhere you can run that she won't be able to find you. Now, just hold on a second. You think they're going to let two morons in masks ruin their plans? Do you have any idea what they've done to get this far? Do you have any idea what they're willing to do? What who are willing to do? Master, Thrasher said, I think I should get up. He's scaring me. They've been planning this for a hundred years, the man continued, breathing easier now that Thrasher had moved off him. Their reach stretches around the globe. They have people everywhere. The man stood, still glaring. You have no idea. You could not even begin to fathom the depths to which they have sunk. You don't know what they're prepared to risk. What are they prepared to? Annihilation, the man said. Extinction. You're looking for Nadir, is that it? He's not here. But what you found instead is your own destruction. We haven't found that, Scapegrace insisted. And we haven't been following Madame Mist. We just saw her once, that's all. There's really no need to tell her or anyone about this. It was a mistake. We thought you were Silas Nadir. Obviously, you're not. Huge, gigantic apologies. Still, no harm done. We'll part ways here, go about our lives, and never speak of this again. Please, don't kill us, Thrasher said. It's too late for that, said the man. Then Scapegrace had an idea. Run, he said to Thrasher, and sprinted away. As they raced through the back alleys of Roarhaven, 
he tore the mask from his face and hurled it into the darkness. Let them try and find him now. Chapter 44 The Call to Action As with everything lately, there was good news and there was bad news. The good news was that Dr. Nye was already at work in the keep, installing the new memory processing unit in the engineer. Once it was in, the engineer could shut down the accelerator before it drove insane, everyone who had even the slightest spark of magic in them. This was good. This was something to be celebrated. The bad news was that Marywan hyphenate Bash had not been lying about the African and Australian councils being hit. Suddenly Ireland's only allies were reeling against the ropes, and there was nothing they could do about it. Valkyrie didn't like feeling helpless. She much preferred having something to hit. Ow! said Maya Sotis Terra. Sorry, Valkyrie said, breathing hard and grinning as they circled each other. Maya Sotis came in low, then switched high with a kick that turned out to be a feint. When Valkyrie swerved to avoid it, Maya Sotis spun, her foot crashing into Valkyrie's legs. She hit the ground, and Maya Sotis dropped onto her. They rolled. Maya Sotis found her back, and Valkyrie tried to turn into her. But the choke was on, and Valkyrie had no choice but to tap. They sat up. Valkyrie wiped the sweat away. Are you all right? Maya Sotis asked. Valkyrie had known her for years, but only remembered her when she was in sight. A handy trick for a thief and a spy. Not so handy for maintaining friendships. You don't seem like your usual self. I'm fine, Valkyrie said. Well, maybe I'm still a little annoyed that that ivy girl beat the hell out of me. Ah, Maya Sotis smiled. Wounded pride. No, it's not that, it's... Well, okay, maybe it is that. But I'm supposed to be the cool one. I'm the youngest, the strongest, the most special. And then this little upstart, said Maya Sotis, this little nourish comes in and shows you up by being younger and stronger and cooler than you. Well, Valkyrie said, frowning, I don't know about cooler. Face it, Val... Maya Sotis said, lying back on the training mat. You're getting old. Shut up. I'm only eighteen. And she's seventeen. You're over the hill. Yesterday's news. I swear to God, the only reason I'm not pounding your face into smush right now is because I'd hate to embarrass you in your home country. Maya Sotis laughed. They got up, used the hotel showers, and Valkyrie went to look for Skullduggery. He was heading to Ravel's makeshift office when she found him. You look freshly scrubbed, he said, as she fell into step. Yeah, she said. Just had a workout. Did Maya Sotis kick you around the place again? She frowned. Who? Ravel looked up when they walked in. Skullduggery took a seat. You look dreadful, Valkyrie glared. Skullduggery, be positive. Sorry, said Skullduggery. You look positively dreadful. Ravel gave the briefest of smiles. You know, I'm starting to think I may be in over my head here. Really? You? Do you think I am? I'm going to be polite and encouraging and say it doesn't matter what I think. Skullduggery, Valkyrie said. No, Ravel said. He's right. I was never meant to be Grand Mage. Caravel Juice was. He would have been a great Grand Mage. This wouldn't have happened if he were in charge. If only he hadn't been bludgeoned to death by a remnant, said Skullduggery. Ravel winced. Don't say bludgeoned. He was struck once on the head. And it killed him, said Skullduggery. And that counts as a bludgeoning. But bludgeoning makes it sound a lot more violent than it actually was. When I think about it, I like to think that he was taken by surprise, that he never even knew what hit him, Ravel sighed. He was a good man. I learned so much during the years I spent at his side. The people he met with, sorcerers who hated mortals, who wanted to rule over them, who wanted to enslave them. Carival would meet and talk and listen, and by the end he'd almost have them convinced 
that the only way forward was to step even further back into the shadows. I used to just stand there and watch in amazement. If he had lived, I'd say we'd already be in the middle of discussions on how to effectively curb the use of magic in our day-to-day -day lives. Valkyrie made a fess. I don't much like the sound of that. Ravel smiled. Carvel would have convinced you. Magic, he used to say, should only be used to protect the mortals. And look at us now. Will any of us even think about the mortals until this war is over? Now that you've broached the subject, said Skullduggery, and let his words hang, our friends in Australia and Africa don't know what to do. They're panicking, I suppose. Angry, scared. They don't want to hold elections. They want to hit something. They've asked me to appoint interim elders from within their sanctuaries until all this is over. The files? Ravel lifted a folder from the pile and let it fall again. All likely candidates. We know most of them. Some are astonishingly ill-suited to the task, but others are possibilities. Ghastly's helping me go through them, but it's... It's not what you signed up for, Skullduggery finished. We're finding it hard enough to run our own sanctuary, and now they want us to help run theirs. The new elders, whoever they end up being, won't have half the experience of Ubuntu or Carrick. They'll be looking to us for leadership, and we'll be flailing around, trying to look like we know what we're doing. You've managed to be pretty convincing so far. I've led us into a war. But you've done it convincingly. The best thing to do now is probably let the dust settle for a few days, see how everything lies. No, Ravel said. Skullduggery tilted his head. No what? No. I can't let you go. That's what you're going to say, right? You want a few days off so you can look deeper into this warlock activity. The killings in Africa. I can't spare you. Either of you. Not at this stage. Things are too unstable. If the warlocks attack, Valkyrie said, things are going to get a lot worse. We don't know that they will attack. We don't know that they even want to attack. The last time Caravari was even seen was a hundred years ago. Skullduggery nodded. When he killed an entire town for the death of one warlock. Ravel frowned. You sound like you have something to say. Someone has been killing warlocks, Erskine. Dozens of them over the last five years. If Caravari killed a town for one... What will he do for dozens? Who's killing them? All the evidence points to Department X. Department X doesn't exist. I didn't say they did. I just said all the evidence points to them. So, someone's setting up a non-existent organization? A non-existent mortal organization. Ravel closed his eyes. Oh, this just gets better. Dare I ask who is setting up the mortals? The torment. Ravel cracked one eye open. He's still dead, right? Yes, but his associates aren't. We're looking for a mystery man who associates with mist and other unsavory characters. And why the hell am I only hearing about this now? Skullduggery shrugged. You've had a war to blunder through. We didn't want to burden you unnecessarily. But now you've decided to burden me anyway. Thanks. So where did you want to go? I got a message from China, Valkyrie said. A warlock's been spotted in Africa. Africa's a big place. Mozambique. Mozambique is a big place. This warlock, we think it might have been Caravari himself. He killed eighteen sorcerers. Ravel blinked. Eighteen? Sixteen African, plus two foreign. We think they were Supreme Council operatives. Do you have any idea where you'd even start looking? We're detectives, Skullduggery said. We follow the trail. And how long would that take? I can't let you go. You know I can't let you go. If you didn't already know it, you'd be convincing me right now to let you go. 
but you're not, so... The warlocks are a threat, Erskin, and someone from Roarhaven is luring them towards the mortals, using Department X as bait. It's tied up in this war somehow. We just haven't figured out how yet. Please don't tell me we have to go to war with Roarhaven. Not yet. Look, if you can't send us, send someone else. Either way, we need to... The door opened, and Ghastly walked in, lips set in a straight line. They've taken the bait, he said. Mantis is attacking the keep. Chapter 45 Under Attack Fletcher arrived in the lab as Nye and Clarabel were manoeuvring the engineer up to a standing position. Alarms wailed. Where are the others? Fletcher asked, making Nye jerk round, its small yellow eyes opening wide. Do not do that, it said. I have a delicate heart that it keeps in a jar on its desk, Clarabel whispered loudly. Nye glared at her then looked back at Fletcher. The monster hunters and Mr. Mabry have not reached us yet. Perhaps we should teleport without them. They may very well be dead. Or we could wait a minute, Clarabel suggested. What about the engineer? Fletcher asked. Is it working? I am, Mr. Fletcher, the engineer said, fully functioning and mobile. How are you? I'm good, Fletcher muttered, hurrying to the door and peeking out. Everyone stay here, he said. I'll be right back. He took off running, hearing now the sounds of explosions over the alarm. There were hollow men up ahead, shuffling quickly for the exit, eager in their own way to join the fight. Fletcher got to a cracked window. Through the clouds of green gas he saw stumbling figures and flashes of coloured energy, and then a dark shape ran straight at him. He ducked back as Gracious came smashing through the glass, landing in a spectacularly bad roll-sprawl combo. Donegan jumped through next, followed by Mabry. All three of them were coughing, with tears streaming from their eyes. They've taken the bait, Donegan wheezed. We should probably go. They linked arms, and Fletcher teleported them back to the lab where he collected Clarabella Nye and the engineer, and then they were outside in the fresh air, down the other end of the valley, right where Fletcher had teleported the dead men and their army a mere two minutes earlier. Skullduggery looked round. You took your time. Our fault, Gracious coughed. We wanted to see <coughs> how many of the enemy we could take down before we had to retreat. Valkyrie walked over. How many did you manage? I didn't get any... Gracious said. Donegan, you almost took down that tall guy, didn't you? Donegan was too busy coughing to answer. But then the tall guy started hitting you, so you stopped and ran away. Mabry? Mabry pressed his fingertips against his closed eyelids. I was going right for Mantis, but then that bloody gas got in my eyes and, I don't know, some massive bloke reared up in front of me. I hit him, but I swear it was like hitting a wall. Gracious nodded. You hit a wall. Mabry blinked at him. I what? I saw it. You ran into a cloud of gas and stumbled around for a second until you reached a wall, and then you shrieked and punched it. It was very heroic. Fletcher moved away from them, looked up the valley towards the keep. Hundreds of sorcerers just realising they'd been had. Valkyrie stood beside him. Scary sight, isn't it? They've got an army up there. She shrugged. We've got an army down here. Skullduggery expects them to hunker down in the keep for the time being until they come up with some kind of plan. And what's our plan? You teleport Nye and Clarabel and the engineer back to Roarhaven and we wait right where we are. They'll have to come to us eventually. So it worked. The plan worked. Valkyrie grinned. Don't you love it when that happens? Fletcher took Dr. Nye Clarabel and the engineer back to the sanctuary, where the engineer immediately began the deactivation process for the accelerator. He returned to the valley minutes later, and Gracious saw him, walked over, and clamped a hand on his shoulder. The fellowship is together once again. Sorry? 
We quest, young Fletcher. We travel far to strange lands, seeking strange people, eating strange food, saying strange things. We are a fellowship of three, comrades in arms, friends, brothers. Uh, we've been assigned to investigate some warlock activity in Mozambique, said Dunnigan. We were told it could be incredibly dangerous, so we're taking you along with us to get us out of there if things go wrong. It will be a great adventure, said Gracious. They will sing songs of this. Seriously, Donegan said. Stop talking like that. But we go questing. We're going hunting, just like we always do. Don't let him worry you, Fletcher. We've done this a thousand times and we'll do it a thousand times more. We're professionals. I'm going to wear my shorts, Gracious announced. Donegan glared. You'll get some burnt. I can handle it. No, you can't. We're going to Mozambique. I have to wear my shorts and my Lion King t-shirt and sing Hakuna Matata. It's the only words of Swahili I know. And what happens when you get sunburnt? Who has to hear you complain about it, eh? I do. Fletcher, have you been to Africa before? Yes, Fletcher said. I've been to all three sanctuaries and, like, a few other places. I went over to see lions and stuff. Did you see any? Yes, lots. It was cool. Excellent, said Donegan. Well, we probably won't be seeing any lines on this trip, I'm afraid. We'll be going to Maputo, asking a few questions and staying away from dangerous things. Danger is my middle name, said Gracious. No, it isn't, said Donegan. We'll be leaving as soon as I find fresh ammunition for my gun. Fletcher frowned. I thought you said we'd be staying away from dangerous things. I did. But there's no guarantee they'll stay away from us, hmm? Chapter 46 The New Captain Three days they'd been trapped in the keep, and Regis almost wanted someone to fire the first shot just to relieve the boredom. He raised the binoculars to his eyes and watched the Irish. Good people, good soldiers, experienced in battle and unforgiving to enemies. He never thought he'd have to go up against them. But life is what life is, as his mother used to say, and life's damn unfair when you think about it. How many now? asked Dachon, appearing so quietly beside him he almost jumped out of his skin. Scowling, Regis said, Four hundred, maybe five. Those woods down there are probably teeming with cleavers, though. I can see movement. Five hundred at the very least, Dachon said. Well, that's not so bad. That's practically two to one. And here I thought Mantis had led us into trouble. Regis glanced round to make sure no one had overheard. There wasn't a soul on the planet that he trusted more than Ashone. But the woman had a smart mouth that was going to get her killed one of these days. Not today, though. She squinted up at the sun. What do you reckon the chances are of the bosses having a big friendly conversation in the war being called off before we have to hit anybody? It's a nice day. Too nice to be killing people we used to call friends. Regis grunted. If they didn't call it off during those weeks we were skulking about and hiding in bushes, I doubt they're going to call it off now. You're just worried you'll find yourself face to face with Saracen Rue, and then you'll fall into his arms like last time. Ashon punched his shoulder. It hurt. I didn't fall into his arms. If anything, he fell into mine. No man can resist my smile. I've managed to these long years. Well, you're an especially grumpy man. That I am. To be honest, though, I'm rather hoping I don't see Saracen Rue on the battlefield. For a start, I'd have no interest in falling into his arms. And for another, if he's here... The rest of the dead men probably are, too. Ashon laughed. You don't believe the stories, do you? They're good, don't get me wrong, but they're not some unstoppable force. They can be beaten. Have you ever seen Anton Shudder on a battlefield? What about Skullduggery Pleasant? What kind of man can bring himself back from the dead with the pure power of his hatred alone? I don't want to go up against any of the dead men. Those two in particular. 
Ashon wrapped an arm round his shoulders. Don't you worry, Regis. You just situate yourself behind me and I'll bat my eyelashes at them. No man can resist my eyes. Or you could go after Cain. She'd be an easier target. Hmm. Don't know about that. She's still a girl. Feels wrong to fight someone who hasn't even had their surge yet. Well, what do you know? Regis has a streak of nobility left in him after all. That's me, all right. Regis the Noble. Regis the Dim-Witted, more like, said Rad Crockett, coming up behind them. A punk of a mage who'd taken his name in the 1980s and had failed utterly to live it down ever since. Rad had a thing for Ashon, and for everyone else he had nothing but a sneer and a smirk, except for Mantis, of course. When Mantis was around, that sneer was nowhere to be seen. The general wants to see you, Rad said, delivering his message and immediately turning his attention to Ashon. Hey, baby, you're looking well today. Ashon looked at him coldly. As opposed to yesterday, when I was ugly? What? said Rad. No, I meant... You calling me ugly? Is that what you're doing? No, I'm... What? I'm saying the opposite. You misunderstood. Ashon rounded on. Oh, so now I'm stupid as well as ugly. She came forward and Rad stepped back. And Regis shook his head. Ashon, will you give the poor lad a break? He doesn't get your sense of humor. Rad spun round. I don't need your help, Grandpa. Why don't you shuffle off and let me and Ashon talk? Regis sighed. Ashon, have at it, he said, and walked away to the sound of Ashon berating the little punk to within an inch of his miserable little life. The camp at the keep was small and neatly ordered. The jeeps and trucks were parked bumper to bumper round the perimeter, like in the old days when they used to circle the wagons. Bolstering the defences were a whole heap of sigils and contraptions and things Regis didn't understand. He only knew that they kept him safe, and that was good enough for him. He passed sorcerers cleaning guns and sharpening swords, talking and laughing among themselves. There was a nervous energy in the air, like maybe this was the day they'd meet the enemy. There were plenty who said they wanted to fight, but most who said that were either stupid or lying or both. There were, of course, those who wanted to fight, and were neither stupid nor lying, and they were the dangerous ones. For most of his adult years, Regis had done his best to avoid fighting if it were at all possible. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Life is life, after all. The general's tent was uncolored canvas held together with patches and clumsy stitching. It was charmless, to say the least, and despite the warmth of the day, the inside was cool to the point of coldness. Regis nodded to the cleavers at the entrance and passed between them. The activity within was centered round a large table with a large map spread over it. Standing with his hands flat on the table was Captain Glass, whom Regis could find few nice words to say about. To Glass's left was Captain Tortura, a woman who never looked at Regis with anything more than mild distaste. And beside her was Captain Sabre, who seemed to have developed a deep-seated loathing of Regis since the last time they'd met. The exact center of the tent was the highest point, and the only spot General Mantis could stand without having to stoop. Mantis was a Krenga, a species that had hovered on the edge of extinction since long before Regis was born. But somehow those long-limbed, genderless creatures had never quite slipped into the crumbling pages of history. When Regis was a boy, there had been stories of whole colonies of Krenga living in the hills of some far-off mystical island. But when Regis had been a boy... There were stories of practically everything. Mr. Regis, said Mantis. Its tortured voice filtered through the bizarrely oversized gas mask at war. We are in need of a fresh pair of eyes. 
Perhaps you would look upon this map and tell us what you see. Regis came forward. It was a map of the surrounding area. Its hills gathered in clustered lines, and a river snaking through it. No towns, no settlements, no mortals. On the largest hill on the map there was a tin figure of a man waving a little blue flag. Sabre's toys, he knew. Further on down the shallow valley, there were three other tin men close together, and a fourth in the middle of the woods. All of these carried red flags. Well, said Regis, taking his time to make sure he hadn't missed anything, it seems to me that we're about to be overrun by four tiny little men who, to be honest, shouldn't cause us too much trouble. Will you please take this seriously? Sabre growled. I'll do my best, said Regis, resisting the urge to pick up the tin man and start doing silly voices. Mantis traced its long, cellophane-wrapped finger round the edge of the hill. Our defences are solid to the north, south, and west. To the east, our enemy lies. Regis frowned. Wouldn't it be prudent to reinforce our defences on that side, sir? It would seem to be the logical move. Mantis nodded its head. That it would, Mr. Regis. Were we planning on staying here even longer than we already have? However, due to our dwindling supplies, we cannot put this off any longer. Our plan is to pour forth, to charge our enemy and take the fight to them. It will be glorious. And will be suicide. Um, said Regis, but wouldn't we be running straight into, you know, superior numbers? And we'd also be giving up the high ground, which is something we maybe shouldn't give up? What's the matter, Regis? said Captain Totora, a mocking smile on her lips. Afraid of a little fighting? Yes, Regis answered. I'm terrified of this stuff. It's bad for your health and should be avoided at all costs. Begging your pardon, General, but why? We've been sneaking around for weeks. We've been playing the long game. Why suddenly change your tactics? Mantis looked at him. Its small yellow eyes magnified by the helmet until the general resembled some kind of great blinking owl. You don't approve? Regis hesitated. It's not that I don't approve, sir. It's just that up till now we have demonstrated great patience and cunning. I'm simply wondering why we have chosen this point in time to start charging and screaming and fighting and dying, sir. You're a coward, said Sabre. You show me a brave man and I'll show you a dead one, said Regis. We may well be giving up the high ground, Manta said. But we are not doing it without good reason. I see, sir, Regis said, but he didn't really see in the slightest. Beg pardon, General, but why am I here? Because when we decide to go, we will need a company to lead the charge. Are you looking for volunteers, sir? Under whose command would this company be? It wouldn't be glass. Regis knew that much might get his boots dirty. It might be Sabre, but the danger would be he'd want all the glory for himself and get everyone else killed. Totora, then? She'd be more than capable. But whether or not Mantis was willing to risk losing his best captain in the field was another matter entirely. Regis looked up, realized that everyone was looking at him, and the bottom dropped out of his stomach. Congratulations! Captain Regis, Manta said, you've just been promoted. Chapter 47 Ajuoga Maputu was a city reeling. Not on the outside, of course. Its streets were full of the noise and bustle that Fletcher had come to associate with the place on his half a dozen trips to Mozambique. As far as the mortals were concerned, nothing had changed. Life continued plodding onwards. But for the sorcerers, 
their whole world was in upheaval. Grand Mage Ubuntu and his elders had been powerful and wise. Many criticized them for taking too long to come to important decisions, but they acted when it counted, and that, as far as Fletcher was concerned, was all that mattered. And now they were dead, all three of them murdered as they slept. Their replacements were doing their best to keep it together, both to make sure the African sanctuaries didn't fragment during all this chaos and suspicion, and also to ensure that the Supreme Council didn't take advantage of the turmoil to launch an attack. So far, they were doing a good job. Since the warlock attack that killed eighteen sorcerers, they'd recalled most of their operatives to bolster their strength, and, as far as Fletcher could tell, the Supreme Council's forces were staying well away. No one wanted to provoke the beast Africa while its fangs were bared. But it did mean that there was no way to get any kind of official help from the Mozambique sanctuary in their hunt for this warlock. Donegan Bain didn't seem to mind, though. He had friends all over the world, many of whom were of significant ill repute. Just the kind of people to help them, then. An air-conditioned limousine pulled up outside the bar Donegan had brought them to, and they got in, sitting beside each other on the long seat. Seated opposite was a beautiful woman swathed in white linen. "'I am Ajuoga, she said as the limo started down the street. I believe you have been inquiring as to the warlock. Yes, we have, said Donegan. This is Fletcher Wren, Gracious O'Callaghan, and I am Donegan Bain. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us. Ajuoga smiled brilliantly. The pleasure is mine, Mr. Bain. I am such a fan of the books you write with Mr. O'Callaghan, and Fletcher Wren, the last teleporter. I am honoured to be in your presence. Thank you for smiling at me, Fletcher said, and Ajuoga laughed. Such a delight you are. I heard tales of your hair, but not your charm. Rest assured, the tales I tell of you shall not skimp on the details. But look at me, taking up so much of your time with my fawning. You have come here on business. You have questions. We do, said Donegan. A warlock killed eighteen sorcerers a few days ago on the outskirts of the city, including your sanctuary's top sensitive. The assassination of your elder council has obviously overshadowed this, but we would appreciate any information you might have. My associate said you are well connected. People talk to me, Ajuoga said, smiling gently. From what I know, however, killing those sorcerers or the sensitive was not the warlock's primary business in Mozambique. Do you know what his primary business was? Gracious asked. Recruitment, said Ajuoga. A warlock had already been to Ireland to talk to the crones of the cold embrace, but they are frail, and they would not join Caravari's army. Next, a warlock went to Sweden to talk to the maidens of the new dawn, but the maidens are meek and would not join Caravari's army. Then Caravari himself came here to talk to the brides of blood tears, and the brides are strong and he found them receptive. Donegan raised an eyebrow. It was Caravari who killed those sorcerers. He came here himself? And the brides, they... they said yes? Indeed they did, said Ajuoga. From what I have been told, Caravari is looking for war. He wants the warlocks and witches to stand together against those who would dare to hurt them. Once his business with the brides was concluded, he found the sensitive in order to extract information about this Department X. Tell me, what do you know of it? We know it doesn't exist, said Gracious. Oh, I know that, Ajuoga responded. But there have been stories about it since the Second World War. Rumours have to start somewhere. It's an urban legend, nothing more, Donegan said. I see. Yes, of course. But where are its headquarters? Dublin or London? I have heard Dublin. It doesn't have any headquarters, said Fletcher, frowning. It doesn't exist. Ajuoga laughed. 
Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. She leaned forward and patted his leg. It is so good to meet you. She kept patting his leg. Fletcher was pretty sure she was coming on to him. Awesome. It was pretty blatant, though, right in front of Bane and O'Callaghan, who were not looking happy. In fact, they were looking at Ajuoga with something approaching suspicion. And now that he thought about it, Fletcher could see their point. She was still patting his leg. She was even leaning forward in her seat. He couldn't blame her, of course. He was gorgeous, and his hair was spectacular. But even so, this behaviour could possibly be labelled as odd if his sheer animal magnetism were ignored and you just focused on... She suddenly had a knife in her other hand, and she was slashing towards his neck. And Bane and O'Callaghan were lunging for her, and Fletcher teleported. But took all three of them with him, and they tumbled to the ground back in the valley in Ireland, surrounded by sorcerers. Ajuoga snatched him away from Gracious and Donegan, and Fletcher tried to get free. He glimpsed Valkyrie running forward, shadows curling round her fist. But then Ajuoga's blade came for him again, and he teleported without thinking, then teleported again, and again, trying to shake Ajuoga off, trying to dislodge her. And then he felt the knife pressing into his throat, and she said, very softly and right into his ear, Stop. He stopped. They were in a field in Texas. It was morning here. Ajuoga kept the knife where it was. When I tell you to, she said, you will teleport us back to that bar I picked you up from. Don't worry, it has been emptied of patrons. Fletcher didn't feel brave. He had a knife to his throat, and of all the feelings rushing through him, bravery wasn't one of them. Even so, he found himself saying, If you're going to kill me, get it over with. Ajuoga gave him another one of her brilliant smiles. I do not wish to kill you, Fletcher. You are the last teleporter. Why would I wish to kill you? No, no, I assure you I only wish to kidnap you. Chapter 48 Assassins Things were not working out the way Ghastly had hoped. Losing Fletcher was a major setback. They had done their best to keep him out of the fighting and as far away from danger as they possibly could. He was the one advantage they'd had over the Supreme Council, and for all they knew, he was already dead. The monster hunters were pleading to go back to Mozambique, and Valkyrie was trying to convince Skullduggery to help her track down this Ajuoga person. But Ravel wouldn't let any of them go, and ghastly agreed with them. Once Mantis was defeated, once its army was in shackles, they could find Fletcher and bring him back, if he were still alive. At least this part was going according to plan, so far. Mantis and his army were still hunkered down in the keep for the fourth day in a row, and ghastly was down here with everyone else at the bottom of the valley. Another night had fallen, and, Fletcher notwithstanding, no one was hurt and no one was dead. Ghastly was experiencing a rare moment of relief, and then his phone rang. Doctor, he said, what can I do for you? Elder bespoke, I'm so sorry for bothering you, Dr. Sinek Dosh sounded worried. She talked fast, and he could practically hear her frown over the phone. If there was anyone else I could call, I wouldn't be wasting your time with... Doctor, please, it's no trouble. Tell me what's wrong. Well, this sounds ridiculous. But I can't get into Roarhaven. He answered her frown with one of his own. I'm sorry. When Dr. Nye arrived back in the sanctuary, I decided to take a few days off. Nye was busy with the engineer, and I had some leave owed me, so I drove into Dublin to see some friends but I've just driven back, and they won't let me in. Who won't let you in? The Roarhaven mages. They have the road blocked off. I can see more of them on the hill. They know who I am. They know I work for the sanctuary, but they said they're not letting anyone through. Doctor, I don't know what's going on, but if I give you Administrator Tipstaff's number, you can call him and he'll... He's not answering. 
said Sinekdash. I called Elder Mist, too, and I got talking to a man I've never spoken to before, and he told me Elder Mist is unavailable. He wouldn't give me his name. Sir, I really don't mean to pester you. I know how preoccupied you must be right now, but something's not right. Doctor, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Go back to Dublin. Keep your phone on. When this is resolved, I'll have someone call you, or I'll call you myself, and hopefully I'll have a satisfactory explanation for you. Thank you, Doctor. He hung up, his frown deepening. He found Ravel strolling through the camp, talking with Saracen. We may have a problem, he said. There are roadblocks up around Roarhaven. Our people aren't being allowed in. No one inside is answering their phone. The Supreme Council could have sneaked some people into Roarhaven, said Saracen, using Mantis as a distraction. Ghastly shook his head. Cynic Dosh said it was Roarhaven mages who stopped her. Whatever's going on, the Supreme Council isn't behind it. Ravel sighed. It's probably just some new piece of bureaucracy that Mist has introduced to improve security since we've been gone. What do you want to do? You want to check it out? You could even take the nice doctor with you and demonstrate how full of authority you are. Saracen nodded. That's sure to impress her. It'd impress me. See that? If it'd impress Saracen Rue, it's sure to impress a lady. Would the both of you just shut up about that? Ghastly said. With all this badgering about meeting a nice girl, you're worse than my mother ever was. Chicks dig scares, said Saracen. That's all I'm going to say about it. You're a veritable font of wisdom, you know that. Laughing, Saracen wrapped his arms round Ghastly and Ravel and slowed their walk as he pulled them in. Two men with knives ahead of us, he muttered. A third coming up on our left, a fourth on our right. Ravel grinned but spoke softly. This is technically an army camp. Everyone has knives. They're waiting for us. Maybe they're fans, Ravel whispered, but veered to the left as Saracen went right, leaving Ghastly to keep walking straight ahead. Typical. A man and woman walked out from behind cover with their heads down. They each had a hand hidden from view. They parted to allow Ghastly to walk between them. Instead, he stopped and raised an eyebrow. You don't really think you're going to catch me unawares, do you? They moved, and he snapped his palm against the air, and the woman went flying back. The man brought the blade swinging low, and Ghastly grabbed his wrist with both hands and yanked him into a headbutt. The knife man collapsed, and Ghastly clicked his fingers threw a fireball into the chest of the woman as she ran at him. She shrieked and beat at the flames, and Ghastly waved his hand. The flames went away, and she looked up, and Ghastly hit her so hard he heard her jaw break. Behind him, Ravel was practically posing for photos with one foot on the head of his unconscious opponent. Saracen dragged his own would-be assassin across the ground and dumped him in the clearing between them. Saracen's hand was bleeding from a deep cut across the back of it. He looked annoyed. "'What's your name?' asked Ghastly. The failed assassin snarled. "'I know him,' said Ravel. "'His name's something nervous, like worrying or fretting or—' "'Anguish!' the assassin said. "'Well, that's all you're getting out of me.' Ravel looked at Ghastly. "'Roarhaven Mage.' Ghastly rubbed his head where he had butted the knife man. It was starting to swell. This isn't the first time Roarhaven mages have tried to kill us. You'd think they'd have got the message by now. Mr. Anguish, we're not going to be killed by the likes of you, so do yourself a favour and tell us who's behind this. Anguish's sneer was becoming unsightly. You're dead. All of you are dead. Everyone who stands between us and our destiny is dead. And what destiny would that be? Saracen asked. Ruling over the mortals like we were born to do, Anguish told him. And don't try to read my mind. We all have level four barriers. I'm not psychic, said Saracen. Why does everyone think I'm psychic? I just know things. Do you know who sent them? Ravel asked. 
Saracen gave a sigh. I said I know things. Most of these are random things, not especially useful things. By the time Saracen rejoined them with his hand wrapped in a bandage, the assassins had been hauled away and the rest of the dead men were gathered in Ravel's tent. Ghastly kept his eyes on Valkyrie. Since Fletcher had been taken, she'd barely spoken to anyone except to argue her case in going after him. Madame Mist appears to be making her grab for power, said Skullduggery, although it would seem to be an especially clumsy one for someone as meticulous as she is. Maybe she just saw her chance, said Vex. Erskine and Ghastly are in the field, along with most of the sorcerers loyal to them. She's not going to get an opportunity like this again. Valkyrie rubbed her forehead, like she was trying to get rid of a headache. What's the point? she asked her voice irritable. Mist sets up roadblocks and takes over the sanctuary. And then what? She seized a building? So what? That doesn't mean she's in charge. Not while the other two elders are still alive. I'll be sure to ask her when I get there, Ravel said. Ghastly saw a flicker of apprehension in Valkyrie's eyes. Something about what Ravel said made her uneasy. That's not a good idea, said Skullduggery. Staying in this camp is not a good idea, Ravel countered. If Mist had four assassins hidden here, she could very well have more. You know me, Skullduggery. I have no patience for this kind of thing. If someone wants to kill me, I'll meet them halfway. You were in one of Cassandra Pharos's visions, Valkyrie blurted. We didn't tell you because of the whole, you know, affecting the future thing. But we saw you in the sanctuary. You were in pain. A lot of pain. I see, Ravel said, raising an eyebrow. Did she see anything else? Nothing more to do with you, Skullduggery said. Ravel nodded, then shrugged. The future can be changed just by knowing what's going to happen. I'll be fine. It's really not a good idea. If Mist takes over, all this will be for nothing. I'm going back to Roarhaven, Skullduggery. It's my decision. I'll go too said Ghastly. Cassandra didn't see me in that vision, did she? So I'll stick with Erskine and make sure that future doesn't happen. Fair enough, said Skullduggery. Anton, you're going too. You're on bodyguard duty. Valkyrie, Dexter, Saracen and I will stay here. Saracen frowned. We're splitting up, he said. When we fought against Mevelent, we had a rule. We don't split up until the job is done. It won't be for long, said Ravel. A few days at the very most. If we get to Roarhaven and it's too much for us to handle, we'll hang back, wait until Mantus and his army are taken down. Then we'll all march in together. Unless you've had a premonition of something bad happening, Vex said to Saracen. Saracen glowered. I'm not a psychic. Then what are you? Weary. The awesome power of weariness, Vex grumbled. One of these days you are going to tell me what your magic discipline is. How many times do I have to say this? I know things. I hate you. See? I knew that. We've got two Australian mages with us, Skullduggery said, still on topic. Nixion and Zathract. Take them with you. They're good in a fight. And the Cleavers have been given strict instructions to obey the Grand Mage above all else. You'll need them too. Makes sense, Ravel said. How many? Skullduggery looked at the map. All of them, he said. But that'd cut our numbers here by a third, said Ghastly. If Mantis attacks, you'll be crushed. Skullduggery tapped their position on the map. We know Mantis has eyes in these woods, he said. If you leave now, they'll need a few hours to verify that you're really gone. Maybe they're behind what's happening at Roarhaven, or maybe not but I bet they know something's up. When you leave, taking the cleavers with you, they'll report back. Mantis won't be able to let an opportunity like this pass, and it will attack. Valkyrie frowned. Yay, it'll attack and kill us, falling right into our trap. That's right, said Saracen. I fail to see how any of this is to our advantage. Mantis won't know how long our forces will be depleted, Skullduggery said. I doubt it'd even wait until morning to attack. Under cover of night, 
it'll come for us. They're so fond of their shields over there. We'll construct our own, all the way across this line. And up here on this ridge, we already have Moloch and fifty vampires. The men around the table were too seasoned to show it, but the sudden silence that followed those words was proof enough of their shock. They're up there? Vex asked. Skullduggery nodded. I called Moloch this afternoon. They mobilized quickly, I have to say. They arrived before nightfall and set up a cage. If there's one thing vampires know how to build well, it's a cage. He trailed his finger from Mantis's position on the map to their own. Mantis will charge straight at us. When its forces reach this point, the vampires will charge at them from the ridge, catching them in the open. The cleavers will stand and fight, but all the sorcerers in the rear will know better. They'll retreat. The sorcerers at the front will be caught between the vampires and our shields. We'll be accepting surrender and taking prisoners, Mantis among them. Uh, okay, said Vex. And then there'll be fifty vampires roaming around in this area here. Malik says he can control them. He's already taken the serum, so he'll stay human and herd them back to where they can do no harm. He's sure he can do that? He seems confident. All we can do is take him at his ward. So your entire plan hinges on the ward of a vampire, ghastly pressed. Skulldiggory, you hate vampires. I mean, out of all of us, you trust them the least, and we don't trust them at all. I trust that Moloch can't afford to let us fail, Skullduggery said. And what if he can't control them like he thinks he can? asked Saracen. Then we take them out, Skullduggery said, and solve Dublin's vampire problem along the way. Chapter 49 Intimidation Techniques A scapegrace swept the floor. He wondered if this was it. Was this his life? Was this the full extent of what he would achieve? Ex-zombie, now woman, owner of a modestly successful pub? What had happened to his dreams? Was he sweeping them up along with the dust? Was he abandoning them? He dreamed of being the greatest killer the world had ever seen. He dreamed of having a horde of zombies at his command. He dreamed of being Roarhaven's masked protector. But now, as he swept, a great sadness overcame him, for he realized he was a failure. He'd lost his pride, his honor, even his magic was reluctant to return to him. He had nothing left. Well, apart from the pub. A smile broke through his sadness. That was the one thing he hadn't messed up yet. So what if he wouldn't be a notorious villain or an adored hero? He could still be a good person. He could still have a good life, now that he'd thrown the mask away. The door opened behind him, and three men walked in, looking around like they owned the place. Hello, gentlemen, Scapegrace said. What can I get you on this fine evening? Hello, Vorian said the man in front. Do I know you? What matters is that I know you, Vorian Scapegrace. I have to say, you're looking good these days. If I hadn't heard so many reports on what you looked like in your old body, well, you and me might have had a shot. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, the man continued, I did hear all those stories. I know what you were like both as a disgusting zombie and as a pathetic human. You talked big, you boasted, you never did anything. You're a coward, Mr. Scapegrace, and you're just not very bright. Scapegrace stood his ground. Who the hell are you? My name is Mud, the man said, and these are my friends, Shun and Bagatelle. We've been sent to give you a warning. Oh, really? 
Really, said Mud. And at his nod, the bigger of the two men, the one called Bagatelle, picked up a chair and threw it over the bar. The mirror cracked, bottles smashed, and the shelf collapsed. Hey! Scapegrace cried out. But Shun grabbed him, pulled him back, while Bagatelle threw another chair that demolished the freshly cleaned glasses. Master! Thresher shouted, charging out from the back room. A stream of energy erupted from Mud's hand, caught Thrasher full in the chest, and launched him across the room. Scapegrace tore himself free and stumbled, looking up to find himself surrounded. You've been going out at night and getting yourselves in trouble, Mud said. Scapegrace hesitated. I... I don't know what you're talking about. You wear silly little masks. Then how do you know it's us? Mud raised a fist and Scapegrace recoiled sharply. Okay, okay, it's us. Mud lowered his fist into his other hand, started rubbing his knuckles in a threatening manner. We are here to tell you that you're going to want to stop doing all that stupid stuff. We've stopped. We've already stopped. When you walked in, I was thinking about that, how we've stopped. Because we have. We're not even looking for him anymore. Looking for who? Silas Nadir. Silas Nadir isn't even in the country, you moron. No one knows exactly where he is. But he's not in Ireland and he's definitely not in Roarhaven. You're also going to want to forget you ever saw Crayfon Signet. Who? Mud smiled. Good man. No, said Scapegrace. Who's Crayfon Signet? Is he the other shunter? Did he bring the dog creature here? A dog creature attacked Thrasher. Did he bring it here on purpose or did it sneak through on one of the shunts? Why is he shunting? What's he doing here anyway? Where is everyone disappearing to? You're asking questions you shouldn't be asking. Am I? I was told to make sure you stayed out of everyone's business. I asked around, mentioned your name, and they all said you were a coward and a moron. They said some stern words and a little destruction of property and he'd fall right in line. But something tells me they've all misjudged you. I was instructed to kill you only as a last resort. Wait, said Scapegrace. Kill me? You picked the wrong time to have a change of heart. Scapegrace narrowed his eyes. And you picked the wrong time to threaten me. With the speed of a cobra, Scapegrace lashed out at Bagatelle, catching him on the ear with a vicious chop. He ducked as Shun reached for him and spun with a kick that came dangerously close to landing. Mud fired off a punch that Scapegrace blocked with his chin, and Scapegrace countered with a flailing hand to the air as he fell. He landed on the floor, and the three thugs glared down at him. Then the door opened, and everyone looked round. Forgive me, Grandmaster Ping said, but today I have business with Miss Scapegrace. Get out of here, old man, said Mud. Ping shuffled forward. I am so sorry, but my ears are not what they used to be. Could you repeat that, please? Bagatelle stepped in front of him. He said leave. Ping peered up at Bagatelle, his curious eyes blinking. My, ma, you are a tall one. Still, as my honorable father used to say, the taller the tree, the farther the fall. Bagatelle took hold of Ping's bathrobe, and Ping's liver-spotted hand closed gently round Bagatelle's. He twisted and leaned in, and Bagatelle cried out and fell to his knees. Before Mud or Shun could react, Ping struck Bagatelle with a lazy slap, and Bagatelle lurched sideways and crumpled. Shun ran at him, and Ping avoided the kick and swept the supporting leg from under him. As Shun fell, Mud fired, and Ping stepped sideways and shoved the falling man into the path of the energy stream. Mud cursed, tried backing away, but Ping was already too close to avoid. Mud tried punching, but that didn't work. He tried kicking, and that too failed. Then he tried being flipped through the air and landing on his head. That seemed to do the trick. 
Scapegrace got to his feet as Ping turned. That was amazing, he said. That, Ping said, was Kung Fu. You are all right? I am, said Scapegrace. I'm okay too, moaned Thrasher. Nobody cares, said Scapegrace. They came to kill me because we're getting too close to the truth. We'll... We'll have to go into hiding. Not to worry, said Ping. I will protect you. Uh, I don't think I can keep paying you. Ping chuckled, reached up, and pressed his long, bony finger to Scapegrace's lips. I do not help Miss Scapegrace for money. I help Miss Scapegrace for love. Scapegrace stared down at him. What? Chapter 50 The Battle of the Keep Ghastly and Ravel had left with the cleavers hours earlier. It was just gone four in the morning. The sky would be brightening soon, turning from black to blue, preparing for dawn. The first strike came without warning. The enemy must have had a few cloaking spheres, because suddenly there were bullets and rockets and energy streams lighting up the shields. Someone behind Valkyrie launched a flare that illuminated the valley, casting the hundreds of charging sorcerers in a hellish red glow. Return fire! Skullduggery roared, and the shout went up the line, and things got louder. A writhing ball of energy slipped through the shield and exploded next to a truck, spinning it over onto its side. An enemy elemental used the air to propel himself high overhead. He landed on the curve of the shield, every touch lighting it up. He rolled until he found a gap and dropped off the edge, using the air to slow his descent. But the moment he hit the ground, sorcerers jumped on him, and he was lost to Valkyrie's sight. Skullduggery stuck his gun through a gap and fired. He pulled it back, reloaded. Where the hell is Moloch? Valkyrie jumped back to let a trio of mages run by. Everyone had a job to do but her. She looked up to the ridge. Where the hell was Moloch? Keeping low, she ran back and to the east, looping around out of the camp and towards the trees. She brought the shadows in to hide her as she sprinted across the open ground. She sank into the tree line, keeping her head turned away from the brilliant flashes of light from the battle. If Mantis had people creeping through there, she needed to be able to see them first. She moved as quickly as she could, using the sounds of fighting to mask her footsteps. Every time she thought she saw someone in the dark, it turned out to be nothing, which was odd. If she'd been in charge, in place of Mantis, she would have sent a squad of her best fighters down here in an attempt to outflank the enemy. She knew that's what Skullduggery was expecting. So where were they? The ground turned steep, and she slowed, creeping up the side of the hill towards the ridge. Up ahead she could hear snarling, lots and lots of snarling, that low, guttural, savage snarling that could only tear itself from the throats of vampires. She fought the irrational urge to rush forward, but it was her slow steps that prevented her from tripping over something lying in the undergrowth. She nudged it with her foot. It moved, then moved back, settling into its original position. She knelt, reached out, felt a leg. She cursed under her breath, and fell onto her backside. Whoever it was didn't move. She could see the outline of a shoulder. He was sitting up, resting against a tree. Her mouth dry, Valkyrie got to her knees. When he still didn't move, her hand went back to his foot. Soft rubber and laces. Running shoes. Her hand moved up. A tracksuit. Beneath it, a cold, cold leg. Shielding one hand with the other, she clicked her fingers, summoned a small flame. Moloch's tracksuit. She shuffled closer. Moloch's blood. She raised her hand. Moloch's dead body, sitting here in the woods, missing its head. She let the fire go out before she saw too much, 
but had to fight to keep from throwing up. She stood, backed away, praying she didn't kick anything head-shaped in the dark. The white-skinned vampires were packed into a massive cage, climbing over each other for their chance to snarl and snap at the man in black, pacing back and forward just out of their reach. Dusk. It took her a moment to realize he was snarling back at them. He stopped suddenly, his head snapping towards her. Valkyrie turned to run, but he was on her in an instant. She felt a hand on her jacket, and then she was flying through the air. She hit the ground and rolled, and before she'd even come to a stop, he was beside her, a hand closing round her throat. He lifted her off her feet and held her there. She kicked out, tried to breathe, his fingertips pressing into her arteries, stopping the blood supply to her brain, her head pounding, lights dancing before her eyes. And then he let her go, and she fell to the ground. The vampires were going crazy now. She was an arm's length from the cage. The only thing stopping them from ripping her to pieces. She looked up at dusk. It was quite beautiful. The way the bursting light from the battle hit the angles of his face. The side with the scar was hidden in shadow. The scar she'd given him. Why? Valkyrie asked. He looked down at her. She knew the rule as well as anyone. There was only one cardinal sin when it came to vampires. The killing of one of their own. Kalen had broken that rule and was shunned. In order for Dusk to do the same, he would have needed a very good reason. And, in order to do it in front of all these other vampires, Moloch must have wronged him in some unforgivable way. But what did a vampire deem unforgivable? He stole my life, Dusk said quietly, cursed me with undeath. I've been waiting for him to leave his squalid fortress ever since I found out. I suppose I owe you for drawing him into the open. But we need him, said Valkyrie. We need the vampires. We lose without them. Please, help us. If I open this cage, these vampires will kill me. You said you owe me. I do, and at some later date... I will tell you a secret about yourself that even you do not know. But not tonight. He turned, started walking away. No. Dusk, please, please! When the darkness had swallowed him, Valkyrie stood. The vampires howled in frustration. Some of them started to fight among themselves. She walked quickly away from the cage and looked down into the valley. Mantis's forces were battering at the shields. It would only be a matter of minutes before they got through. Even if she could find the key to open the cage, there was no Moloch around to herd the vampires away once they'd done their job. Besides, once the cage opened, she'd be the first one to fall to their hunger. But down there, down there, Skullduggery and the others would fight. They'd fight and kill and die. She had to do something. She couldn't just stand up here and watch as... Her eyes widened. Her heart surged. Lit up by the uncertain staccato of the fighting, of explosions and flashing energy streams, there were people moving in from the other end of the valley. Ghastly, Ravel, Cleavers and Sorcerers. They turned back. Reinforcements. She laughed. She couldn't stop herself. Despite having fifty vampires a mere stone's throw away from her, she jumped up and thrust her arms in the air. She even did a little dance. Up there on that ridge, the vampires snarling themselves into a frenzy. When she was done, she looked down at the valley again. There must have been hundreds of people on that road. She frowned. Hundreds. Too many to be ghastly and ravel, and the cleavers. Too many to be reinforcements. She cried out as the newcomers crashed into Skullduggery's army from the rear. They swarmed the camp, adding to the terrible symphony of machine-gun fire and shrieking energy streams. She watched as it played out, as her fellow sorcerers realized they'd been outmaneuvered. Half of them turned to fight while the other half struggled to keep the line. And then 
the shield broke. Under pressure from too many points, it just dissolved, and Mantis's army swept in on a wave of destruction. Valkyrie screamed and brought the wind in to boost herself high into the air and far from the ridge. She lost control at the peak of her jump and didn't bother correcting herself. She fell towards the valley floor, only bringing the air in at the last second. She hit the ground at a run. She came up on one of Mantis's sorcerers, lagging far behind the others. She slammed her stick into the back of his head and kept running. There was a huge explosion from the camp. She could hear screams above the roars and the shouts. Another straggler ahead. A woman. Valkyrie hit her so hard the woman flipped over as she fell. Then she plunged into the battle. Gunfire and screams assaulted her ears. Men and women fought and cursed and stabbed and shot each other. Enemy cleavers cleared spaces with whirling scythes. Someone crashed into her just as an energy stream passed where she'd been standing. She glimpsed his face. What was his name? Threatening. That was it. Threatening. Threatening got up, gun in hand, shooting a man who ran at him. The bullets hit armor, didn't slow him down. And Threatening dropped the gun and went for his sword, and the man stuck a blade in Threatening's throat and left him to die. Valkyrie sent a wave of shadows crashing into the man who'd killed him. Her stick flashed as she struck another enemy mage and he crumpled. She saw Di Mabry scrambling backwards, trying to get away from a big man with a black beard and a huge axe. She sprinted towards them, pushed to the air. The big man staggered, and she lashed him with shadows that drew blood across his face. Snarling, the big man swung his axe for Valkyrie's head, and she stumbled, lost momentum, managed to dodge a second swing, and he caught her with his free hand. She whirled and sat down with a bump, the left side of her face stinging. Di rejoined the fight, and the big man lost interest in her. So she sat there, dazed, while people died all around. Let me out. Figuring she'd probably do better on her feet, she stood and looked around. So many people fighting. How did they even know which opponent to pick? Was there a system for that kind of thing? Did people with swords go for people with swords? Did people go for opponents their own size? How did they even know who was an enemy in the dark and the chaos? The whole thing seemed astonishingly unfair. You're panicking. You tend to fixate on irrelevant details when you panic. Have you noticed this? A sword came for her, flashing in the moonlight. She brought her left arm up to meet it, felt the jolt through the gauntlet. She'd barely deflected that strike. This wasn't like in training. Her blocks needed to be a lot stronger. The man with the sword swung again. Valkyrie slipped on something and fell, rolled, came up, blocked. She lunged into him, head-butted his chest. He grunted and stepped back, and she flicked her stick at his head. There was a bright blue spark, and he howled, wheeled, the sword falling from his grip. She hit him on the arm, and he collapsed to the ground, jerking like he'd been electrocuted. A sun exploded in front of her, and she flew backwards, hit someone, and they both went down. She blinked but couldn't see, felt hands in her, didn't know whose they were, so she found the face and hit it. She got an elbow in the mouth for her trouble, and her lip burst. She snarled, found an eye, and jabbed at it with her thumb. She heard a scream and pushed him off, stumbled away, her vision returning. Something hit her shoulder and spun her, then hit her back, and she landed face down in the dirt. Someone ran by, tripped over her, kicking her in the head on the way down. She blinked again. The world was blurry but getting clearer. Among all the shouts and yells and running footsteps, she picked out the footsteps that were coming for her, and she rolled onto her back. A sorcerer let loose with a dazzling energy stream that would have burrowed through her belly were it not for her jacket. She swept her arm towards him, her shadows slicing through the backs of his legs. He screamed and fell, and she dived on him. They went rolling, cursing, and biting and snarling. They came to a stop, with Valkyrie on the bottom, his weight on her, spittle spraying from his mouth, and his hand crackling with energy. He's going to kill you. Let me out. Valkyrie clutched at the air 
and her stick slid into her hand. She jammed it into his ribs, and he convulsed so violently he practically leaped sideways. She rolled the other way, clicking her fingers and hurling a fireball into the helmet of a cleaver fighting a mage she knew. She went low, her stick cracking into his knee. He jerked back but didn't fall. His uniform protected him. His scythe scraped against her gauntlet, and he whirled, kicked her, sent her stumbling over the body of a woman. He jumped at her, and she pushed at the air, but he passed through it, and she pushed at the air again and sent herself sliding along the grass. He sprinted after her as she got to her feet, wobbling slightly. She swept her hands in and up, and a gust of wind lifted her. She hurtled diagonally away, not caring where she landed until she hit the ground and lost her stick and rolled to a stop, gasping for breath. Her hair was in her face, and the blood was sticking it to her lips. She raised her head, gazed at what she could see of the battle, saw a big man with a black beard and a huge axe striding towards her. Strong legs in brown leather stepped between them. A sword caught the flashing lights prettily. The big man swung that axe, and Tanith moved under it, cut his hands off. The hands fell, still clutching the axe, and the big man's eyes widened, and he started hollering. Someone picked Valkyrie off the ground, put the stick back in her hand. It took her a moment to realize that Sanguine was beside her. A bullet hit her shoulder, and she winced, turned to watch three mages run at her. The woman in front reloaded as she ran, Sanguine moving to intercept. He dived in her, and the ground swallowed them up. The second mage faltered. Then a hand burst from the ground, grabbed his ankle, and yanked him down beneath the surface. The third mage had fireballs in his hands, and he was hopping from one place to the other, screaming at Sanguine to bring his friends back. Sanguine rose up behind him, grabbed him, and snapped his neck. Tanith was suddenly beside Valkyrie, looking into her eyes. You okay? Val? You hurt? No, Valkyrie managed to say. Can you fight? No, she wanted to say. No, I can't fight. Take me away from this. Please, God, take me away. Instead, she said, Yes. Tanith gave her a wicked grin and leaped at the nearest cleaver. Valkyrie brushed the hair from her eyes and turned in a circle. Everywhere around her, people were fighting. She watched a woman fighting a sorcerer she knew. The woman gripped the collar of his coat and yanked it down, and steel flashed in her hand as she plunged a small blade into his throat. The sorcerer toppled, the woman staying close all the way down. When he went limp, she picked up her sword, looked around, saw Valkyrie. She ran at her. Valkyrie pushed at the air, but the woman dodged to one side, came up and ducked the shadows that came after Cursing, Valkyrie fell back, using her stick and gauntlet to defend against that swinging sword. The woman's face was covered in blood, but her eyes were clear and bright and terrible. The woman brought the sword down heavily, but Valkyrie held the stick in both hands, planted her feet wide, and blocked upwards just as strong. And then the woman kicked her between the legs. Blinding pain shot through Valkyrie's body, and she curled up dropped to the ground and fell sideways. The woman crouched over her, the tip of her sword pressing into Valkyrie's neck. Hurts, doesn't it? she said, panting for breath. People think it's just guys that works on her, if only, right? Valkyrie's eyes were filled with tears, and every muscle was seized in pain. She couldn't even whimper. Ashon, a man barked. He stood over them keeping an eye out. He was old but solid, and carried a short sword that dripped with blood. Do the job and stop talking about it. The woman, Ashon, nodded to him, then looked down at Valkyrie. Wars, no place for a girl, she said, and hit her with the hilt of the sword, and the world went black. Chapter 51 The Man with the Golden Eyes Ghastly hunkered down in the darkness, eyes on the two shapes moving towards him. He could hear their footsteps from here, every scuff and stumble and kicked pebble. Their whispers drifted by on the breeze. 
harsh words and abject apologies. When they were close enough, Ghastly stood. Over here, he said quietly. Scapegrace jumped in shock, and Thrasher gave a muffled cry of horror. For some reason they were both wearing masks. There was someone else with them, too. Someone Ghastly hadn't noticed before. An old Chinese man in a bathrobe. He, too, wore a mask. Scapegrace hurried over. He wasn't wearing anything too revealing. For this, Ghastly was thankful, yet also strangely disappointed. Elder Bespoke, Scapegrace whispered. We came as fast as we could, but we doubled back a few times to make sure we weren't being followed. So that may have delayed us. I hope you weren't waiting long. But you can never put too high a price on security. That's what I always say. Why are you wearing masks? In case we're recognized. We're wanted men in this town. Our never-ending war against darkness recently ended, but we have made some serious enemies. Thrasher stepped up. Excuse me, Elder Bespoke. Where's the force field? Right in front of you, said Ghastly. Thrasher started to raise his hand. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Ghastly warned. Thrasher's arm lowered, but Scapegrace gave him a push, and Thrasher hit the force field with a sharp crack of energy that launched him backwards. Well, said Scapegrace, as Thrasher sprawled to a groaning stop. The force field covers the whole town and a lot more besides, said Ghastly. It's a particularly nasty one, as you can see which is why we need you to deactivate it on your side. Of course, said Scapegrace. First thing to do is find the sigil. It'll be carved onto something solid, and it'll be glowing. Scapegrace went hunting through the undergrowth, and Ravel and Shudder walked up behind Ghastly. Any luck? Ravel asked. We've just started, said Ghastly. The old Chinese man stood on the other side of the force field, smiling at them. I don't believe we've met, said Ravel. My name is Ping, the old man said. I am romantically involved with Miss Scapegrace. Ghastly raised an eyebrow. Is that so? It is not, Thrasher said, struggling to sit up. Ping nodded. We are very, very happy together, waiting for the big, stupid man to move out. That's never going to happen, Thrasher said, trying to stand on trembling legs. Found it, Scapegrace said, jumping up excitedly. It's carved into the back of this rock. Ghastly and Ravel watched him jiggle for a moment. Good, said Ghastly. This next part is trickier. You're going to have to follow my instructions exactly, understand? Yes, sir, said Scapegrace. Okay. Press your fingertip to the center of the sigil, just where it starts to loop. Got that? Now slowly move your finger down at a 45-degree angle. It took twenty minutes and dozens of attempts, but finally that small section of the force field retracted. Ravel gave a sharp gesture, and suddenly cleavers detached themselves from the shadows around them and marched through the gap three abreast, one hundred and fourteen in all. The two Australian mages followed, and when Shudder and Ravel went through, Ghastly reactivated the force field and turned to see Scapegrace standing right there. I've been keeping an eye out, he said. I saw Madame Mist. She vanished. What do you mean? Vanished, disappeared, shunted. Ghastly frowned. You saw this? Yes, sir. I thought it was odd, so here I am, reporting it. Well, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Sir, yes, sir. Also, there was a dog creature. But I took care of that. <laughs> Order, sir? Uh, well, to be honest, I think your work is done for tonight. You should go home and recuperate. Scapegrace looked dismayed. But we're here to help. You have helped, but things could get messy in a few minutes, and I need to know we have backup waiting should we need it. I am your backup? Yes. 
Yes, you are. Because I've been in training in the fighting arts. Master Ping has been training me. That's good to know. I think he loves me a little bit, though. I may have noticed that, yes. Go home, Scapegrace. If we need you, we'll call. Scapegrace bowed, then twirled round and darted into the night. Thrasher ran after him, and Ping shuffled after them both. What an odd group. They moved slowly through Roarhaven, careful not to be seen. The closer they got to the sanctuary, the more uneasy Ghastly became. The town was quiet, like it was holding its breath. Two mages guarded the entrance. Ravel sent a pair of cleavers to incapacitate them. Ghastly drew his gun and led the way inside. It was unnaturally still. Zathract and Nixion took off down one corridor, taking half the cleavers with them. The rest of the cleavers stayed with Ghastly and Ravel and Shudder as they made their way through to the heart of the sanctuary. Any mages they encountered along the way were taken down by non-lethal means. Until they got to the bottom of whatever was going on, the Roarhaven mages were being treated as potential hostiles. There'd be no killing them. Not yet. A figure lurched from the shadows, and Ghastly spun. But it was China Sorrows who fell into his arms. Just the man I want to see, she mumbled. You don't have your sewing kit on you by any chance? Her clothes were dirty and torn and stained with blood. She was hurt and exhausted, and even paler than usual. What happened? asked Ghastly. She rested her head against his chest and closed her eyes, but she smiled with cracked lips. I didn't. I've been hunted from one side of this country to the other. Thought I could make it alone, but no. No woman is an island. How did you get through the force field? She smiled a pale smile. No sigil can stop me. Ghastly lifted her, passed her into a cleaver's arms. Take her to the medical bay. Find someone to treat her. Force them. The cleaver nodded and moved away, carrying China as if she were as light as a feather. They continued on. Ravel posted guards at every doorway they passed. By the time they reached the round room, there were twenty cleavers left. Ghastly rested his hand on the door and looked at Ravel. Ready? he whispered. Ravel glanced at Shudder, then looked at Ghastly. He took a deep breath and nodded. Ghastly pushed the doors open and strode in, Ravel and Shudder on either side of him and the cleavers spilling in behind. Ahead of them, Madame Mist stood with Portia and Sick and two other children of the spider, people Ghastly recognized as the Scourge and the Terror. None of them looked remotely surprised to see them. The warriors return, said Sick, giving a little laugh. Cleavers, Ghastly said, arrest Elder Mist and her friends. On what grounds? Mist asked, her voice unhurried. The cleavers didn't move. Any action taken against an elder would have to be ordered by the Grand Mage himself. We have done nothing but keep the home fires burning. And the force field? Shudder asked. I thought it prudent, with General Mantis still out there. Was I wrong? Should I not have worried? You sent your people to kill us, said Ghastly. For a second time, I might add. My people? My people are here with me. Were you attacked by any one of them? Were you attacked by a child of the spider? Her tone was low, mocking, and completely confident. Ghastly didn't like it. She was completely outnumbered, but acting like she was the one with the upper hand. He pressed a finger to his headset. Nixian, he said. Status. His earpiece crackled into life. A half a dozen people, all in shackles, said Nixian. This area is secure. Want us to check the lower levels? Ghastly's eyes stayed on mist. Not yet, he said. Hold for further instructions. 
Can we finish this now? Portia asked. I'm bored. Mist shook her head. This is a moment to be savored, my sweetling. Not rushed over, not fumbled. But look, you've spoiled it now. You've robbed it of its fun. Wasn't fun for us, said Sick. Of course not, Madame Mist said, because you're young and impetuous and have yet to learn such subtleties as patience. When you have learned this subtle art, then you will never want moments like this to end. Elder bespoke. We never got along, you and I. You distrusted me from the start, wisely, as it turned out. Do you have anything else to charge me with? You were behind the warlock killings, Ghastly said. You were framing the mortals. Of course. But I assure you the warlocks are merely a means to an end. Once they attack Dublin City, sanctuaries around the world will unite, and we will save the mortals from these evil, evil beings and be hailed as heroes. We'll take over, and the mortals won't even get to set off one of those bombs they love so much. An elegant plan. Not my own, I have to admit, but an elegant plan nonetheless, don't you think? She was building up to something. Ghastly had found it wise over the years to never let his enemies build up to something. He took another step forward, raising his gun. Hands on your head, all of you. You're under arrest for conspiracy to commit murder. One moment, please, said Mist. Hands on your head. No, said Ghastly. Indulge me, if you will, as one elder to another. My final request, before I am led away in disgrace, your associates elsewhere in this building, call them. What? Mist said nothing more. Frowning, Ghastly pressed his headset again. Nixian, any change? Nixian? Zathrekt! There was movement behind Mist, and something came flying through the air to land wetly in the space before Ghastly. Nixian's head rolled to a stop, joined a moment later by Zathrakt's. Oh dear, said Madame Mist. Oh, I have been unforgivably rude. I seem to have forgotten to introduce you to our new bodyguard that Dr. Nye has generously donated to our cause. A figure stepped into the light, dressed all in black, carrying a scythe, his face hidden behind a visored helmet. He's darkened his color since the first time you met, said Mist. But the Black Cleaver is still the same man who almost killed you six years ago. I think it only fitting that he be here to witness your death. Something cold and sharp thudded into Ghastly's back, and he took a step forward, his gun dropping from his suddenly numb fingers. He looked round, saw the cleavers falling upon shudder, their sides piercing the unarmored sections of his clothes as easily as they did the flesh beneath. They knew exactly where to strike. The gist burst from Shudder's chest, screaming in pain and fury, but a scythe took Shudder's head, and the gist dissipated like smoke in a breeze. Ghastly fell to one knee. He reached behind his back, clumsy fingers searching for the scythe blade. Instead, he found a knife. It was pulled free before he could grip it, and he toppled, turning over to land on his back. I am sorry, my friend, Erskine Ravel said, bending over him. Ghastly closed his hand around Ravel's wrist, tried to keep the blade away. No, he whispered. No, don't. But his strength was gone, and Ravel easily disentangled himself, 
and pushed the knife into his throat. In that moment, Ghastly became aware of a great many things. He became aware of how cold he suddenly was, and how hot his blood felt, splashing onto his skin. He became aware of Anton Shudder's head lying on the floor turned away from him. He became aware of how many regrets he'd stored up over the years, and despite them all, and despite his age, he still wasn't ready to die. And he became aware of Ravel's eyes, brimming with tears, those eyes of his that had many a lady swooning over him down through the centuries, those golden eyes. Chapter 52 A Reasonable Reaction Finding Tanith was the only thing that Sanguine cared about, but after an hour of searching he had to return to the small primary school with nothing to show for his efforts. The school was in the middle of nowhere, with doors that were easily forced and windows that gave them a good view in all four directions. A good temporary base, providing they didn't have to defend it. Rue and Vex were already back, and Gracious O'Callaghan was working away at the little school computer, tapping the keys by the dim light of the screen. A few minutes later, Pleasant dropped from the midday sky and strode into the classroom. Any sign? Vex asked. Nothing, Pleasant said. We'll have to expand our search. No, said Rue. Skullduggery, I know you're worried, but Valkyrie's a prisoner of war now. She'll be treated well, and she'll be kept out of danger. If we keep looking for her, we're going to run into the people who are looking for us. They're closing in, and you know it. We have to leave the area. We're not going anywhere without Tanith, Sanguine said quietly. Valkyrie will be released when the war is over, but Tanith is a wanted fugitive. She's going to be thrown in prison for the rest of her life if we don't get her back now. Vex shook his head. That's too risky. I'm sorry. So that's how it is, is it? You'll let her fight for you, but the moment she needs your help, you cut her loose. I thought you were meant to be the good guys, all noble and honorable. I don't see much nobility in leaving your people behind. We're not leaving, said Pleasant. Once Mantis figures out who he has, he'll set his sensitives on them. They're probably already at work. We have to get to Valkyrie before they push too deep. Rue frowned. Why? They don't know where we are. They don't know of our plans because we don't have any plans. That's not what I'm worried about. Then what? For God's sake. By the way he stood, it looked like Pleasant was about to say something he really didn't want to say. But he was saved the trouble by O'Callaghan. There's something you should see, he said. Sanguine stepped forward. You found them? O'Callaghan shook his head. This computer isn't powerful enough to crack Mantis's communication codes. Instead, I've been trying to find out why we can't get in touch with Ghastly. Whatever else she's done, Madame Mist hasn't changed the codes for the security feed yet, so I've accessed the cameras in the Roarhaven Sanctuary. Let's take a look, Pleasant said, and Sanguine rushed forward before all the good places around the computer were taken. The monitor showed the empty round room. At the moment, nothing's happening, said O'Callaghan, sitting at the keyboard. So I... I went a few hours back, and I... I found this. He clicked a file, and they saw Madame Mist and a few other creepy-looking individuals facing off against Bespoke and Ravel and Shudder, plus a whole army of cleavers at their backs. Words were being spoken. Where's the audio? Vex said. O'Callaghan frowned started opening and closing windows while the standoff continued on screen. I know the pretty ones, said Sanguine. I know sick in Portia. But who are the ugly people? The terror and the scourge, said Rue. Contemporaries of the torment. They can turn into giant spiders just like he could. If anything, though, they're even less friendly and... Wait, who the hell is this? A man in black stepped into view. He looked like a cleaver. 
Got it, said O'Callaghan, and there was a slight hiss, and then Madame Mist's voice drifted from the speakers. But the Black Cleaver is still the same man who almost killed you six years ago, she was saying. I think it's only fitting that he be here to witness your death. Ravel was the first one to move. But instead of moving against the children of the spider, he slipped a knife from his sleeve and plunged it into Ghastly Bespoke's back. Pleasant stiffened, and Vex cursed, and Rue jerked away from the monitor, and Sanguine's eyes would surely have widened if he'd had any. Rue found his voice and shouted as Bespoke fell, and Anton Schurder was sliced from shoulder to sternum. The cleavers hacked at Schurder with detached ferocity, not affording him a moment's mercy, not even when they took his head. Bespoke was on his back by now, with Ravel crouched over him. I am sorry, my friend, Ravel said, and plunged the knife into his throat. Vex turned from the monitor, and Rue staggered against the wall. Only Pleasant stayed where he was, watching his scarred friend choke on his own blood and die. It was as if the skeleton were frozen in place. Sanguine felt the ridiculous urge to reach out and poke him, just to see if he'd react. But he'd seen that kind of anger before. It was the quiet kind the dangerous kind. On the monitor there was sudden silence. The cleavers stepped away from Shudder, their scythes dripping. Ravel stood slowly, looked at the knife in his hand. Sick walked forward, peered down at Bespoke's dead body, and laughed. Ravel moved so fast it was almost scary. In an instant, Sick was on his knees with the blade that had killed Bespoke pressed into his throat. Portia cried out, and the terror and the scourge moved, started to grow, their arms and legs lengthening. Stand down, Ravel roared. Stand down, or I'll kill him, and then I'll kill every last one of you. Sanguine leaned in, eager for more bloodshed. But the terror and the scourge stopped growing, and after a moment they returned to their original forms. You let him go, Portia said, her voice shaking with fury. Ravel ignored her. He hauled sick to his feet and leaned in. You do not laugh at this man. You understand me? Compared to him, you're nothing. You're less than nothing. He was one of my friends. But you? You're not worthy to even be killed by the same knife that's marked with his blood. Ravel shoved sick away from him, and sick glared but retreated to Portia's side. Only Madame Mist seemed to have kept her composure. We've had reports from the battle at the keep. Our forces have been decimated by Mantis and his army. Some are dead, most are captured. Ravel looked at her, something unreadable in his face. Good, he said at last. Skullduggery and the others? Escaped, said Mist, although Mantis has Valkyrie Kane. Okay. That should keep Skullduggery occupied for a while, at least. I want Vurian Scapegrace rounded up. He helped us get in, so he'll help others. Get to Cane on it. Of course, Grand Mage. And get someone in to clean up in here. I want these men given proper burials. Of course. Ravel looked down at Bespoke and Shudder, and walked out. The Black Cleaver was the first to follow, and then the others, until only Sick and Portia remained behind. Why do we take orders from him? Sick asked, when they were alone, anger bubbling beneath his words. I should kill him for what he did. No one lays a finger on me. No one. Portia took hold of his arm. It's just for a little while longer, she said. Then we won't need him any more. We won't need any of them. Come on. Come. She took his hand and led him out of the room. They had to step over Bespoke's body to do so. 
O'Callaghan hesitated, then pressed a key and the image froze. Sanguine stepped back so he could watch all three dead men. He saw the horror in Rue's eyes, the disbelief in Vex's. It almost made him laugh to see them in such distress. He'd never liked Ghastly Bespoke. His only regret was that he hadn't been the one with the blade to his throat. There was a mirror on the wall with magnetic numbers stuck onto the surface. Pleasant walked over, cleared the numbers to one side, and examined his reflection. He straightened his tie. Vex, Rue, and O'Callaghan watched him. It occurred to Sanguine that everything Pleasant was wearing had probably been made by Bespoke. What do we do? Rue asked. Pleasant took off his hat, adjusted the brim. Replay the footage. We need to hear everything that was said. Then we release it over the global link. Our people need to know that Roarhaven is no longer a refuge. About Erskine? Rue said. What do we do about Erskine and Mist? All that, Pleasant said, putting his hat back on. We kill them. We kill them all. Chapter 53 In Her Head Valkyrie was in her uncle's house when the phone rang. She looked at it and listened to the ring until it filled her head, and then she picked it up. Hello, she said. Who is this? a man asked. My name is Valkyrie Kane, said Valkyrie. I'm twelve years old and my uncle has just died. I know Edgley's dead, said the man. He sounded angry. What are you doing in that house? Why are you in his house? Valkyrie frowned. The ringing had made her head hurt. Mm, wait. Someone pounded on the front door. Open up, the man shouted. Open the damn door! Valkyrie jumped up off the couch, ran to the fireplace and grabbed the poker. The pounding on the door stopped, and she turned to the window beside her. The curtains were open. Outside was pitch black. She could see her own reflection in the glass. She didn't look twelve years old. She was too tall, too broad, and her clothes were too small, too tight. They stretched across her. A hand knocked on the window. Are you alone in there? The man asked. But before she could answer, the window exploded and the man leaped in. She went to swing at him with the poker, but realized she wasn't holding it anymore. Instead, she wore a black ring that left a trail of shadows in its wake. So she used those shadows and sent them snapping into him. The man tumbled backwards into the corner. She looked down at herself. She was wearing black now. Everything fitted. The man charged at her, and she pushed at the air, and he went hurtling into a bookcase. The door opened behind her, and a skeleton in a nice suit walked in. Hello, Skullduggery, she said. He tipped his hat to her, and they watched the man get to his feet and start to sweat, and then the man melted and disappeared between the floorboards. Why are you here? she asked Skullduggery. Did you know I was going to be attacked? Were you using me as bait? He turned his head to her. The less you know about all this, the better. You're a perfectly normal young lady, and after tonight, you're going to return to your perfectly normal life. It wouldn't do for you to get involved in this. She frowned. We've had this conversation before, about how involved I get. But we can limit that involvement. I don't understand. Why am I twelve? I'm not twelve. I'm eighteen. That man didn't dissolve here. He dissolved in the canal. You threw fire at him and shot him. I don't... I don't think this is real. But it's what's best for you. She winced. I've got a headache. I don't understand this. It's like deja vu, but... But it's staying with me. I don't feel well. But it might... I'm going to be sick. I'm going to throw up. Why does my head hurt so much? 
This isn't real. Something's wrong. Don't you feel it? What's the last thing you remember? The last thing I remember is fighting. I remember lots of people fighting and we were at war. My God, how could I have forgotten? Skullduggery? We were at war and all the other sanctuaries were trying to take over and somebody hit me and... Don't you want to get back to that world? What world? What are you talking about? It's safer there. You're not making any sense. He cocked his head. Funny. When I first met your uncle, that's what he said too. She stepped back. You're not skullduggery. Who are you? This isn't right. This isn't how it happened. What's going on? Who are you? I don't know you. She turned and ran into a vast library where bookshelves grew like great oaks, stretching towards the ice-blue sky. In the clearing of the forest of books stood China Sorrows. He has anger in him like you have never seen, said China. He has hatred in him that you would never dream about. You should have been there during the war, you know. You should have seen him then. Skullduggery emerged from the shadows beside China, his eyeless gaze fixed on Valkyrie. You asked me what is my nature. It is a dark and twisted thing. Valkyrie tried to focus, but it was hard with the pain in her head and the constant buzzing. Has he corrupted you yet? Solomon Wreath asked from behind her. She turned, squinting at him through the gloom. He corrupts everyone he meets. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how much you're changing simply by being around him? The pain jabbed at her, and her knees went weak, and she fell back into a chair in bespoke tailors. She looked up and watched Ghastly working on the sewing machine. Did Skullduggery ever tell you about my mother? he asked without looking up. She was a sensitive. Did he tell you that? She told me that Skullduggery would take a partner sometime in the future. A girl with dark hair and dark eyes. She said there was an enemy I had to fight. A creature of darkness. She said Skullduggery fought by her side for some of it, but she sensed things more than she saw them, you know. She felt terror and death and futility. She felt the world on the edge of destruction. And she sensed evil, unimaginable evil. I don't want to hurt anyone, Valkyrie said quietly, and sat back. The seatbelt was tight across her chest. Skullduggery always insisted on the seatbelt whenever they were in the Bentley. She looked at him now, sitting beside her, and she took a deep breath. Are you ready? I am, Skullduggery said. You're sure? Quite sure. Okay. So I'll tell you. Here I go. Skullduggery? Yes, Valkyrie? I'm... I don't know how to say this. I... She swallowed. I'm... She wanted to say, I'm Darkus. But the car was suddenly filled with light and noise, and now she was sitting somewhere else, in a hard chair and her ankles and wrists were held in place, and she opened her eyes and saw the woman sitting in front of her. The woman grunted, frowning in surprise. She's awake. They were in a barn. It was big. Sunlight streamed in. Old farm machinery was stacked against one side. Valkyrie's mouth was dry. Her left eye was swollen. She turned her head. Tanith was in a chair beside her dried blood on her face, and beside Tanith, Donegan Bain. Their hands and feet were shackled, and their eyes were closed. There were people sitting in front of them, too, sensitives. General Mantis walked into Valkyrie's field of vision. It peered down at her. I thought she was the only one of them without psychic defenses, it said. The woman nodded. She is. This should be easy. But there's something. It feels like there's something in there, in her mind, keeping me out. 
Try again, Mantis said. She must know where Skullduggery Pleasant has retreated to. And we don't have time to waste. Go deeper. Valkyrie tried to speak, but she was too tired, and the woman leaned forward and pressed her fingers to Valkyrie's forehead. It will really be easier on you if you stop resisting, the woman said quietly. The more you fight, the more it hurts. Please, Valkyrie managed to whisper. Stop. Don't wake her up. Don't wake who up? Tears rolled down Valkyrie's cheeks. Please. She'll kill you all. It'll be all right, said the woman. Just relax. I'm going to poke around in your head a little more, and then it'll all be over. No. Shh, said the woman. Everything is going to be all right. I promise. No, Valkyrie said. You don't understand. You don't understand. The headache started again, and she closed her eyes, wincing, the pain in her head coming in rapid beats, like a knife on a chopping board. She looked up, realized she was in her kitchen back in Haggard. Clarabelle was hunched over something on the table. No, not something. Someone. Valkyrie moved round. Clarabelle's lips were black, and she had a scalpel in her hand that she was using to chop up Ken Speckle Grouse's fingers like they were carrots. There was no blood, though, and Ken Speckle didn't seem to mind. Valkyrie, he said, smiling at her. I haven't seen you in weeks. Staying out of trouble? Not really, she said, frowning. Nor did I expect you to. What are you doing in my house? What if my parents come home? Professor, I think I'm in trouble. There's something wrong, but I can't remember what it is. It's important, though. It's... Professor, doesn't that hurt? Ken Speckle gave a little laugh. Don't you worry about me, Valkyrie. I'm tougher than I look. With the last of Ken Speckle's fingers cut into thin slices, Clarabel reached for a bigger scalpel and started slicing his hand. Ken Speckle watched her work, smiling in appreciation of a job well done, then looked back at Valkyrie. So what has he dragged you into this time? Skullduggery doesn't drag me anywhere, Valkyrie said, immediately defensive. Then she felt bad. She shouldn't be cross with Ken Speckle. He was dead, after all. We're at war, she explained. The other sanctuaries, they want to take over. There was a... a battle. They won. I think I was... I might have been captured. But Skullduggery got away. Ken Speckle's eyes flickered to someone standing beside Valkyrie. She realized Skullduggery had been there all along. Do you not feel one iota of responsibility? Ken Speckle asked him. She could have been killed. Yet again... While out with you, she could have been killed. Would you have felt anything then? Do you remember ever actually having a heart, or were you born dead? Skullduggery's facade flowed over his skull, but instead of imitation flesh, it was blackest shadow. The world is a dangerous place, he said. In order for people like you to live in relative safety, there need to be people like me. Killers, you mean? An arm draped itself round Valkyrie's shoulders while she looked at Skullduggery standing there. Don't worry, sweetie, Davina Marr whispered in her ear. I know what it is. All those hormones raging. You have all those conflicting emotions. You had a crush on him before he was pulled into hell, didn't you? You can tell me. It's sad and pathetic and highly amusing, but I promise I won't laugh. Valkyrie went to shove Mar away from her, but it was Fletcher she pushed. You look at Skullduggery, and that's who you model yourself on, he said. He's brave. You're brave. He's cold. You're cold. 
He's ruthless. You're ruthless. Well done, Val. You share the emotional range of a dead man. She turned back to Skullduggery. The others were gone now. All that remained of Ken Speckle were chopped up bits of dried flesh. Skullduggery looked at her with his black skull. You're a bad influence on me, she said. I never claimed otherwise. They'd spoken those words before. This conversation was a rerun. It wasn't real. None of it was real. She wasn't in her house. She was in a... a barn. She'd been captured, and there was someone in her head. Valkyrie walked out into the hall. It was suddenly dark outside. Hello? she said loudly. I know you're here. I can feel your frustration. She opened the front door and stepped out into the middle of the battle she'd been taken from. It was quiet, and everyone moved slowly, like time was crawling. She walked through them until she found the woman who had been sitting opposite her in the barn. You're in my head, said Valkyrie. The woman frowned. You're not supposed to be able to see me. A bullet moved lazily through the air. Valkyrie checked its trajectory. It wasn't going to hit anyone. She examined a fist, striking a face, watched the spittle erupt from the distorted mouth with agonizing slowness. You want to know where Skullduggery is? she said. I don't know where he is. I can't help you. You'd better leave me alone. The woman nodded. And I will. I just have to make sure you're telling the truth. And this is how you go about it? Valkyrie asked. Stringing together a bunch of memories to get me to open up? It works. Not on me. Why is that? You don't want to know. Valkyrie ducked her head under a sword and moved past a falling man with all the time in the world. She got closer to the sensitive. You'd better leave. She's coming. Who is? My bad mood. The sensitive smiled. I'm going to have to push a bit deeper now. Okay? I apologize in advance for anything embarrassing I might uncover. Is that part of it? Valkyrie asked. Do you use a person's embarrassment and shame against them? That really doesn't seem fair. The woman shrugged. Exposing uncomfortable truths breaks down the biggest walls. You should save yourself the trauma. Just let me in. It's not up to me. Then who is it up to? Me, said Darkus. Valkyrie opened her eyes. The sensitive opposite her sat ramrod straight, her eyelids fluttering, her mouth open. Her nose was bleeding. It was dark outside. The barn was empty apart from Valkyrie, Tanith, and Donegan and the three psychics who were trying to break into their minds. Release me, Valkyrie said. The sensitive moaned, then shifted forward and fell to her knees. She took a key from her pocket, undid the ankle restraints first, then the wrist shackles. Magic flooded Valkyrie's body, and she stood up. The sensitive whimpered. Valkyrie could see into her mind. It was such a fragile thing, easily broken. Release my friends, she said, and the sensitive scampered over to Tanith to do just that. Valkyrie went to Tanith's psychic, wrapped an arm round his throat, and tightened. By the time he withdrew from Tanith's mind, he was already sliding into unconsciousness. Valkyrie let him fall and did the same thing to the psychic opposite Donegan, even as Tanith was standing on shaky legs. What the hell just happened? she murmured. Valkyrie didn't answer. She waited until Donegan was free and then ordered the sensitive to stand. Blood was now running from the woman's ears. It would have been so easy to reach a little further into her mind and wrench everything sideways. Do it. Instead, Valkyrie moved behind her, strangled her until she went limp. Donegan blinked. 
Is this real? Are we really out of our shackles? It's real, said Valkyrie, struggling to get her thoughts in order, struggling to push her bad mood down. We have to get out of here. Either of you have your phone? Donegan searched his pockets, scowled and shook his head. Tanith went searching through the barn, found her coat and sword on the bench nearby, but no phones. Valkyrie took the sensitive's phone as Donegan limped to the door and took a peek outside. We're not getting out this way, he said. Tanith walked up the wall, the wood groaning slightly under her weight. She disappeared into the gloom beyond the rafters. I think we can get out here, she said after a moment. I'll need something to prise a few boards loose, though. Valkyrie went to the workbench, found a crowbar, and used the air to send it drifting upwards. Tanith's hand emerged from the shadows, took the crowbar and vanished with it. There was a scraping from up above, and a creak and a snap, and a broken board bounced off the rafters and fell. Donegan caught it before it hit the ground and laid it carefully to one side. Tanith dropped, crouching, to the thickest rafter. Come on up, she said. Donegan looked at Valkyrie. Do you mind? Not at all, she said, and the air rushed in and Donegan shot upwards like he'd been fired from a cannon. Tanith caught his arm before he started to drop back down again and pulled him up the rest of the way. Moving carefully, he stood on the rafter, hands out to steady himself. Tanith clasped her hands and boosted him up into the gloom. Valkyrie heard him climbing, and then Tanith too nodded to her. One more rush of air, and then she too was being pulled up onto the rafter. Now that she was up here, she could see the narrow gap that Tanith had made in the roof. Donegan was reaching down to her. Valkyrie stepped on Tanith's clasped hands and straightened, and Donegan pulled her through. Outside, the stars glittered coldly. Moving slowly, she crawled to the edge and looked down. Mantis had taken over an old farmhouse. The enemy were everywhere, sitting round campfires, chatting and laughing and slapping each other's backs. They weren't bad people. She knew they weren't. Their laughter wasn't cruel. They were just soldiers who needed to let off a little steam after a battle. The more Valkyrie listened, the more their joviality sounded forced, like they were trying to drown out their own doubts over what had just happened. She crawled back, joining Tanith and Donegan on the other side of the roof, where things were quiet and dark. A sentry patrolled below them. Before Valkyrie could stop her, Tanith dropped onto him. She didn't know if he were dead or just unconscious, but he didn't make a sound. Linking arms with Donegan, she used the air to lower them from the roof. They landed silently and followed Tanith through the trees. When they were far enough away, Valkyrie took the stolen throne from her jacket. No, Donegan said quickly. We can't use that. They'll be able to pinpoint where the call is picked up. We'd lead them right to Skullduggery and the others. Valkyrie muttered a curse, went to drop the phone, but she stopped. A message was flashing. There's something in the global link, she said. The subject is Roarhaven compromised. Donegan frowned, took the phone off her, tapped it a few times. Valkyrie and Tanith stood beside him. An image filled the screen, ghastly and ravel and shudder facing off against mist and the children of the spider. Donegan tapped the screen again, and the footage began to play. Chapter 54 Stephanie Edgley Stephanie's parents had understood. She'd had a speech rehearsed. It had been impassioned yet sensible, sincere yet witty, and it had made some very valid points on the importance of taking a year out to decide what she wanted to do with her life. The colleges and universities weren't going anywhere, after all, so why rush into anything? It had been a great speech, and she hadn't needed one word of it. So here she was, on a Wednesday afternoon, in the middle of October, alone in the house, and wondering what to do with the rest of her day. Wondering what to do with the rest of her year, come to that. She climbed the stairs, humming a Rihanna song. She walked into her bedroom, and went suddenly cold like a hand of ice had seized her heart. There was a cloaking sphere on her desk. 
Then she noticed Valkyrie sitting on the bed with her head down. Stephanie stared at her for a moment. Here she was again, here to take back everything Stephanie loved. Castley's dead, Valkyrie said in a broken voice. Stephanie frowned. What? Ravel killed him. Shut her too. Ravel betrayed them. He... What do you mean dead? Like, really dead? Valkyrie nodded. Stephanie felt something. What was that? Sadness. She'd liked Ghastly. Or at least she'd liked Valkyrie's memories of him. She wondered if she'd miss him. You look terrible, she said. Valkyrie did look bad. She looked exhausted, like she could do with a sleep and a long shower. It's all going wrong, she muttered. They fell into our trap. We had them. We were going to beat them. Then, I don't know. There were more of them. We were all split up. I was with Tanith and Donegan. You're not with Skullduggery? Stephanie asked. Valkyrie shook her head. They were captured. They had a psychic digging around in my brain. I've been hearing. She faltered, but Stephanie knew. Darkus, she said. Valkyrie nodded. She's talking to me. Right now, she's talking to me. I'm doing my best to ignore her, but... Valkyrie grimaced, and Stephanie knew that Darkus had just said something. Where are Donegan and Tanith now? she asked. Valkyrie gave a quick shrug. Donegan said we should split up. We're going to meet tomorrow. I'm so tired. I need sleep. She looked up. Where is everyone? Dad had to go into work, said Stephanie. Mum and Alice are over in Beryl's. Beryl and Fergus are worried about Carol. They say she's become very withdrawn lately. She won't even spend time with Crystal. Right, said Valkyrie, barely even listening to details about her own life, details she should be caring about. Instead, she just stood up and took off her jacket. If ever Stephanie had harbored doubts over what she had to do, they vanished then and there. I should probably get back in the mirror, she said. Valkyrie murmured something. Stephanie opened the wardrobe. She looked at her own reflection in the full-length mirror. A reflection's reflection. She peered into her own eyes, saw the life in them. Then she stepped through, into the two-dimensional mirror image of a slice of the bedroom. It used to seem so right to her, once upon a time. These days it was so jarring it made her queasy, especially with the flipping. She didn't know what the technical term for it would be, but for some time now she'd been able to flip her image whenever she emerged. When all this started, a watch worn on Valkyrie's left wrist would appear on Stephanie's right, but not with the flipping. Just another little thing, another improvement, another piece of evolution that Valkyrie had thoroughly missed. She turned and faced Valkyrie through the glass watched her touch her fingertips to the mirror on the other side. She saw the slight frown when Stephanie's image didn't alter to match her own. Valkyrie's memories flooded into her, and she allowed her own memories to flood Valkyrie's. She even added a few of the secret ones, the ones she'd been hiding. She let Valkyrie have the memory of the day Carol died had she let her experience the memory of being tortured in Mevelin's dungeon, of having her fingers cut off. Valkyrie staggered back, hands to her head, eyes wide. Stephanie stepped out of the mirror, back into the three-dimensional living world, and rooted through the bottom of the wardrobe. What did you do? said Valkyrie, knocking over the bedside table. What did you do? Stephanie straightened up the scepter of the ancients in her hand. Valkyrie jerked away, stumbled back towards the door. What are you? My name is Stephanie. I'm a person. I'm real. The scepter only bonds to people who are real, right? 
It's bonded to me. There were tears in Valkyrie's eyes. You killed Carol. She won't be missed. Not really. Why? I don't understand why you... Too lazy to sort through the memories? Stephanie asked. Just like you're too lazy to go to school and too lazy to study to do homework? I'm taking over, Valkyrie. I'm taking Mum and Dad and Alice, and I'm making them mine. Valkyrie walked backwards, out onto the landing, her jacket still clutched in her hand. Stephanie followed at a respectable distance. You're broken, said Valkyrie. You're malfunctioning. Get back in the mirror and we'll fix you. The scepter flashed, and black lightning turned the wardrobe to dust. She turned to Valkyrie. No more mirror, she said. I'm out here, for good. Valkyrie backed off the top step of the staircase. For a moment, Stephanie thought she might tumble down. But no, she kept her balance. Pity. You're going to kill me? Of course, Stephanie said. I'll kill you, and you won't kill my parents. I don't kill them. That's Darkus. Darkus is you, said Stephanie, following her down the stairs. That little voice in your head? That's not another person. That's your nasty side, your dark and twisted side. Even when your magic is bound, you could still hear that voice. And you're so close to giving into it, aren't you? Especially now, after Ghastly. So, so close. I can't allow that. Skullduggery will know. He'll, he'll think you were recaptured. And if he figures it out, I'll kill him too. He won't suspect a thing. None of them will. I won't let you take my place. Bit late. Valkyrie reached the bottom of the stairs. Her eyes blazed with anger. You say you loved them. Look at yourself. You're damaged. You understand? You're not safe to be around. You're not a person. You're a malfunctioning thing. Five years ago, Skullduggery shot you to fake my death. Ever since then, you've been getting worse. Stephanie grew a smile as she followed Valkyrie into the living room. Actually, it was a few moments before that. It was when he pulled me from the puddle. That's when things started to change. See, I know everything you know, but you don't know everything I know. Here are the rules when it comes to reflections. Rule one, a reflection shouldn't be left out for too long. Oops. Rule two, reflections can't do magic. Rule three, each person has only one reflection. Once that reflection's physical body is destroyed, it can't return, and no new reflection can be conjured. Why do you think this war isn't being fought by thousands of reflection foot soldiers, hmm? Because they've all been destroyed by now. And rule four, once conjured, a reflection must emerge only from its original surface. In my case, the mirror I just destroyed. Skullduggery knew it was risky conjuring me from a second surface. He knew something could go wrong, but he did it anyway. So really, when you think about it, all this is his fault. Listen to me. You don't have to do this. We can... Say my name. Valkyrie frowned. What? My name? Say it. I want to hear you say my name. Why? Because you abandoned it and I picked it up, and I want to hear you acknowledge that. Valkyrie looked at her, but didn't say anything. Stephanie raised the scepter. Say it! No. Now it was Valkyrie's turn to see anger flash in Stephanie's eyes. Say my name! No! Stephanie stepped forward and cracked the scepter off Valkyrie's head. Valkyrie stumbled against the back of the sofa. Say my name or I'll turn you to dust! Valkyrie held her hand to her forehead as blood started to trickle. She looked at the black crystal, and then... You're not going to win, Stephanie, that name. That simple name, spoken by the girl who had abandoned it, brought a glow of pure joy to Stephanie's being, the likes of which she'd never felt before. And that joy brought tears. The first tears that weren't part of simulated emotion for the benefit of others. The first real tears. And in that moment, in that wonderful moment, Stephanie became truly whole. Valkyrie whipped her jacket of the scepter and stepped in with a punch that sent Stephanie reeling. 
Stephanie's arm went wide to stop her fall, and she swept half the mantelpiece clear. Valkyrie had the scepter now, and was pointing it straight at her. This is for Carol, she snarled. And nothing happened. Stephanie crashed into her, taking them both over the sofa. They sprawled out the other side, and Stephanie got up, grabbed Valkyrie by the hair, and kneed her in the head. She tried it again, but Valkyrie grabbed her legs and sprang. Stephanie's back hit the coffee table, and the wind rushed out of her. She slid onto the floor, and Valkyrie got on top, starting hitting her. Stephanie covered up as best she could, trying to breathe. She tasted blood. Her hand went searching for a weapon, and instead found the leg of the coffee table. She pulled the table over her head, struggled to keep it there while Valkyrie tried pushing it back. A few moments to blink and clear her head, and then Valkyrie lifted the table off her completely. Stephanie shot her hips off the ground and twisted, and they turned over and over again, knocking over the lamp that Stephanie's grandmother had left them. There was a mad scramble, and then Stephanie was flat on the floor, and Valkyrie had grabbed her wrist, tried to break her arm. Stephanie saw the move coming and countered, flipping Valkyrie onto her belly. She dived on her, her arm snaking round Valkyrie's throat. But Valkyrie bit down hard, and Stephanie cried out and moved her head just in time to catch Valkyrie's elbow right in the eye socket. Stephanie rolled off, howling in pain. A moment later, Valkyrie's boot slammed into her side. Through bleary eyes, she watched Valkyrie stride into the kitchen and take a knife from the rack. Stephanie forced herself up, looking for the scepter. She lunged to the fireplace as Valkyrie came back, grabbing the poker. You're going to stab me, she said, panting. You're really going to stab me to death? You're not alive, Valkyrie said, closing in. Stephanie swung the poker, and Valkyrie swayed back, came in with a straight stab. But Stephanie flicked the poker into her wrist. The knife dropped, and the poker flicked again, whacking into her head. Valkyrie stumbled, and Stephanie kicked, sending her into the patio door, cracking the glass. Valkyrie ducked the next swing, caught Stephanie with an elbow, and Stephanie lashed out blindly, hitting nothing. Valkyrie grabbed her and lifted her, and then the floor smacked into her head and Stephanie lay there in darkness. Over her own breathing, she heard Valkyrie groan as she got up. And then she heard a car. She opened her eyes. Valkyrie stood over her, frozen. The car's engine shut off. A door opened and closed. Mum's back, Stephanie mumbled. You really want her to find two of us here? Valkyrie looked down at her, her eyes wide with alarm. You'd better run, said Stephanie. I'll give her your love. The front door opened. Steph! Her mum called. We're home! Mum! Stephanie shouted. Help! Valkyrie whirled, grabbed her jacket off the ground, and held it in front of her as she sprinted for the patio door. Stephanie's mum rushed into the room, Alice in her arms, as Valkyrie leaped. She hit the glass and crashed through it, and Stephanie's mum cried out. Valkyrie stumbled but kept going, running to the back of the garden and vaulting over the wall. Alice was crying, and Stephanie's mum was on her knees beside Stephanie, and Stephanie tried her very best not to smile. Chapter 55 Refuge Valkyrie cut across the fields, staying away from the roads as she left Haggard behind her. The cops would be out looking for a girl in black, and she didn't think it'd be a good idea for them to pick her up and have her folks arrive at the lineup. She got to the next town over, walked the beach as the sun set, and chose a spot in among the sand dunes to lie down. She covered herself with her jacket and curled up. She didn't think she'd be able to sleep. It wasn't that she wasn't tired. She was. She was exhausted. It was just that her mind was too active. Her thoughts jostled against each other, and she couldn't calm them. She had no phone, no money to get a taxi, and her car was at her house, the keys with the reflection. Stephanie? Yes, Stephanie, as she now called herself. Stephanie, the murderous lunatic with the scepter and Valkyrie's family in her possession. 
It was all Valkyrie's fault, of course. She'd known something was wrong with the damn reflection. She'd known it for years. She'd even talked to Skullduggery about it, but she'd never pressed the issue. She'd never demanded a solution. She was too afraid that the solution might be to get rid of the thing altogether, and then Valkyrie would have had to resume her old life. And that would never do. Not when there was adventure and excitement to be had around every corner with Skullduggery. She could never give that up. Just like with Darkess, the moment she'd realized the truth, the moment she'd realized that she herself was the one all the sensitives were having nightmares about, she should have quit. She should have walked away. She should never have done magic again, never spoken to Skullduggery again, never given the voice within her any more power. But of course, she hadn't quit. You were having too much fun. How many sorcerers had thanked her for saving the world? How many had called her a hero? The truth was, she was too selfish to be a hero. She was too, what was the word? Narcissistic? That was it. She was too narcissistic. She'd lied to herself. She'd told herself she was doing good, she was saving lives. She told herself when the time came, when Darkus tried to take over, she'd be strong enough to fight back, to retain control. Even after all these slip-ups, she was delusional enough to think she could emerge victorious when it really mattered. Bless. Valkyrie turned over, tucking the jacket under her chin. She made herself think about Ghastly, and felt that part of herself start to ache again. She thought about Shudder, felt guilty that she'd barely considered his death. But then her thoughts went back to Ghastly, and she cried. She didn't think she'd fall asleep, but she did, and she dreamed of her fingers being cut off and her eye being plucked out, and she dreamed of killing Carol. When she woke, it was morning. She stood, shivering, and brushed the sand from her clothes. She pulled on the jacket and zipped it up, then left the beach. Her arms wrapped round herself. Her belly rumbled. She got to a bus stop and stood beside people waiting to go to work and to school. She kept watch for cop cars. The bus trundled up, and she let her fellow commuters get on ahead of her. She let her hair out of its ponytail, then climbed on and smiled at the driver. I don't have any money, she said. Do you have a ticket? he asked. No, but I really need to get into the city. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you. He kept the doors open, waiting for her to disembark. Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him! He looked at her. You don't appear to be getting off. I know, she said and I'm sorry, I've never done this before, but I just don't have any money. I don't have my phone. I need to get into town, and... The driver sighed. One free ride. Don't try this again. Thank you, really. Thank you. She found an empty seat and slid into it. Thank God for cool bus drivers. She got into town, gave the driver a peck on the cheek for his kindness and hopped off. She crossed the Liffey, hurried down the quays, and fought her way through the crowds of tourists in Temple Bar. Finbar Rong's tattoo parlour was tattooed itself, a mural-covered building that stood out beside its slightly more conservative neighbours. The ground floor was empty as usual, but as she hurried for the stairs, a voice behind her said, About time you got here. She spun as Skullduggery emerged from the back room, and she ran to him hugging him so tight she thought she might break his bones. Her tears soaked into his jacket, dark blue today. It was good to see him out of his combat gear and back in a suit. Everyone else is upstairs, he said, apart from Saracen and Fletcher. Saracen's out getting lunch. Tanith and Donegan told us what you've been through. It's going to be okay. She looked up at him. Ghastly. I know he said, his voice soft. But Cassandra's vision. We saw him with Tanith. We saw them kiss. We also saw Ravel on his knees, which is why we sent Ghastly and Anton with him in the first place. We changed the future, Valkyrie. 
but we'll make Ravel pay for everything he's done. You have my word. Come on. We have plans to make. He started for the stairs. Wait. Skullduggery, my... The reflection. She tried to kill me. His head tilted. What? She's calling herself Stephanie. She's not. She's different. She wants my family, my life. She has the scepter. How? I brought it with me, or Darkus did. She brought it back with her, but I thought it had stayed in the alternate reality. But she has it. Stephanie has it. We have to go back. Skullduggery paused for a moment. If you want to go, we'll go. But I don't think we should. Right now your family has a protector with your knowledge, your skills, and your intelligence. The reflection mightn't have your magic, but it has the scepter. Valkyrie, I know it sounds warped, but they couldn't be safer right now. But she's malfunctioning. Skullduggery nodded. Say the word, and we'll go. She stared at him, then sagged. Yeah, she muttered. Okay, she can wait. We'll get your family back, Valkyrie. I promise, he said, and led the way upstairs. Saracen arrived back with lunch, and Valkyrie ate ravenously and washed it down with scalding hot coffee. Tanith was sitting upside down and cross-legged on the ceiling. Below her, the monster hunters drank soft drinks while Saracen and Vex stood by the windows, keeping an eye on the street outside. Sanguin sat apart from everyone else, and Finbar waited patiently for the conversation to begin. Skullduggery took his hat off, adjusted the brim, and put it back on again. His house was being watched, so he couldn't get at the rest of his suits. The hat looks fine, said Vex. Skullduggery shook his head. It's out of shape. It's ruined. May as well just throw it away. There's nothing that can be done for it now. Gasly wasn't the only tailor in town, you know. But he was the best, said Skullduggery. How can I go back to an ordinary tailor now? I have standards. You also have a room devoted entirely to hats that he made you. I think you'll do okay. I'm not so sure, Skullduggery said. And everyone went quiet until he snapped his head up. All right, then. For the benefit of those who haven't been around in the last few days... Here's what's happening. The shield is down. We don't know how or why it came down, but it's down. The Supreme Council has taken over Ireland. The only place not under their control is Roarhaven, which is protected by another shield that is, thankfully, still up. General Mantis has the place surrounded, of course, and it's only a matter of time before they find a way in. Meanwhile... Sanctuaries within the Supreme Council have been turning against each other with delightful regularity. I'd like to think they were arguing among themselves because the injustice of the war had finally got to them. But I suspect there is something bigger going on. What about Ravel? asked Valkyrie. Skullduggery looked at her. He's still in Roarhaven. I mean, why did he do it? What does he want? He is our mystery man, right? He's the one we've been hunting. He's been with Mist from the start. All this time we thought it was him and Ghastly standing together and Mist isolated when actually it was Ghastly who was standing alone. But for God's sake, why? You saw the footage, Skullduggery responded. You heard what Mist said. They want the warlocks to attack Dublin and all their sorcerers to team up to fight them. Once we've been made public, once we've been called heroes, we take over. The mortals will love us, until they realise they're no longer in control, by which time it'll be too late to do anything to stop us. Ravel's a lot more cunning than I ever gave him credit for, said Vex. He went around with Carival Deuce for all those years, talking to people like the Roarhaven mages, convincing them that our duty is to protect the mortals, not rule them. And at the end of it all, he had a list of sorcerers around the world who agreed with his point of view. Who knows what else he's been up to? Let's make a list, said Skullduggery. Conspiring with the torment and Madame Mist, Ravel was behind the destruction of the sanctuary here in Dublin, in which dozens of lives were lost. The move to Roarhaven was his idea. 
I think we can safely assume that he murdered Caravaldius in order to replace him as Grand Mage, using the remnant attacks to cover it up, and then orchestrated assassination attempts on himself in order to gain full control over the Cleavers. He released Sean Mackin, maybe hoping that Kitana and her friends would attack the mortals in full view of the world. When that didn't happen, he returned to his warlock plan, which had been set in motion five years ago, but which had probably been on his mind for the last century. It would almost make me admire him, said Saracen, if I didn't hate him so much. But the fact remains, Skullduggery said, that while we may have our issues with Erskine Ravel, we need Roarhaven to stay strong against the Supreme Council and others. Finbar? Finbar nodded and stood, cleared his throat. Yeah, thanks, Skullman. Well, as most of you know, the last two years haven't exactly been easy for me. Someone or something... We shall remain nameless, but may very well be sitting upside down on my ceiling right now, got into my head during all that remnant drama, and forced me to push myself further than I'd have liked, physically. You say that like it wasn't fun, Tanit said. Finbar looked at Skullduggery. I'm not talking to her. Please tell her not to interrupt. I can't handle talking to her. Finbar, said Tanit sounding hurt. Why can't we be friends? I used to be you. I know everything there is about you. All your secret thoughts. All your little desires. Tanith, shut up, said Skullduggery. Finbar, please continue. Finbar cleared his throat again. Right. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, well, you have to be careful about what I open myself up to these days. But this morning, I had a vision. And it was a vision of... of me. I don't... Sensitives don't normally get visions of themselves. But there I was, here, in this very room. And I look out this window, and... And there are these people walking through the streets, some of them hovering in the air. And they're shooting these beams of light, and buildings are exploding, and... People are going bananas and vaporising when they're hit, and there are cops. There are loads of cops shooting at them, having no effect. Then this place gets hit, and there's all this noise and rubble, and I'm trapped. And I look up, and one of them, one of these people, passes by me, and then my vision goes deeper, because I kind of, I go into his head, you know? And I see what he's seen. And suddenly... I know who he is, and that he's a warlock, and I see him in the sanctuary, in this big machine, and from the sounds of it, it's this accelerator you keep talking about, and there's this guy and, I don't know, maybe thirty or forty others, all getting jacked up on accelerator juice, and leading the pack is this big, bald fella with more muscles than I have had hot dinners, and I've had a lot of hot dinners. Sharon makes a wicked curry. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. What would the warlocks be doing in the sanctuary? They think Department X is real. Shouldn't they be attacking mortal targets? Why the hell does it matter? Sanguine asked. The Rawhaven shield ain't letting anybody through. Warlock or not. That's not what I saw, Finbar said. When I saw into this bloke's head... I saw them kill all the sorcerers who went against them. They get in, they use the accelerator, and after that, there's no one to stop them. Dublin. Dublin's destroyed, and it's probably only the start of what they'll do. A city in ruins. Valkyrie had seen that before. It wasn't just us who evaded capture in the valley, said Skullduggery. A few other groups got out too. I've been in contact with some of them. They've heard that six experts in science magic are scheduled to enter the country today in a small convoy. It's safe to assume that Mantis will be using them to try to bring down the Rawhaven shield. So we intercept? asked Saracen. You do, said Skullduggery. If possible, subdue and detain. But it won't be easy, 
Security would be very tight. And what about you? Sanguin said. While we're going up against overwhelming odds, what are you going to be doing? We change the future. In order to stop the warlocks, and the Supreme Council, for that matter, from getting to the accelerator, we need a way to get through the shield ourselves. So Valkyrie and I will be going after Fletcher. Donegan sat up a little straighter. The woman my contact put us in touch with, a Juoga, it turns out she might very well be a bride of blood tears. Skullduggery looked at him. This contact of yours, can he help us find her? I'm afraid not. He was found dead two days ago. The brides don't leave loose ends. Efficient but annoying. Very well. We have other ways of tracking them down. I can come, if you want, said Saracen. You'll be needed to take down the convoy. Ah, I'm sure Dexter has that covered. No, I don't, Vex said. Sorry, if I don't go hunting for brides of blood tears, then you don't go hunting for brides of blood tears. Valkyrie frowned. What's so special about the brides of blood tears? Saracen looked at her. You'll see, he said. If ever I had to be captured and shackled by anyone, I'd want to be captured and shackled by them. Oh, and take sunscreen. Sunscreen? Valkyrie echoed. Why? Where are we going? Skullduggery looked at her. Africa, he said. Chapter 56 The Documentary China's shadows never left her. Everywhere she went in Roarhaven, they were behind her. She didn't know their names. Two majors, that's all they were, but they were impossible to lose. Not that she tried. She was focusing on getting her strength back, not on ditching the people who'd been assigned to keep an eye on her. She'd been from one side of this dreary little town to the other. She'd walked round the stagnant lake and approached the shield. On the other side, she could see Mantis's army preparing for attack. They'd been preparing for days. When she got back to the sanctuary, Ravel was waiting for her. It was the first time she'd seen him since he'd murdered Ghastly Bespoke. Behind him stood the black cleaver, as silent and still as a corpse. "'You're back early,' Ravel said. "'You don't usually return from your walk for another hour.' She gave him a smile. "'My shadows looked weary.' "'Ah, uh, yes. They're not very subtle, are they? "'I hope you'll forgive me, China, but you have a proud history of treachery. "'I doubt it'd take much to get you to add us to your list.' "'Betray the only people keeping me safe?' she said. "'You know me well enough to know that I am entirely self-serving. "'Vincent Foe and his group of miscreants are on the other side of your rather glorious shield. "'Believe me, I have no intention of doing anything to jeopardize my place within this glorious shield. "'Madame Mist tells me you've had a lot of phone calls lately. "'Don't worry.' We haven't been listening in. With the number of firewalls you have on your phone, I'm surprised even you can hear what's being said. But one of her little spidery acolytes had been making a note every time someone calls you. I am a popular girl. Well, that's just it. You're not, are you? You once were, before Eliza burned your library to cinders. A temporary lapse, I assure you. Informants are notoriously fickle people, and they're scared of uncertainty and loud noises. But now that I'm part of the sanctuary, now that I have been seen to ally myself with Erskine Ravel himself, some old lines of communication are opening back up. I'm hearing whispers again. Anything interesting? Maybe something useful enough to allow you to remain under our protection for a little longer. I may have something for you. Skullduggery? The warlocks. They don't worry me. They may be powerful, but there are only a handful of them. And I don't think we'll be their target anyway. I have reason to believe they'll be striking Dublin. Maybe you should start to worry. Do you remember what wretchlings are? Ravel frowned. Yes, I think. They're before my time. Before yours, too. But in the simplest terms, they were organic. 
Hollow men. Artificial, man-made people. China nodded. But instead of being made from foul gases and paper skin, they were made from meat and blood and entrails. Because of this, they were in a constant state of rot. No one has constructed any for a thousand years because of their sheer savagery. It would appear that thousand years is now up. Caravari has retchlings. Indeed he does. As to how many, I couldn't say. It all depends how long he's been planning this. Ravel nodded slowly. She could tell he hadn't expected this. It felt good to watch him frown after what he'd done. He snapped out of it. That is interesting, he said. But I'm sure it's nothing we can't handle. I have a favour to ask, actually. Oh? He gestured, and two men came hurrying forward. The sloppy one with the beard held a camera. The clean-shaven one held a notepad. Ravel smiled, all charm. China Sorrows, allow me to introduce Kenny Dunn and Patrick Slattery. They stared at her, and the one called Kenny started to blush. Slattery stepped forward. I don't make much money, but I will give you all of it, whatever you want. I know we've just met, but I feel a connection between us, a real connection, and that's not something that happens every day. It's not something you can ignore. So here I am, a boy, standing in front of a girl, telling her he loves her. Kenny barged forward. He stole that from a movie. I did not, said Slattery quickly. He did. He stole it from Notting Hill. Only the last bit. I'd never steal a line from a movie for you, Kenny said, gazing deep into China's eyes. You deserve more than that. You deserve poetry and originality, and you deserve everything, everything in the whole world. I don't deserve you, but but if you give me a chance, then maybe I can become a man that you could some day love. He stole that from a movie, Slattery said. No, I didn't, said Kenny. It just sounds like I did, because it's from the heart. Mine was from the heart. Yours are from a DVD collection. I don't own Notting Hill, Slattery said, derision in his voice. The only Richard Curtis film I own is Love, actually, because it's actually a really lovely film. I haven't seen it, China said. You could have a loan of mine if you like, said Kenny. Gentlemen, Ravel said. I asked China to talk to you in an effort to convince you to get our message across. China, some of my people stumbled across these two in Dublin asking all sorts of odd questions. They brought them to me, and I saw a way to help the arts and our cause. Gentlemen, you're making a documentary about us, after all. Wouldn't it be better to let us help you make it? Kenny spoke to Ravel, but couldn't take his eyes off China. We're journalists, he said. We have journalistic integrity. What you... What you are talking about sounded like you'd be telling us what we could and could not, you know, film. That's not what I meant at all, Ravel said. All I meant was that if, God forbid, some people attack the mortal population of this country, you would have documented proof that we leap to the mortal's defence the first chance we got. Something like this, broadcast around the world would show people that we aren't a threat to them, that there was really no need to fear us, that, in fact, they might benefit from our guidance. Sounds like propaganda, Slattery said, smiling at China. We're journalists. Our duty is to the... to the... Oh, what do you call us? Uh, the truth. China looked at them both and smiled. Please? Slattery whimpered, and Kenny nodded so fast he could have given himself whiplash. Okay, no problem, I love you. Oh, China said. Thank you. Chapter 57 Sunburn The jeep slowed, and Skullduggery turned off the engine and they got out. 
The first thing that struck Valkyrie was how cold it was. There were no clouds, and more stars in that vast sky than she had ever seen. Her sense of wonderment was ruined by the yawn that overtook her. It had been a long flight, and then a long drive, and she was sore and tired. She didn't know the name of this village, but it perched quietly on the edge of the Sahara Desert like an obedient puppy waiting to be petted. A man emerged from the shadows, walked over to them with a smile on his face. Detectives, he said, shaking their hands. My name is Tao. The Council of Elders asked me to meet you here and offer you any and all assistance. I believe you wish to visit the dwelling of the Brides of Blood Tears, is that right? They're holding an associate of ours, Skullduggery said. We're just here to ask for him back. The Brides are not known for giving up those things they have taken. We plan on being persuasive, said Valkyrie. Tao smiled. Indeed. The Brides live in a vast pyramid to the west of here. Come with me, I will take you to your transport. Tao led the way round the outskirts of the sleeping village. A dog crossed their path, looked at them without interest, and continued on. Hey, said Tao, did you hear? Renato Bishahalani is dead. There was surprise in Skaldogri's voice. By whose hand? He was struck down by assassins, so I've been told, said Tao. They're dropping like flies, aren't they? I am glad I have never been respectable enough to become an elder, he chuckled. A truck was parked behind a crumbling white wall. Valkyrie's necromancer ring turned cold. She reached out, a hand on Skullduggery's arm, and they slowed. A dark mass lay crumpled by the truck's rear wheel. Tao noticed it and jerked to a stop. Skullduggery tapped her nodded to a pile of broken pots beside them. Behind it, another dead body. Tao turned, the shadows falling over his face. Then his hand started crackling with energy, and he raised his arm, and a large figure rushed him, a sword cutting through the arm at the wrist. Tao screamed, staggered backwards, and the sword swung again and took his head. Skullduggery remained absolutely still so Valkyrie fought the urge to leap forward. She couldn't see in the dark like he could. Apologies for the drama, Frightening Jones said, wiping a sword clean as he neared. Their associates ambushed me this morning. One of them stayed alive long enough to tell me what they planned. Skullduggery, you're looking well. Valkyrie, a pleasure as always. Whenever she met Frightening, Valkyrie had to consciously stop herself from bowing. There was just something so inherently regal about this calm African. The way he carried himself was almost kinglike. Who were they? Skullduggery asked. Pirates, said Frightening. There is really no other word for it. They steal and loot, and if their prize is worth enough, they sell it on. That's what they were planning to do with you. The Supreme Council would pay handsomely for either of you in shackles. But you guys are on our side, Valkyrie murmured, her eyes irresistibly drawn to Tao's head lying in the sand. There are three sanctuaries in Africa, Frightening pointed out. At the best of times, there are opposing factions. But now that our elders are dead... More sorcerers are breaking away and looking out only for themselves. How are the replacement elders? Skullduggery asked. Doing their job? Doing their best? Rival made some good choices when he appointed them. He lowered his eyes. I was sorry to hear about Ghastly. He was a friend and a good man. I can't believe that it was Ravel who did it. We'll make him pay. Skullduggery said. Is it true? Valkyrie asked. About Bishahalani? It is, said Frightening. Zafira Karias has assumed his place as Grand Mage of America. These are turbulent times we live in. But for now, your chariot awaits. He led them round the truck. I'll take you most of the way. 
but from its end point on, you'll need to walk. The brides live in a pyramid that's only visible from a certain angle, and they value their privacy. I've never been there myself, but I've been told if you stay on a south-southwesterly trajectory, you will eventually reach it. Eventually? Valkyrie said, frowning. How long is eventually? No more than seven hours. Wow. It's a good thing Skaldegory can fly, then. Ah, no flying, I'm afraid. What? The brides will detect any extraordinary usage of magic. Throwing a fireball will be fine. Flying, I'm afraid, will not. Valkyrie sagged. So we have to walk? For seven hours? On sand? I have some water for you. How about a piggyback instead? Frightening smiled. If I were accompanying you, I would be honored. Unfortunately, I have business in Egypt. She immediately looked at Skullduggery, who immediately shook his head. I'm not giving you a piggyback. But I got tired walking from there to here, she whined. Think how bad I'll be after seven hours. They stopped beside a double seat that someone had torn from a bus, and when they didn't walk past it, Valkyrie's frown deepened. Please don't tell me this is their chariot, she said. When no one answered, she continued, It's a seat. There's no car around it. There's no engine. There aren't any wheels. Chariots are meant to be pulled by horses. Where are the horses? Her eyes widened, and she looked around them. Are they invisible horses? Even the brides of blood tears need to occasionally shop for supplies, said Frightening. This is the transport they have arranged for themselves. It travels at over two hundred kilometers per hour and cannot deviate from its course. I am told the journey to its end point will take nine hours. Valkyrie stared. So we sit on that thing for nine hours, traveling at a ridiculous speed, and then we have to walk for another seven hours? How is that practical? The brides do not shop often. Apparently not. Frightening handed her a canteen. Here is your water. Granted, you probably don't need this. You are an elemental, after all. You can conjure water from the moisture in the air. Valkyrie made a face. How much moisture is there in desert air? Skullduggery brushed the seat clean of sand and sat. How many brides should we expect to encounter? If you're lucky, Frightening said, none. Hopefully you'll sneak in, find Fletcher, and you can all teleport back to Ireland before they notice you're there. I don't like dealing with witches. I don't understand their magic, and they, you know, they creep me out. But to answer your question, I was told there could be as many as three hundred brides in that pyramid. And for every bride, there are at least two devoted trailing after them. Valkyrie sat beside Skullduggery. Devoted? Mortal men who toil in servitude, Frightening told her. Some of them willing slaves. They obey without question and without complaint. Mostly because their tongues were cut out before puberty set in. They can't talk. I honestly cannot think of anything more terrible. I could see some advantages, Skullduggery murmured. Frightening laughed. Ha! Good luck, my friends, and enjoy the ride. Apparently, it's just like a roller coaster. He slapped the back of the seat, and the whole thing lifted into the air, high enough so that both Skullduggery and Valkyrie's feet cleared the ground. And you might want to hold on to something. Frightening said as he walked away, and in that instant they sprang forward, accelerating so suddenly that Valkyrie was pressed back into the seat. They moved straight out, away from the village, soundlessly skimming over the sand, picking up even more speed. The air filled Valkyrie's cheeks, ballooning them out while her hair went nuts. Giggling, she glanced at Skullduggery, who sat there with a hand held in front of him. Not even a breeze ruffled his shirt. Don't be boring, she roared at him over the wind. He moved his head a fraction. Come on, it's fun. His head moved in that way that was his equivalent of rolling his eyes. But he took off his hat 
and held it to his chest, and then he dropped his hand. Immediately the wind whipped his tie across his jaw. The seat skimmed over a high dune and plunged down the other side, and Valkyrie screamed and laughed and gripped Skullduggery's arm. Tears streamed from her eyes, but she could barely lift a hand to wipe them away. Beside her, the wind was making a deep whooshing noise as it passed through Skullduggery's eye sockets. Facade! she shouted. Put your facade on! He hesitated only a moment, then tapped his collarbones. The false face crept quickly across his head, but the features struggled to stay where they were supposed to. His cheeks were like Valkyries, ballooning outwards, but even his eyes were being dragged around his head. The wind went up his nostrils and flipped his nose inside out, and Valkyrie laughed until their speed made it hard to draw breath. For the first time, she noticed how cold she was, and she tightened her grip on Skullduggery's arm, and he held up his hand, deflecting the air around them. Valkyrie gasped in the sudden quiet. Skullduggery's face settled into position, and he looked at her with a raised eyebrow. Enough fun for you? My skin stings, she said. You've just had sand blasted at you at two hundred kilometers per hour. I'm not surprised your skin stings. You should have worn your mask. You could have told me that at the start. Then how will you learn? They hurtled down another dune. But below them, around them, the sand was dark. Above them, a vast sky with countless stars. It's beautiful, she said softly. It has its moments. Valkyrie awoke with her head resting on Skullduggery's shoulder, and even before she'd opened her eyes, the world was bright and hot and harsh. She sat up a little straighter, cracked her eyelids. The dark dunes beneath had become golden, and the countless stars were now hidden behind a sky of perfect blue. The seat slowed as it came to the top of a dune, and the moment Skullduggery stopped deflecting the air, the heat closed in on Valkyrie like a fist. Whoa! she croaked. The seat stopped and lowered to the sand. Skullduggery stood, put his hat back on. Valkyrie held out her hand, and he pulled her to her feet. Her back was stiff, her legs were numb, and she was hot. She was incredibly hot. She tied her hair back, then fumbled in her pocket for her sunglasses and put them on. She took a long swig of warm water and wiped her mouth before speaking. We have to walk for seven hours? In this heat? I can't do it. I literally cannot do that. You'll be fine, Skullduggery said, nodding to their left. We go that way. He started walking. Valkyrie followed. It's too hot. I'm being serious. My clothes are meant to cool me down in hot weather, but they're doing nothing. They'd cool you down on a hot summer's day in Ireland, Skullduggery said. The Sahara is quite another matter, I'm afraid. It was hard to walk in the sand. It sucked at her boots. Her lovely boots. Her lovely boots in which boiled her lovely feet. She was already sweating. She took off her jacket, tied the arms round her waist. The gauntlet made it awkward, but she managed. Skullduggery glanced back. You can't wear that, he said. She looked down at herself. Her pink T-shirt, the one Stephanie had bought. She resisted the urge to rip it off and burn it. Why not? It's pink. So? We're not in camouflage. I mean, it's pink and it's not armoured. You should put your jacket back on. We're going up against some very dangerous and unpredictable people. You were seven hours away from our current position. You're going to get sunburnt. She took a tube of sun cream from her pocket. Extra strength, she said. He shook his head and carried on. She followed, spreading the sun cream over her arms and shoulders, her face and neck and chest. Do my back, she called. Do your own back. I can't. Please. Do you know how hard it is to get sun cream off these gloves? No, she admitted truthfully. Do you? He stopped and sagged. She passed him the cream and turned. 
and he spread it brusquely over the back of her neck and down to her shoulder blades. She grinned as he handed the tube back to her. Thank you. He grunted, then put his hat on Valkyrie's head and moved off. Want to sing songs while we walk? she asked. God, no, he said. They'd been walking for hours, and the canteen had long since been emptied. Valkyrie licked her dry lips. She'd come with sunglasses and sun cream, but no water of her own. Pretty dumb for a smart girl. She applied more sun cream to her sizzling skin, having gone through most of the tube already. The fedora was hot on her head, but it did its part to keep her face in the shade, and for that she was grateful. Anything she could do to cool down was welcome beyond measure. If Skullduggery hadn't been here, she would have had no problem in abandoning her clothes altogether. What a sight that would make. She laughed. Skullduggery looked back. Everything okay? Not really. I think I may be delirious. He stopped and watched her as she walked up to him. You're burnt. She looked at her arms. No, I'm not. Take off the sunglasses. She dipped them lower on her nose and could suddenly see how red her skin was. Oh, bloody hell. Look at me. I'm a lobster. I told you to leave your jacket on. She glared. You think that now's the time to say things like that? Really, there is no time to say things like that, but especially now. This is going to hurt so much tonight, and all I get from you is, I told you so. Water. Give me water. I've taught you how to draw the moisture from the... I'm tired, and I'm cross, and I'm hot, and I'm sunburnt, and you have just committed an unforgivable sin, so you'd better give me water right this second. Well, he said, since you put it like that. He raised his hand, and the air started to shimmer and a small mist formed above her. She could feel the air currents against her skin, feel what he was doing, how he was manipulating the moisture around them. She tilted her head back, and the mist became droplets of water that fell into her open mouth. Oh, that's good, she said, her eyes closed. More. You want more? he said, walking away. You do it yourself. She stared after him in dismay. Oh, come on, just... You're never going to learn if I always do these things for you. I'm not going to be around forever, you know. You planning on leaving me? Not if I can help it, but things happen. Valkyrie sighed and trudged after him. She did her best to draw water from the air. She really did. At best, she could form a little pocket of drizzle, though, and the more she walked, the less she was able to concentrate. Finally, she couldn't stand it any more. Water, she said. Her mouth was so dry it hurt to speak. Skullduggery didn't look back. You need to do these things. Water or I'll die. I will die to spite you. He stopped, turned to her and sighed. Fine. And more, she said. This time more, lots. He plucked his hat from her head and raised both hands. Valkyrie took off her sunglasses, and once again she tilted her head back while a mist formed above her. It was a big mist this time, a serious mist. She felt the air currents twisting and turning with every gesture Skullduggery made as he dragged the moisture into droplets of water. A lot of droplets. And not droplets any more. Drops now. Proper-sized drops hanging there, bumping into each other, forming bigger drops, forming a puddle that rippled in midair, a big puddle, a serious puddle, a... The puddle collapsed and drenched her, and she squealed. She actually squealed and jumped to one side way too late to avoid it. She swallowed whatever water had landed in her mouth, almost choked in it with the outraged laughter that bubbled up from somewhere within and she stared at Skullduggery through strands of wet hair, and he just stood there, and she discovered just how smug a skull could look. I can't believe you did that, she said. You wanted more? You are so immature. And you're smiling for the first time in hours. She laughed again, put a hand to her face, and rubbed the water into her cheeks and forehead. 
It felt so good. Having wet hair felt so good. And yet even as she stood there, she could feel herself starting to dry. Could you do that again? she asked. My pleasure, he said. Once she'd had her fill of water, and once she'd topped up her canteen, they started walking again. Another hour and her stomach started to rumble. An hour after that, her energy left her. Skullduggery picked her up and carried her, and she drifted off in his arms. She didn't know how far he carried her, but she opened her eyes when that voice in her head said, Wakey, wakey. Before them, the desert shimmered in a heat haze like she had never seen. The shimmering air rose as tall as a skyscraper, but it was localized to the area directly in front of them. Skullduggery let her down, and Valkyrie stood on shaky legs. She untied the jacket from around her waist and put it on, hissing in pain as it slid over her skin. For her benefit, Skullduggery moved slowly down the dune, and she managed to follow without collapsing. They approached the heat haze, which didn't retract before them. Instead, it stayed in place, like a wall. Skullduggery tilted his head and made an amused sound. Then he took Valkyrie's hand, turned her slightly, and the heat haze parted and behind it she saw the pyramid. Chapter 58 The Brides of Blood Tears It took close to half an hour to climb the smooth stone steps to the first opening. Valkyrie lasted less than two minutes before her legs cramped, and she happily settled into Skullduggery's arms for the rest of the journey. When he finally set her down, she straightened, and it was like unspooling from a hot, humid swamp. Every part of her was sticky and covered in sweat. I feel gross, she said softly, holding her arms out from her sides. Oh my God, I need a shower. Skullduggery read the air. First we rescue Fletcher, then you can have a shower. How are you feeling aside from hot and burnt? She wanted to tell him she felt fine, that there was no need to worry about her. But lying about something like that would be dangerous to them both. I feel a little weak, she said. Then you stay behind me. If I tell you to run or hide, you do what I say. Going up against a witch is not like going up against a sorcerer. These people are much more dangerous. They moved in through the opening, and the sudden shade would have made Valkyrie smile were it not for the sunburn that kept her face as blank as possible. She pocketed her sunglasses. There were rooms to either side of them, no doors, containing shelves of clay pots of varying sizes. If we get separated, Skullduggery whispered, we meet up back here. She gave the slightest of murmurs and followed him to the heavy curtains at the end of the corridor. He pulled the curtains back, and a warm light chased the shade away. The center of the pyramid was a vast, hollowed-out cavern in which numerous plateaus had sprung, stretching from one side to the other. These plateaus were connected by a spider's web of rope bridges and ladders, stairs and slopes. Some plateaus were narrow, some were wide, some were solid, and some looked flimsy as paper. There were buildings on some of them, solid buildings of stone, but mostly the dwellings seemed to be tents and marquees of varying sizes. Valkyrie hunkered down beside Skullduggery, neither one speaking for the moment, and they watched the brides. Now she understood why Saracen had said there were worse people to be held captive by. Their hair was tied in a series of golden bands, and the lower half of their face was covered by a red veil. They wore skirts of silk, slit high to the waist, and a choly blouse, all in red, with their bellies exposed. The cape was red, too, although Valkyrie was pretty sure that it wouldn't be called a cape. Whatever it was, it was some kind of mix between silk and chiffon, and it was attached to the shoulders by small golden rings, and to each wrist by a golden bracelet. The cape rippled with every movement, no matter how slight. 
Another bracelet curled round the right upper arm, and their sandals had interlacing straps that looked way too complicated and annoying to be practical. Each bride had a curved dagger in a jeweled sheath on her hip. Wherever each bride went, a man followed. Wearing nothing but a plain white sarong around their waist, their heads were shaven and their bodies were muscled. The devoted kept their eyes down as they walked, each one exactly six steps behind the bride they followed. Not a bad system. Do the devoted have to do whatever the brides tell them? Valkyrie whispered. Skullduggery looked at her. Stop drooling. I wasn't. Stop it, she sighed. Fine. So where do you think they're keeping Fletcher? I don't know, Skullduggery said. From what I've read of the brides, their evenings and nights are for themselves. Everything gets shut down. Doors are locked, and off they go to do whatever it is they do in their spare time. That's our best shot at moving around. How? I don't have the cloaking sphere any more. We'll just have to do it the old-fashioned way, Skullduggery said. We'll have to sneak. That sounds hard. Nonsense. Sneaking is easy. You just have to be careful about where you... He stepped out from hiding and accidentally kicked a pebble that skittered along the ground and bounced off a pot with a nice loud ping. Me and my big articulate mouth, he muttered, as a bride looked up and saw them. The alarm went out. The brides shouting warnings to each other. Valkyrie started to stand. Stay down, he ordered. She stared at him. What are you going to do? Something inadvisable, he said, and ran forward. Valkyrie stayed where she was, tucked behind cover, listening to the shouts and the sounds of crackling energy and exploding rock. He was leading them away from her. He's leaving you alone. Keeping low. She moved back through the curtain, squinting at the rectangle of unforgiving light that would usher her outside. Where would she go? Where would she hide? She was weak, sunburnt, and probably had heat stroke or something. She wouldn't get far out there. She wouldn't get far in here, either. The thought of throwing a punch made her want to cry. Footsteps on the other side of the curtain made her dart into the room on her right. She pressed herself back against the wall, careful not to disturb the clay pots. Two voices, no, three, talking quickly. One of them spoke English. She didn't recognize either of the other two languages. One of the brides babbled urgently. Let me, said the bride who spoke English. More babbling than, we will. Valkyrie would have scowled if the pain hadn't stopped her. Just our luck that the only one we can understand is a lackey and not a boss. She peeked out. Two brides hurried into the sunshine and disappeared down the steps. Made sense. Their secret pyramid had been breached, after all. They needed to know if there was anyone else out there. The third bride, the one Valkyrie couldn't see, walked back towards the curtain, and Valkyrie coughed softly. The footsteps stopped. Valkyrie picked up one of the pots. She couldn't hear anything now, but it was highly unlikely that the bride was still standing in place. No, if the bride was anything like Valkyrie, she would already be sneaking to the doorway, ready to lunge in and catch the intruder unawares. The bride lunged into the room, and Valkyrie smashed the pot over her head, giving a muffled scream as her sunburn sent claws of stinging pain ripping through her. The bride stumbled to her knees, and Valkyrie stepped back and kicked her in the head. Ooh, that felt good. Valkyrie looked down at the unconscious bride while she waited for the pain to fade. An idea came to her and grew into a plan. It wasn't a very good plan, but it was a plan, and that's more than she had a moment ago. Valkyrie took off her clothes, folded them neatly, and put them on a shelf behind a pot and dressed herself in the bride's outfit. Not right, is it? Leaving these wonderful clothes here with all manner of dangers ahead. No, it wasn't right, especially given what she was now wearing. Red silk and a stupid veil and sandals she couldn't even do upright. 
You look great. You look like a homicidal belly dancer. She slipped the necromancer ring into a small pouch she found beside the knife, then shackled the bride's wrists, tied her feet, and used one of Valkyrie's own socks as a gag. She apologized about that one. Of course, the bride didn't hear it, but that was hardly the point. The only way this was going to work was if no one got too close to her. Then they wouldn't see the mess she'd made of the sandals, or how her hair wasn't bound right, or how, instead of a healthy tan like the others, her skin was glowing painfully red. Also, the brides walked with a sway that she didn't have, and they walked lightly, like they were each on individual clouds. Valkyrie was well aware of how she walked. She walked functionally. She was used to wearing trousers and boots. Trousers and boots that ghastly bespoke made. Doesn't seem right to abandon them like this. Taking a deep breath, Valkyrie left the room and walked through the curtains. The heat made her start to sweat again and made her sunburn sting like crazy. She walked for the nearest rope bridge. It was surprisingly steady. One of the devoted was ahead. She faltered, then straightened up, and walked swiftly by him. He didn't shout out, didn't raise the alarm. This was good. This was going to work. She glanced back. He was right behind her. She whirled, and he stopped. She waited for him to make a move. He didn't. He just stood there with his eyes down. She frowned, backed away, turned and walked on. He followed. She stopped again, and so did he. What do you want? she asked. If he recognized the difference in accents, he didn't react to it. But neither did he answer. She was about to stride off and leave him there when she saw a bride and another devoted walking closer. Cursing under her breath, she retraced her steps back to the rope bridge. The devoted came after her. Would you stop? she hissed. Just stop, all right? Stay! He stopped walking, and she hurried. Passed the rope bridge and kept walking until she came to a junction. She hid as another bride passed, a devoted walking behind her with his head down. Everywhere a bride walked, there was at least one devoted trailing in her wake. A bride walking around without a devoted will probably arouse suspicion. Valkyrie headed back to the rope bridge. He was still there. Hello, she said. Would you... I need to get to our prison cells, but I have forgotten, um, how to get there. Take me to them? The devoted bowed slightly but didn't move. Well, she pressed, let's go. He took a step backwards, bowing as he did so, and she understood. She walked by him, and he followed. When she got to the top of the slope, she hesitated, looked back, saw the angle of his shoulders, and moved right. It wasn't the fastest or most effective way to get where she needed to go, but it worked. In one narrow corridor they were forced to pass within arm's length of another bride. The bride nodded to her and she nodded back, and they each continued on. Valkyrie breathed out and relaxed. They walked until they came to a giant door. She looked at the devoted. This is it? He bowed a little deeper. It was locked. Of course it was locked. The day was over. Everything shut down when the day was over. There was no way she was getting through this tonight, not without bringing every bride down on top of her. I need to sleep, she said. He bowed, stood to one side, and she walked by him. Again, he directed her with the turn of his shoulders until they came to a wide plateau of tents and marquees. Doing her best to keep away from other brides, Valkyrie chose a tent on the outer edges. Get me food she said to the devoted. And water, please, if you don't mind. The devoted bowed and walked away, and Valkyrie stepped inside, letting the flap close behind her. The floor was covered in cushions, 
and she stepped over to the biggest one and sat. She wished she had her phone. She didn't even know what time it was. She tried to fix her hair back into the golden bands, but abandoned the task before she grew too annoyed. A few minutes later, there was movement outside her tent. Resisting the urge to come up in a crouch and prepare for trouble, Valkyrie lay back and feigned sleep. That wasn't easy with her sunburn. She listened to someone come in and cracked open an eye. A devoted laid a tray of food down on the small table. The lamplight flickered over his muscles and his bald head, but they all had muscles and bald heads. She waited until she saw his face, until she was sure he was her devoted, before she sat up. Thank you, she said. He said nothing. He went to the entrance and stood there, hands by his sides, head down like a statue. Valkyrie crawled over to the table, filled a goblet with water and lifted the veil to drink it down in one go. There were meats and grapes and fruit piled onto the tray, and she ate what she could and left the rest. She crawled back to the big cushion, piled a few on top of each other and lay against them, propped up. The curved dagger was digging into her thigh. The arm bracelet was digging into her bicep. Her hair was too loose, and her damn sandals had slipped down again. She was anxious. She was anxious and bored. She was anxious and bored and tired. But there was no way she could sleep. Not with the enemy all around. Not with Skullduggery held captive and... She woke. She couldn't have been sleeping for that long. She was still propped up on the cushions. She hadn't moved. The devoted had, though. He had laid out small jars of sweet-smelling oils on the ground before her, and beside them was a large pail of water. He stood behind the pail, a cloth in his hands. Eh, uh, said Valkyrie, what's going on? He didn't say anything. Of course he didn't. She sat up, almost cried out with the pain, and he quickly scooped up one of the jars and knelt by her. He dipped a finger in, then touched it lightly to her arm. That spot, the spot he'd touched, immediately cooled. It didn't even look as red any more. Well, she said to the devoted, aren't you full of surprises? Chapter 59 The Rise Morning came, and she led the devoted out of the tent. Her sunburn had become a tan overnight, and she could move without pain once again. At her instruction, the devoted had even fixed her hair into the golden bands and done up the sandals properly. She looked like a bride of blood tears now, and tried to give her hips that extra bit of sway to complete the transformation. She needn't have bothered. None of the other brides gave her anything more than a cursory glance as she walked back to the giant doors. They stood open. One of the devoted waited to one side, his head down. A sentry? Kill him. Snap his neck. Cut his throat. Valkyrie passed him warily. His eyes stayed downcast. Her own devoted stopped beside him. Obviously, they weren't allowed any further. That suited Valkyrie just fine. She gave one last admiring glance to the bald man with the big muscles and hurried on, following the tunnel round to another set of large doors. They stood slightly open, warm firelight seeping through the crack. She slowed and approached in silence. She heard voices and took a peek. A stone cavern lit by a single torch on the wall a bride with skin the colour of chocolate walked slowly round a circle of linked, asymmetrical shapes carved into the ground. Within the borders of those shapes, sigils had been etched. It looked to be an exact match to the necklace the bride wore. Valkyrie had seen that kind of thing before, and she knew that to break the necklace was to break the circle. Within the circle stood Valkyrie and Fletcher. Fletcher appeared unharmed, 
though skullduggery, seemed to have lost his hat. He loved that hat. Valkyrie slipped her necromancer ring onto her finger. She called in the shadows to mask her and crept through the doors, blending immediately into the gloom around the edges of the room. The bride was saying something about not getting comfortable. I honestly don't see us staying here for much longer, Skullduggery responded. Could I ask a question, though, before you continue on what I'm sure will be a delightful monologue? Caravari, the scamp, is making all sorts of threatening movements and what not. Does he still believe that Department X is responsible for the deaths of his people? You think I would know? the bride asked. You've been in contact with him, Ajuoga. We know you have. Maybe, Ajuoga said and laughed. She had a pretty laugh. Very well. Yes, we have been in contact with him, as you say. A most impressive man. When he left, he spoke with many people, inquiring about this mysterious mortal agency that had been killing his warlocks, as did we. But now it is plain. Department X is nothing but a rumour. How embarrassing for us all. And what are Cadaveri's plans now? I'm sorry. I do not understand. His plans are what they have always been. Find the ones responsible and make them pay. How will he do that? The warlocks are powerful, and Carivari is no simple-minded barbarian. Our true enemy tried to provoke us into attacking the mortals. Only sorcerers who hate mortals would do such a thing, and they are easy to find. And if he finds them? If? Oh, dear, no, you misunderstand. He has already found them. All this trouble emanated from your sanctuary, Mr. Pleasant. That is where the children of the spider have congregated, is it not? That is where the torment lived. We know of his involvement. The torment is dead, Fletcher said. But his brethren live, and they plot against us and our kind. Your sanctuary will fall, make no mistake. I have to say, however, we like what we hear about this accelerator. Is it truly as powerful as they say? That would be quite something. I am looking forward to that. You've joined with the warlocks, then, Skullduggery said. Of course. We are witches. They are warlocks. We practice true magic. Your kind despises us. I'm a living skeleton, said Skullduggery. I have no kind. Ajwoga sounded amused. Beneath her veil, she was surely smiling. A living skeleton indeed. We have all heard so many stories about you, Mr. Pleasant. Your legend permeates even here, where we care little for your sanctuaries or your petty squabbles. And yet, I must admit to feeling slightly underwhelmed. Subduing you was tragically simple. Have you ever heard of being lulled into a false sense of security? Skullduggery asked. Ajoga opened her arms. Then where is the surprise attack? Where are your reinforcements? I'm not sure, Skullduggery admitted. They're probably lulling you into a false sense of security, too. I'm not sure it works if everyone is lulling, to be honest. Then there's no one left to do anything. We may have to work on our strategy for the future. The future? Ajuoga echoed. Maybe you would have a future if you had been captured by the maidens of the New Dawn or the crones of the Cold Embrace, although I doubt it. But you are among the brides of blood tears.
the most fearsome of all witches, and you, detective, don't have much of a future to worry about. Valkyrie crouched slightly. A Juogu was nearing. I see, said Skullduggery. And what do you want with young Mr. Wren here, may I ask? He's a teleporter, said Ajuoga. He's a natural. We want his blood. I don't think so, snarled Fletcher. We want his genes. That one's a bit more vague. We want him to breed with us. I reckon I'll be okay here on my own. Fletcher said to Skullduggery. Skullduggery ignored him. And when you're done breeding with him, what will you do then? Kill him? We'll never be done breeding with him. I'll hold him off, Fletcher said. You save yourself. I'm not leaving you here, Fletcher. Ah, go on. Valkyrie burst from the shadows. But Ajuoga spun and her hand flashed, and Valkyrie ducked and stumbled as the wall behind her exploded in shards of rock. She threw a fistful of shadows as a distraction, and then went low, her shoulder slamming into Ajuoga's stomach while she grabbed the back of her legs. She tried to lift, but the woman was already shooting her legs back, adjusting her balance. This one could be trouble. An elbow dropped sharply between Valkyrie's shoulder blades, and she barely turned her head fast enough to avoid taking the knee square in the face. Stars burst behind her eyes. A Juoga moved round her, an arm encircling her throat, hauling her up straight. This one knows what she's doing. This one has experience. Before the choke could come on, Valkyrie turned and slammed an elbow into her nose. A Juoga released her the red veil already darkening as blood soaked the material. Valkyrie snapped her palm straight, and the air rippled, and Ajuog went tumbling head over heels. Finish her, Skullduggery said from inside the circle. Don't give her time to... But Ajuog had already recovered. Her hand flashed white, and Valkyrie threw herself sideways. The energy stream sizzled past her bare skin. Shadows crashed into Ajuoga's back, making the second shot go wide. But now the curved dagger was in the woman's hand and slashing across Valkyrie's arm. Blood flew. Fletcher yelled out frantic warnings as the dagger slashed again, and Valkyrie jerked back and Ajuoga came forward, slashing and drawing more blood. Don't retreat, Skullduggery instructed calmly, as if they were in practice, as if she wasn't fighting for her life. Every step backwards you take gives her more room to work. Meet her. Getting close. Guard, Valkyrie. Where's your guard? Valkyrie held her arms in front, turned her palms facing in. Ajuoga circled her. Valkyrie dropped her guard slightly, giving her a gap, and Ajuoga saw it and slashed, and Valkyrie sprang into her. Good girl, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie blocked and grabbed the knife arm in one movement held it tight to her side while she threw palm shots at Ajuoga's face. The veil tore away. Beneath it, Ajuoga was bloody but beautiful. Valkyrie stepped into her, hip to hip, and flipped her in an old-fashioned judo throw. Ajuoga spun in a whirl of cape and dress and crunched to the ground, the dagger dropping. Valkyrie lost her balance, stumbled over her, Ajuoga pulling her down. They clawed and raked and punched and snarled and hissed and bit. Valkyrie got on top, but Ajuoga's legs flashed up, trapping Valkyrie's head and one arm between her thighs. Triangle choke. Valkyrie could put it on, but she had no idea how to get out of it. She clicked her fingers, tried summoning a flame, but Ajuoga arched her back, lifted her hips off the ground, tightening the squeeze. Valkyrie's own arm pressed against her throat, cutting off the blood supply to the brain. Her eyes bulged. Let me out, and I'll help. Fletcher was shouting curses, and Skullduggery was issuing instructions, but she couldn't hear either of them. Her head was fuzzy. Tears blurred her vision. Her face was red. She knew her face was red. She probably looked ridiculous. She hated it when her face got red. Fletcher, 
still shouting curses, Skullduggery still issuing instructions. She was making that noise. The noise people make when the triangle choke is put on. Like a gurgle, spittle dripped from her lips. Not very attractive. She was going to pass out. She couldn't get out of this, and she couldn't use magic. Let me help. Let me take over. Skullduggery. What was he saying? What was that he was saying? Beyond the roar in her head, she heard, Valkyrie, you still have your own dagger. Oh, yeah. She reached down with her free hand, rapidly numbing fingers pulling the dagger from its sheath, and with all that remained of her strength, she drove it up into Ajuoga's right buttock. Ajuoga shrieked, and Valkyrie was kicked sideways, and she rolled, gasping, while Ajuoga contorted on the floor beside her. With slowly clearing vision, she watched Ajuoga yank the dagger from her cheek and hurl it away. Then she turned to Valkyrie with murder in her eyes. Uh-oh! Ajuoga threw herself at Valkyrie, bloodied hands curling round her throat, cursing at her in some exotic language. Kill her! Valkyrie hammered at those hands, but they wouldn't budge. She hooked her fingers, dug her nails deep into Ajuoga's face, and ripped downwards, leaving bloody furrows in her wake. Ajuoga recoiled, and Valkyrie threw her off. Tried to get up, but Ajuoga jumped on her back. Kill her! Valkyrie stood. Bent forward, tried to shake her loose. She closed her eyes to avoid losing one of them. Ajuoga pulled her hair and bit her ear, and Valkyrie screamed. She twisted, and Ajuoga hit the ground and scrambled up, blood running from her mouth. Valkyrie backed up, horrified, one hand pressed to the side of her head. Kill her! Ajuoga ran at her, and all Valkyrie wanted to do was keep her off. That's all she wanted to do, just stop her. Just stop her and end the fight. Just push at the air hard enough so that she flies back and knocks herself out on the wall. Just push at the air. Ajuoga jumped, and Valkyrie sent a spear of shadows slicing through her. She hung there, Ajuoga, held off the ground by the shadow, hands at her side, legs not kicking, head down, peaceful and dead. Valkyrie looked up at her. She looked at the shadow, saw how it had gone all the way through, saw how sharp it was. Her eyes flickered, following it as it gently turned and twisted through the gloom, following it all the way back down to the black ring on her finger. Wait, no, that wasn't right. She'd pushed at the air. Ajuoga had run at her and jumped, and Valkyrie had pushed at the air. No, you didn't. She'd pushed at the air because that's what she did. She'd needed to keep Ajuoga away from her, so that's what she did. She'd used elemental magic because that's what Skullduggery had taught her. You killed her. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said, speaking quietly. Hmm? Valkyrie, look at me. She looked at him. Put her down, Valkyrie. She nodded, and the shadow laid Ajuoga on the ground next to the circle, and then it sank back into the darkness of the room, like it was never there. Murderer! Fletcher's eyes were wide. He said nothing. Skullduggery was looking at her. He stood perfectly still. His head was perfectly straight. Valkyrie, he said. He liked using her name. I need you to break her necklace now. Can you do that? Break her necklace and we can get out of here. Come on now. We don't have much time. Someone will have heard. They'll be coming. Kill her? She walked over to the woman. That you killed? And looked down at her. Despite the blood, she was beautiful. Valkyrie. I can hear them, said Skullduggery. They're coming. Break the necklace. Valkyrie. Valkyrie. 
Look out! Fletcher cried. She turned, and the bride came through the door with her hand already lighting up. Chapter 60 One Little Word I think we should talk. It's okay. You keep doing what you're doing. I'll say what needs to be said. Don't let me distract you. Hit her again, though. You need to hit her again. Okay? Good. I think he broke her jaw. Nice one. Skullduggery. I have to help Skullduggery and Fletcher. They're fine. Skullduggery's managed to snag Ajuoga's cape. Look at him. He's pulling her into the circle. He'll break the necklace and they'll be free. We don't have to worry about them. We have to get you out of here. Let's run. Go on. Run. Good girl. I know things haven't worked out the way you wanted them when all this began. You wanted fun and adventure and all these exciting things. Of course you did. That's nothing to be... Duck! Now throw a shadow at her. Throw a... Ooh, nice! Now where was I? Nothing to be ashamed about. Yes, thank you. Wanting a life less ordinary is a perfectly natural wish to make. Everyone makes it. The only difference is, for you, it came true. You're the lucky one. I should have stayed where I was. What do you mean? Back in the room with Skullduggery, or... I should have stayed normal. I'm sorry now I pestered him to take me along. No, you're not. You can fool most people, but you can't fool me. I know you've missed your parents, and I know you regret not seeing your sister's first steps with your own eyes. But sacrifices had to be made. You made them in exchange for the extraordinary. And you're not sorry you did it. Not one bit. Take this left. The way's blocked. They're only devoted. They won't be able to stop you. I can't hurt them. Of course you can. I don't want to. What am I going to do with you? Just push them aside. Use the air. See how easy that was? Keep running now. The brides have seen me. Of course they have. And they're gaining. They're quite fast for belly dancers, aren't they? They probably hate being called that. Shout it back to them. See what they say. No. I swear, Valkyrie, you are no fun anymore. Better duck. Whoa. That was a close one. You realize, of course, that if one of those energy streams hits you in the head, we're both toast, right? I'm not going to have time to swoop in and save the day. Maybe you should throw a fireball or two just to distract them. That's it. Just click and throw. Huh. I never noticed before you have terrible aim. I wasn't trying to hit them. In that case, you've succeeded admirably. Just wanted to slow them down. Sure. Hey, did you know that you're missing the top of your ear? She bit it off. That cow. That horrible, horrible cow. I wish you'd done worse to her now. I wish you'd made her suffer. There's someone up ahead. Did you hear me? There's someone up... Oh, this is brilliant. Oh, this... Is just great. Rolling around on a cave floor with another psychotic belly dancer is exactly what you want to be doing right now. We should have sold tickets for this. If you want, I could help. Just step aside and I'll... No! Your choice, of course. These skirts don't exactly allow you to keep much of your dignity, do they? Better hurry up. The others are almost here. You have your arm. Break it. All you have to do is break it, and you can get up and keep running. Stop trying to look for another way to finish this, and just break her damn... Youch! She's a screamer, isn't she? You never can tell, I suppose. Okay, back on your feet. The thing is, Valkyrie, you didn't ask for this. I know you didn't. Wanting a life of adventure is one thing. Wanting a life where the fate of the world rests on your shoulders is something else entirely. Run in here. Hide. Hold your breath. Hold it or they'll hear you. Hold it. Are they gone? 
Take a peek. Are they gone? They're gone. See that ledge up there? Use the air. Whee! Okay. I'm pretty sure I know the way out from here. Proceed with caution, though. I'll fill this awkward silence with words of great wisdom and passable wit. You never asked for the burdens you've been given. At the start, you were a victim of your own bloodline. And by the time that passed, you were already in too deep. You developed a taste for the life these sorcerers led, and you were proving yourself again and again. Much was asked of you, and you stepped up, Valkyrie. You understood that with great power comes great responsibility. That's from Spider-Man. What? It's what Uncle Ben said to Peter Parker. No, it's not. I made that up right here. We just have to go down this little tunnel here, and then we should see daylight. We should have waited for Skullduggery. He'll be fine. He's probably already waiting for us at the car. Then we can drive away, and... You're slowing down. Why are you slowing down? Are you crying? I can't do this any more. You don't have to. Valkyrie, you've been through so much, too much. The reflection has taken over your life. You've been tortured. You've lost your uncle and your cousin. You lost Ken Speckle Grouse. You lost Tanith to that remnant. And now you've lost Ghastly. One by one, they're snatched away from you. You can't be expected to keep going through all that. You've risked everything to save the world again and again, only to wake up one night and realize that you're the one who's going to end it. You're going to end it. Not me. You. I am you. No. You're twisted and evil and wrong. That's hardly a healthy attitude to take to your own psyche. I'm part of you. When you let me take over, you don't go away, do you? You're still there. Everything I've done and every life I've taken, you were there. You remember it all. You tell yourself that I'm the wicked one and you don't have any choice in the matter. That's how you sleep at night. But it gets to you. Of course it does. You have so much blood on your hands. Walking quickly won't change that. Wherever you go, you take me with you, remember? You kill people, not me. You've forgotten Caelan already, have you? I didn't kill Caelan, the salt water did. And who pushed him in? Who held him under? He was going to kill Fletcher. He was going to kill me. I had to do it. I agree. But let's not pretend. His death is on your hands. But, of course, he was a vampire, wasn't he? He was a thing, a monster. It's easy to justify killing a monster. Easier to ignore, too. But Ajuoga wasn't a vampire. She wanted to kill me. So you killed her first. It was an accident. I didn't mean to. Valkyrie, please. I'm inside your head. You wanted the fight to end. Your conscious mind, the civilized part of you, wanted to use elemental magic to keep her away. But what did you actually do? You used necromancy, a discipline Skullduggery has warned you against so many times in the past. Why has he warned you? Because it's easy. Exactly. Because it's easy. Because it obeys your more primal nature. Necromancy isn't civilized. It's power. It's easy power. And you embraced it because you like easy power. Power that doesn't take years to master. I still didn't mean to kill her. It wasn't about killing her. You just wanted to end the fight. So you ended it. You chose the simplest, most direct option. The easy option. As usual. What are you doing? Ajuoga? A beautiful name, isn't it? She's the first Ajuoga you've ever met. The only Ajuoga you've ever known. And you killed her? 
What are you trying to do? Keep going. We're almost there. Are you trying to make me let you take over? Of course. I won't do it. I can't. You can and you will. You're about to. You're ready to give up. You want all this to be over, don't you? So choose the easy option. You know you want to. You'll kill too many people. You'll kill my family. Our family? And I have no intention of killing our family. You've already seen how Cassandra's visions can change. You saw Ghastly kiss Tanith. That's not going to happen anymore, is it? Because the future was changed. And it can change again. I might not destroy the world. I might have a change of heart. No. Leave me alone. Leave me. Oh, dear. Ooh. Now I remember. Yes. We should have taken a right where we took a left. If we had taken a right, that would have brought us to the surface. Instead, they're everywhere. They look mad. I have to get out of here. I have to... And they're blocking the way back. Between you and me, these are some angry-looking belly dancers. I don't think I've ever seen belly dancers look as angry as this. You led me here. You led me into a trap. That's a terrible thing to say. It's quite true, but terrible. Watch out. I see a hand lighting up. If I were you, I'd... Too late. That... Okay, that is gross. That was one of my favourite legs. Could you stop screaming, please? Could you pay attention? They're closing in. Another hand is lighting up. Valkyrie, stop screaming and look. Wow, that was a good shot. I know, I know we no longer have a left arm below the elbow. But did you see that shot? Textbook. Help! Sorry? What was that? I couldn't hear you over the sound of your own screaming. Help me! Sure. Let me take over. Heal me! I will, absolutely. I'll reattach that leg and regrow that arm, and I'll even regrow the chunk of ear that cow bit off. Just step aside and let me at the controls. For a moment. Just for a moment. No, no. I'm sorry, Valkyrie. You can't just use me when you want to and then push me aside. Not any more. My time has come. Our time has come. And there goes the other arm. These belly dancers are a sadistic lot, aren't they? The pain is pretty bad. I have to agree. Let me shut it off. I can do it. You know I can. You like it when I do that. You love being me. Admit it. Please, just say the word. Let me come in and take over. For good, this time. No more sharing. Not any more. We're way past that now. This is what you want, Valkyrie. Deep down in your twisted little heart. Just say the word and I can make all your pain and doubt go away. I can erase your confusion and regret. You'll never have to be afraid again. Just say the word. One little word. Yes. Good girl. Good girl. Now watch these witches burn. Chapter 61 The Real Girl Stephanie was working her way through a book, The Stand, by Stephen King when Fletcher teleported into her room. She shrieked and bounced off her bed and stumbled against her desk, the book falling to the ground with a thud. Eyes wide, she stared at him. He had an armful of black clothes, with a pair of boots, a gauntlet, and a stick on top. Valkyrie stick. She's gone, he said in a hollow voice. Stephanie frowned. Valkyrie? She's... Fletcher gave a little laugh. What am I doing, tiptoeing around it? You know she's dark as... Of course you do. Well, now she's dark as full time. Stephanie straightened up. What happened? A lot of stuff. She was captured. Did you know that? She had a psychic poking around in her head. 
and then she and Skullduggery came looking for me and it all went wrong. She was surrounded. She was going to be killed. We went after her, but you should have seen it. There must have been a hundred of them, and she... She killed them all. The amount of blood. But she might recover, Stephanie said. Fletcher shook his head. Skullduggery said that Darkus had slipped out a few times before, but it was never for more than a few minutes. But she's been Darkus now for two days. No one knows where she is. No one knows what she's going to do. How did the others take it? What? You mean the news that Valkyrie's the one they should have been fighting all along? They don't know yet. He hasn't told them. He's going to tell them today. Does he know you're here? Skullduggery? No. Why should he? I just thought you needed to know. If you see her, call me, okay? Okay. You brought back her clothes? Yeah. That was nice of you. She took them from him, and he sat on the bed. I didn't know what else to do. Skullduggery's just gone really quiet, and I don't have anyone else to talk to. I mean, I just found out yesterday that Ghastly was dead. Oh, God. Fletch, I'm sorry. I'm never sure that he ever liked me, but he talked to me, you know. He always had time to talk. And I'm sorry about Myra as well. Ah, oh, yes. Myra. The girlfriend who tried to kill me. I suppose I should be flattered, actually, that she went to the trouble of starting a fire in her dorm, hoping that I'd teleport in and save the day. That shows dedication, right? That shows commitment. Not to me or to the relationship, but to her career as a hired killer. You've got to admire that. But what a track record, eh? You cheat on me. The next girlfriend tries to kill me. I didn't cheat on you. He blinked at her. Hm? Oh, I know that. Did I say that? Oh, God, I, I did. Sorry. How about you call me Stephanie? She said gently. It might make a difference if you know I have a name. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, Stephanie. I didn't mean you. That's quite all right, Fletcher. So, what's the plan now? What's the next move? The plan is to teleport into Rawhaven and shut off the accelerator, then take down Ravel and find some way to beat Mantis's army and then the warlocks who are on the way. Easy, right? It's just that Skullduggery's going to tell the others that Valkyrie is darkest. I don't know how they're going to take that, or the fact that he kept it from them for all this time. Gordon will be there too. How's he going to react? He already knows. You're meeting at his house? We were over at Finbar's place, but we have to switch. You know, for security reasons. Stephanie, what will Darkus do? I mean, what does she want? I don't know. All the psychics say she'll destroy the world and kill everyone. But Valkyrie wouldn't do that. She sat beside him and held his hand. When she's Darkus, she's different, Fletch. To her, it's not about who she hurts or who she kills. It's about the feeling she gets when she does it. It makes her happy. Happy? In a way. It's kind of freeing not to be held back by laws or rules or conscience. But she loves her family. She'd never do anything to hurt her family. Fletcher, I can't think like Darkess. I can only think like Valkyrie. And you're right. Valkyrie would never hurt her family, just like I never would. But Darkus is different. She'll find a way to beat it. Valkyrie will. She's strong. She won't let herself hurt anyone she loves. Stephanie turned to him fully. Valkyrie's confused. She's always been confused. She has all these conflicting thoughts and feelings... I'm afraid she mightn't know what she's doing. Fletcher raised his eyes to hers. Did she ever love me? Stephanie hesitated. She wanted to lie. She wanted to make him feel better. But she couldn't. No, she said. But she cared about you. She still does. Like she didn't love me. 
I'm sorry. His eyes grew colder. What about the vampire? Did she love him? No. She barely liked him. Then why was she with him? Because she's confused. She thought she wanted someone dangerous. What did they... Oh, Fletcher, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to torture yourself? You're an amazing guy. You should be with someone who sees that. You should be with someone who appreciates you and... and your cool hair. That raised a smile, and she gave him a smile of her own, and then she leaned in and kissed him. For a moment, he froze, and then he kissed her back. His left hand went to her face, his thumb stroking her cheek. Gently, he broke off the kiss. You're not real. Of course I'm real, she said. She kissed him quickly. You felt that, didn't you? She kissed him again. And you felt that, right? Valkyrie may not have loved you, she whispered. But I can. When Fletcher was gone, Stephanie went downstairs and changed Alice's nappy, then picked up her little sister and smothered her with kisses. Alice laughed so hard she made Stephanie laugh, and just when the laughter was subsiding, Stephanie blew a giant raspberry on Alice's neck that set her off again. Then Mum walked in, smiling. Mummy, Alice said, delighted. It's Mummy! Stephanie passed her over. You'd swear she hadn't seen you in days. Oh, she's a drama queen, her mum said, as Alice wrapped her little arms round her neck. Were you on the phone just now? I could have sworn I heard two voices coming from upstairs. Radio, said Stephanie. Oh, listen, I was thinking I might head over to Gordon's for a few days. The smile faded on her mother's face. When? Stephanie shrugged. Now, actually. Do you think that's wise? The last time you were alone in a house, we were burgled and you were attacked by a crazy girl. And that's the second time you've been attacked in this house. But I've never been attacked in Gordon's house, she said. And technically, that was true. Steph, I don't know if I like the idea of you being alone. Stephanie smiled. So what should I do? Develop a phobia about it? Mum, I'll be fine. I just want to spend a few days by myself, reading books and, you know, thinking about what I'm going to do with my life and stuff. And stuff, eh? Have you had any more thoughts on that? Some thoughts, said Stephanie. No decisions. Not yet. I just need to clear my head. Her mum took a moment. Okay, but you call every hour to let me know if you're okay. Maybe not every hour, but close enough. I'll do my best. I'm just going to change and grab my bag and then I'll be gone. Love you. Love you back, said her mum. And they hugged and Stephanie kissed Alice and then she climbed the stairs to her room. All she'd ever cared about was her family. All she'd ever wanted was to live the life of a normal girl. And now that Valkyrie was gone, all of Stephanie's dreams were coming true. It should have been perfect. She could now spend time with her parents and her sister while Skullduggery and the others fought their magical wars and dealt with Darkus. Only she couldn't let other people fight for her. That's not who she was. She had to do something. She had to help. Darkus was as much her problem as anyone's. And what if Skullduggery faltered? What if he couldn't bring himself to deliver the killing blow if the opportunity presented itself? Then Darkus would more than likely kill him. And who'd be next? Everyone? Stephanie got changed into Valkyrie's black clothes and took the scepter from its hiding place, placing it and Valkyrie's stick into a bag already half filled with fresh underwear and T-shirts. She took her phone, transferred some money into her pockets, and grabbed her bag. Then she got into the Oompa Loompa and drove to Gordon's. She used the back road the hidden road, approaching the house from the rear, and stopped the car before anyone had a chance to hear the engine. Slinging her bag over her shoulder, she jogged up to the utility door, used her key to open it, and slipped inside. Immediately, she heard raised voices. What the hell were you thinking? Vex was saying, almost shouting. 
the biggest threat the world has ever seen, and you had a chance to do something about it, and you didn't? Skullduggery's response was too low-key to travel, but Vex's came through clear as day. Paul! You didn't do what needed to be done because you're too close to her. You couldn't bring yourself to do it, and now look, look what's happened. Valkyrie's gone, Darkus is free. She's out there, and that's your fault. Stephanie crept out of the utility room, went to the library, and took down a set of encyclopedias. She slid open the hidden hatch and peered into the living room. Skullduggery was standing in the middle of the room. He wasn't wearing a hat. Vex and Saracen and the monster hunters were on their feet, facing him. Fletcher was against the far wall, and Sanguine was standing next to Tanith, who was the only one seated. Gordon came into view, his head down, his face creased with worry. "'What do we do?' he asked. "'How do we get her back?' "'This is her worst nightmare. This is the one thing she was terrified of.' Vex glared at him. "'You knew about this?' Of course I knew, Gordon snapped. I'm her uncle. I don't care if I'm not the real Gordon. I'm real enough to love my niece. Vex shook his head. Anyone else know about this little secret? Tanith raised her hand. Me? Sanguine stared at her in surprise. You knew? Why didn't you tell me? It seems to me that this is information that could be shared with someone you're gonna marry. Please don't remind us of that said Saracen. It really creeps us out. Vex looked back at Skullduggery. We went looking for the god killers to stop, Darkess. We risked our lives. And if you had told me what you had planned, said Skullduggery, I would have talked you out of it. Vex went to the nearest chair and sat in it heavily. He sighed. There was a time when you wouldn't have hesitated to kill her. Yeah, said Saracen. You really picked a great time to soften up on us. She can still be saved, Skullduggery said. How? Donegan asked. I just need to talk to her. If I talk to her, I can calm her down. I can bring Valkyrie back. You don't have to worry. I've done it before. How do you know she won't just kill you before you have a chance? Because Darkus likes to play games. That's what you have to understand about her. In her own way... She's an innocent. Every time she emerges, she discovers something new about herself, something more she can do. She'll pull your arms and legs off, but there won't be anything malicious behind it. She just wants to find out how easy it is. Yeah, said Gracious. That really sounds like we shouldn't worry. I trusted Valkyrie before, Skullduggery said. I trust her now. Vex looked at him. You really think you can reach her? I just need to get close enough to talk. I hope you know what you're doing. Skullduggery tilted his head. Me too. See? Tanith said to Sanguine. Now you take everything they said, and you pretend we said it, and you won't be so mad at me any more. Sanguine looked unimpressed. That ain't how this works. Excuse me for a moment, Saracen said, walking out of the room. Says so that it? Donegan asked. Are we finished arguing about this now? Because we still have to figure out what we're going to do about Rawhaven. We intercepted the convoy. We've locked those shield experts away where no one can find them. So now the way is clear, right? Now that we have Fletcher back, we can just teleport in. Anything else we should take into consideration? Things have been happening quickly over the last two days, Skullduggery said. Mantis still takes his orders from what remains of the original Supreme Council. But at the rate those original members are falling, those orders could stop coming at any moment. Maybe Mantis will give up and go home and the war will be over, said Fletcher. Maybe, said Skullduggery. But Mantis isn't our primary concern. The warlocks are. Once Caravari is dealt with and the engineer has shut down the accelerator... We can start looking for other people to hit, Erskine Ravel being number one on our list. There was a click behind Stephanie, and she froze, and a soft voice said, Turn around. She turned, slowly. Saracen stood there. 
finger on the trigger of the gun pointed at her head. Apparently you can heal gunshot wounds to the head. If you make any sudden moves, I'm going to let you prove it. She swallowed. I'm not Darkus. If you're Valkyrie, why are you spying on us? I'm not Valkyrie either. I'm Stephanie. I'm her reflection. You're not a reflection. I am, I swear. Saracen frowned, and the gun dipped. Good God. You look like any reflection I've ever seen. You're practically human. I am human, she said. I'm Stephanie. He looked at her for another moment, then motioned to her. Taking a deep breath, she closed the hatch and followed him. He walked into the living room first, but she faltered just outside the doorway. We have a guest, she heard him say. And before any of you overreact, you need to know that even though it looks like the real thing, even to us, this is actually Valkyrie's reflection. It calls itself Stephanie. Stephanie walked in. Fletcher looked surprised to see her, but Vex and the monster hunters looked astonished. They came over immediately, peering at her, stopping just short of prodding her. Behind them, Tanith and Sanguine stood watching, and Gordon frowned in puzzlement. Step away from it, Skullduggery said. Vex and Saracen went one way, Gracious and Donegan the other. Stephanie looked at Skullduggery, and she felt afraid. I'm not an is, she managed to say. You're wearing her clothes, said Skullduggery. Just more things for you to steal. You got what you wanted, though. You made her run from her mother. You took her life and her family. So why are you here? What was that? asked Fletcher. Fowl ran from a mum. It tried to kill her, Skullduggery said. And now Fletcher was looking at her like she was some kind of thing, some kind of inhuman creature. There was something else in his eyes, too. A kind of hurt. I can explain, she said. But they were already starting to ignore her words. How did it get to this? Vex asked. Leaving aside the homicidal tendencies for a moment, how did it get so real? This is fascinating, said Gracious. Did you alter the conjuring sigil? I always thought the sigil could be improved. But who has the time to focus on reflections? But this one, oh, it's magnificent. I'm not an it, Stephanie said sharply. I'm a her. I'm a person. My name is Stephanie Edgley. My parents are Melissa and Desmond Edgley, and my sister is Alice. I live in Haggard in County Dublin. And you murdered Valkyrie Kane's cousin, Skullduggery said. Stephanie went quiet. Fletcher collapsed into a chair. I did what I had to do, Stephanie said, her voice brittle. The only things I care about in this world are my parents and my sister. I care about them because my whole purpose was to pretend to be Valkyrie and pretend to care about her family. Only it stopped being an act. I stopped pretending, and I started caring. I love them. I'd do anything to protect them. That's why I'm here. You're going to need all the help you can get to stop Darkus. Skullduggery tilted his head. You think you're coming with us? You think you can take Valkyrie's place? We're the same person. You're a thing who murdered Valkyrie's cousin. And she's a thing who will murder the world, Stephanie said, anger biting into her voice. Skullduggery, you don't want to hear it. I know you don't. But I am her. I don't have her magic, but I have everything else she had. And I have the scepter. The scepter of the ancients? Tanith asked. That was destroyed said Donegan. Wasn't that destroyed? Didn't I read that somewhere? This is the scepter from the alternate reality, Stephanie said. The one Mevolent rules. It's bonded to me. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we're kind of lacking a few god-killer weapons right now, aren't we? When Darkus turns up, I'll be the only one able to stop her. Or we could kill you here and now, said Skullduggery, and take the scepter off your hands. You won't kill me. You're so sure? You won't kill. Skullduggery took his gun from his holster, and Stephanie's mouth went dry. 
He thumbed back the hammer and aimed right between her eyes. Skullduggery, said Vex. Just hold on a second. It's not Valkyrie, Skullduggery said. It's not a real person. Saracen took a small step forward. You just can't shoot her. It's not a her. I think we should all calm down for a moment, said Gordon. Please don't kill me, Stephanie said quietly. Fletcher appeared between them. Stop. Skullduggery's voice was cold. Get out of my way. But Fletcher held his ground. What if Val doesn't come back? You're going to let her folks think she just ran away or something horrible happened to her? The whole point of having a reflection in the first place was to step in when Valkyrie wasn't around. Killing Stephanie wouldn't be about justice or making the world a better place. It would be about you and your anger, that's all. Valkyrie would want us to think of her parents and Alice at a time like this. You know she would. Tanith brushed by Skullduggery and gestured at Fletcher to step aside. Move it, hairdo. I'll sort this out. She looked Stephanie up and down. Look at you. You're a marvel as what you are. Not something to behold. And I'm not like these guys. I know what you mean when you say you are Stephanie. Of course you are. I happen to be very discerning when it comes to friends. And you? You are someone I could see myself being friends with. But the real question here, Stephanie, is not are you a person or are you can be trusted. No, the real question is... Tanith's sword flashed from its scabbard and Stephanie barely had time to flinch before Skullduggery came crashing into them both. Stephanie hit the ground, tangled beneath all those arms and legs. The sword came to a rest on the carpet beside her. Saracen went to snatch it up when Sanguine hit him, sent him spinning. Hands grabbed her, dragged her out from the scuffle. Fletcher pulling her to her feet, and then in a heartbeat they were in a quiet apartment, and it was dark outside. Thanks, said Stephanie. Fletcher said nothing. Without turning on any lights, he moved to the other rooms, checking them. He came back, and she felt an irrational need to fill the silence between them. I shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, she said. Tanith was only part of the group to make sure Valkyrie stayed safe until Darkus could emerge. Now that Darkus is out, Tanith can go back to being the enemy. And, since I have the scepter, and the biggest threat to Darkus, stands to reason she tried to kill me. Fletcher murmured something. She looked around. Are we in Australia? Is this your place? Yeah, he said. Well, it was. Don't know why I chose to come here. Maybe you still think of it as home. That'd be pretty messed up of me then, wouldn't it? So which one did you kill? Carol or Crystal? Stephanie looked away. Carol, does Crystal know what happened? They don't know anything's different. Carol's reflection took over from her. I made sure. Well, aren't you nice? I... I wish I could say that I didn't want to have to kill her. But honestly, at the time I didn't see it as being wrong. I mean, I knew it was a terrible thing to do, but I didn't feel one way or the other about it. And now you do? Yes. Why? Because you're suddenly so close to being human. Well, isn't that convenient? Just when we find out about it, you start to feel guilt. You poor thing. Fletch. You know what? I believe you when you say you're not an it. I believe you when you say you're a person. Thank you. No problem. And as a person, I really don't like you. Yeah? She said. He vanished. She stayed where she was, and a moment later he returned, took hold of her arm, and then they were back in Gordon's living room. A small section of floor was cracked, and Gracious was in the process of pulling a rug over it. Skullduggery looked at her. Tanath and Sanguine have decided to spend some time away from us. You're not going to be safe at home, so you're coming to Roarhaven with us. You have the scepter with you? It's in her bag, said Saracen. Then we can leave immediately, Skullduggery said. Fletcher, 
What is the remotest part of the sanctuary you've been to that's near the accelerator room? Probably one of the bathrooms, Fletcher said. There's one on the third level down that's full of leaky pipes. It's pretty horrible and it's always cold. Sounds perfect, said Skullduggery, and his gun floated into his hand. Chapter 62 Roarhaven Revealed They teleported into the bathroom. It was dark and smelled bad. Skullduggery held up his left hand, reading the air. Then he moved to the door and peeked out. Stephanie sneaked out after him with the others. They got to the corner, and Skullduggery went ahead. Stephanie heard a strangled cry and then silence. Moments later, she was stepping over the unconscious form of a Roarhaven mage into the accelerator room. Skullduggery was already talking to the engineer. Who are you loyal to? he asked. I am loyal to myself, said the engineer, and to the accelerator. Not to Orsk and Ravel. It is not possible for me to have loyalty to people, organizations, doctrines, or beliefs. Has the accelerator been used recently? Vex asked. It has not been used for six months, one week, and two days. That's when it was used to boost Katana's power, Stephanie said. Skullduggery turned his head to her, and she did her best to ignore him and keep her eyes on the engineer. So there are no super sorcerers running around, said Saracen. Okay, that's a good start. Engineer, we'd like you to deactivate the accelerator now, please, before anyone can use it. Very well, said the engineer. It will take me fourteen days to initialize proceedings. Fourteen days, Fletcher said, staring. We need it to shut down now. I am afraid that will not be possible. But the warlocks are on their way. If you do not want them to use the accelerator before it is deactivated, the engineer said, you will have to hold them off for the next three hundred and forty-three hours and eight minutes. Great, Vex muttered. Well, that's that. Nothing we can do here. Let's refocus on Ravel and get this done. Saracen led the way to the stairs, then up. It took three times longer than usual to make it up to the surface level. Certain rooms were being emptied, while certain other rooms were being crammed full of furniture and materials. Stephanie got the impression that they were preparing for some major refurbishment. They got to the surface level, and Skullduggery took over, leading them through the smaller corridors, the ones that weren't lit right, the ones that rarely saw activity. They heard footsteps ahead. Half of them darted into one room, half of them into the room opposite. High heels. And behind them, more steps. Stephanie waited beside Vex. He looked calm, in control. His eyes only widened when they heard Skullduggery say, Hello, China. Vex lunged out, and Stephanie and the others followed. They fooled the narrow corridor facing off against China and two Roarhaven majors. The majors were frozen on the spot. Skullduggery! China said. Wait. Skullduggery's voice was cold. I knew you'd be the first to turn traitor. No, you don't understand. You just can't stop betraying people, can you? China stepped forward, wringing her hands. What was I supposed to do? I didn't know what Ravel was planning, I swear. Stephanie glimpsed a glowing sigil on China's palm. They forced me to stay. I didn't want to. You have to believe... And China whirled, planting her hand on the face of the nearest Roarhaven mage, sending a bolt of power through him. At the same time, Skullduggery used the air to pull the second mage into an elbow that sent him crumpling to the floor beside his partner. China smoothed her dress. I was beginning to think you'd abandoned me. At least you've been safe, Skullduggery said. Where is he? Stephanie joined the others in looking puzzled. I don't know said China. But wherever Ravel is, the Black Cleaver is with him. You need to leave. Every sorcerer in this building has orders to kill you all on sight. China looked at Stephanie, and her eyes narrowed. And who do we have here? I'm Stephanie. Valkyrie's reflection. China gazed at her. Curious. You two planned this from the start, Stephanie said. We improvised. 
Skullduggery said. Not planned. Why didn't you tell me? Valkyrie, I mean. Why didn't you tell Valkyrie? China smiled a little. Because he didn't want her to assume we'd patch things up. He hasn't forgiven me for the things I did, and I don't expect him to. But one must be pragmatic in times like these. Skullduggery grunted. What have you found out? Precious little, I'm afraid. Mist has me followed every time I step outside. You're right, though. There are too many people for this town. You could walk the streets at the same time every day of the week and you'd see the same number of faces, but never the same faces. There is more to Roarhaven than I have been allowed to see. It has to be below the streets. But how big? And how many people? And more importantly, why? Why has Ravel gone to all this trouble? This is the least of the trouble he's gone to. I've just heard that the German elders have been killed by their own mages. They're not even bothering to blame it on assassins any more. And Ravel's involved? From what I can gather, he is more than merely involved. The sorcerers he appointed as interim elders in Australia and Africa? His supporters. Zafira Karius in America, Palaver Graves in England? His supporters. He has had elders turning on elders, mages turning on councils, and sanctuaries turning on sanctuaries. And in every single case, the people who have taken over are people who support Ravel's views on a world run by sorcerers. So that's it, Fletcher said. He's won. I mean, if the Supreme Council are all dead, then everyone is taking orders from Ravel now. Not quite, said China. Ordinary mages would never support a move to turn the mortals into slaves. So he's going to need something big to unite the sorcerers around the world. The warlocks, Skullduggery said. I believe so. China, we need to get Ravel alone. That's not going to happen. The elders are under constant protection. Ravel never goes anywhere without the Black Cleaver, and Mist never goes anywhere without Sick and Portia. Your best bet is to draw him out into the open, which is easier said than done. It's just a pity he didn't get here sooner. What do you mean? He's scheduled to deliver a speech to the good people of Roarhaven in under an hour, right outside the sanctuary. It would have been perfect for you if you'd had time to prepare. It might still be perfect. She frowned. Don't let his betrayal lure you into doing something stupid. When was the last time I did something stupid? Skullduggery asked, and handed her a phone before she could answer. Take this. If you need to contact us, send a message. It's untraceable, but only good for thirty wards before the protective sigils burn it out. I've got its twin. China nodded, looked down at the unconscious mages at her feet. I suppose I'll have to dispatch these two charming individuals myself. Joy of joys. Skullduggery started moving, and China looked up. I'm sorry? By the way, about Ghastly, I liked him. Skullduggery paused and nodded, and continued on. They followed him down a little-used corridor until they could go no further without looping back on themselves. He started tapping the bare wall. There's a tunnel that runs from here to the cellar beneath Scapegrace's pub, where the torment lived. From what I understand, he never told his fellow children of the spider about either the tunnel or the cellar. Thank heaven for private people, Gracious murmured. The wall rumbled and yawned open, revealing a gullet of darkness. Skullduggery clicked his fingers, summoning flame. We're going to have to run, he said. Stephanie took off after them down the slanting slope, cutting straight through this labyrinth. If they took one wrong turn, she knew they'd find themselves at a dead end with no time to make it back before the walls squashed them all to a red and pink paste. She stumbled, almost fell, but Fletcher grabbed her hand, pulled her onwards. The walls started rumbling again. The tunnel was closing back. His hand still clutching hers, Fletcher jumped so he could see over the heads of the people in front. And when his feet touched down again, they were both in the lead, emerging from the tunnel into a dimly lit bedroom. Stephanie went sprawling across the bed, landing on her feet on the other side. A few moments later... Skullduggery and the others joined them, and the tunnel resealed itself. Cheat! Saracen managed to gasp to Fletcher, who shrugged. For the first time, 
Stephanie became aware of music playing. Shake a Tail Feather by Ray Charles. Gun drawn, Skullduggery led the way out of the bedroom, Stephanie right behind him. They got to the living room, with its tatty armchairs and battered couch, awful 1970s wallpaper, a painting of a ship on a stormy sea, an old cracked TV, a record player, and in the middle of the room, scapegrace and thrasher, and some old Chinese man, dancing to the music. The others crowded in around Stephanie. She could feel their frowns. Scapegrace was doing the mashed potato. Thrasher was doing the twist. The old Chinese man was doing the bird. They all had their eyes closed, faces screwed up as the music ran through them. Skullduggery used the air to lift the needle from the record, and the music cut off, and the dancing stopped, and the dancers looked round in confusion until Scapegrace saw Stephanie and the others standing there. "'My friends!' he cried, delight widening his eyes. He rushed over, shaking Skullduggery's hand, gripping Stephanie by the shoulders, and then beaming at the rest. "'I'm so glad you're here! We've been hiding out for days. We haven't even been able to go out on our nightly patrols. Have you heard? About Elder Bespoke?' "'We heard,' Skullduggery said. "'Sheriff DeCanny is hunting for us. At least twice a day he sends people in to search the pub. They haven't found us yet. We're too clever. Although we didn't bring any food down with us. I can fix that, Fletcher said, and vanished. Scapegrace gestured to the furniture. Please, everyone sit. Welcome to the nice cave. Most of you will know my sidekick, Thrasher, and this is Grandmaster Ping, my instructor in the martial arts. Ping bowed deeply. Very honoured to meet you, he said in halting English. Miss Scapegrace and I are in love. We're not in love, Scapegrace said quickly, smiling to cover up his awkwardness. Very much in love, said Ping. For the last time, said Scapegrace, I am a man. Ping looked at him and shrugged. Oh, well, nobody's perfect. I'm sure this is all very interesting, Skullduggery said, only putting his gun away now. But we need to use the cellar. Nice cave, said Scapegrace. As a base, we're going to be striking at Ravel, taking him down, and everyone who stands with him. Are you in? Scapegrace beamed, then took something from his pocket and turned away from them. He pulled it, whatever it was, over his head, spent a few moments fixing it in place, and then he whirled. He was wearing a mask. It wasn't a very good one. The dark and stormy night will fight for justice, he announced. Skullduggery hesitated. The dark and stormy night. Is that you? Oh, yes, sorry, it is. Right. And I'm the village idiot, Thrasher said happily. Whatever reaction he had expected to this confession, Stephanie reckoned it wasn't a pained, embarrassed silence. Thrasher flushed red and shut up. Fletcher appeared by Stephanie's side, laden down with groceries. I risked a peek, he said. There's a crowd already gathering outside the sanctuary. Whatever he's going to talk about, Ravel's going to have an audience. Good, said Skullduggery. I'd hate if we were the only ones there. There was no plan. Stephanie stood with her head down, beside Skullduggery and the others, slightly apart from the huge crowd that was buzzing with anticipation. The only thing Skullduggery had said was that if an opportunity presented itself, they were to take it. Stephanie couldn't see how an opportunity would present itself. There were cleavers and Roarhaven mages everywhere, posted at strategic points and mingling with the spectators. If the dead men, or what was left of them, were to make one move, they'd be cut down instantly. There was a podium set up outside the entrance to the sanctuary, and behind it a giant screen. At the moment the screen showed the crowd— some people ignored the camera in their faces, others openly scowled at it, but most grinned and laughed and waved. Their moment of glory. Stephanie only had time to wonder who was operating the camera before Erskine Ravel stepped onto the podium, the black cleaver right behind him. He waited until the cheers and applause died down before speaking. "'Sorcerers of all disciplines,' he said. 
his voice coming across loud and clear. Friends, brothers, and sisters, I stand before you in the peaceful town of Roarhaven, whose borders are even now being threatened by those many of you view as your enemies. But I also speak to them, for I know they can hear me. I speak to General Mantis and the men and women of the army it leads, and I speak to mages around the world, viewing this on the global link. We have been through some troubling times. Not since the days of Mevolent have we experienced such divisions in our society. But, as destructive as it was, that was a good war to fight. We stood side by side, and we fought for survival against a cunning and ruthless foe. When we fought, many of us didn't even believe that the Faceless Ones were anything more than the superstitions of an old religion. We weren't fighting against insane gods. We were fighting against their insane worshippers, dark sorcerers who were planning a genocide against the people we were sworn to protect. We fought for each other. We fought for the mortals. And we won. But this war is different. There are no villains in this conflict. There are simply opposing sides. Through circumstances beyond our control, we have been forced to take up arms against each other. At first it was the Irish sanctuary against the members of the Supreme Council. Then it was the Cradles of Magic against the Supreme Council. And then fractures began to appear as the moral implications of our own actions took their toll. You saw the footage yourself. My own best friend, ghastly bespoke, conspired against me, not for any selfish reason, but because he thought he knew best. In defending myself, I took his life, as many of you are aware. Not a day goes by that I do not shed a tear for my friend. But I also thank him, because in doing what he thought was right, he reinvigorated my own strength and resolve to do the same. My friends, many of the Grand Mages who sit on the Supreme Council are different Grand Mages from the ones who formed it in the first place. In the last hour, I have been informed that Cathernus Ode and Delory Reticent have been found murdered in their own sanctuary. Palava Graves is now Grand Mage of England, but he is no less passionate and no less fierce than Ode ever was. I have reached out to Grand Mage Graves and the others, and they have reached out to me, for we have seen what divisions like these can lead to if not healed in time. Isolation, suspicion, hatred. We have spoken of our grievances and agreed upon a truce. As I speak, word should be reaching General Mantis confirming what I have just said. Ravel took a moment, looked out upon the sea of faces. We have also spoken of our duty, above all else, to protect the mortals. This is, after all, how the conflict started. In too many instances over the past few years, the Irish sanctuary has teetered on the brink of disaster. It is only thanks to people like Ghastly Bespoke and Skullduggery Pleasant that none of Mevelin's three generals were able to succeed in their plans. Even more recently, Drayland Scarab's plot to kill 80,000 mortals was foiled. The remnants were recaptured, the necromancers stymied, and the sorcerer known as Argedian defeated. In all of these cases, however, the threat of being discovered by the mortals was dangerously high. The camera, capturing this message, is being wielded by a mortal a journalist who has uncovered the truth, who has found us. He is but the first. We could wipe his mind, but there would still be others after he's gone. Would we wipe their minds too? How many wiped minds are too many? The world has changed, my friends. Technology has changed it. Secrets are harder to keep. Do you know how many dark corners of the Internet there are dedicated to amateur blurry footage of sorcerers in action? We are urban legend now. It is only a matter of time before we become front-page news, and just like that, overnight, we will be the enemy. We will be hunted, imprisoned, 
experimented on, until we are forced to fight back. But we cannot fight back. How could we? It is our duty to protect the mortals. It is time to match the world, to change with it. I have spoken with the Supreme Council about protecting the mortals in a more overt fashion, not to run from the spotlight, but to step from the shadows. We have broached the subject of revealing our existence. I know, I know, this goes against everything we've ever believed in. But our choices are few, and we have little time to decide. There is a threat on the horizon. The warlocks are massing. They have joined with the Brides of Blood Tears, and they are on the march. We have even heard rumors that they have an army of wretchlings with them. With that level of sheer power and savagery, they could decimate a small country within days. Millions of mortals would die, and the world would wake up to the harsh reality that magic is real, but not everyone who wields it is good and honorable. If such a tragedy were to take place, we would need to act swiftly and decisively. We would need to push back the warlock threat in full view of the mortals so that they would rightfully view us as their protectors. And once the warlocks are defeated, we slip into their society. We let their gratitude enhance us, and we use our magic and our science to enhance them, to improve their lives, to protect them to the fullest of our abilities. We coexist. We thrive. Of course, no decision about any of this has been made, and no decision could be made without the full support of every sanctuary around the world. This is a paradigm shift of epic proportions. We all need to be in agreement. At my command, our shield will be lowered. Under the terms of the truce, General Mantis and its army can enter Rawhaven. They will not be harmed. They will be welcomed. They are our brothers and sisters, and Roarhaven is nothing if not hospitable. There is also more to this town than at first appears. Decades ago, its citizens discussed how best to grow their town. They were proud of their magical heritage, and they wanted Roarhaven to be a shining light for magical communities the world over. So they worked, and they built, and people came. Whispers spread from like-minded individual to like-minded individual. There is a place, they said, a place for people like us. But such a rapid and extravagant expansion needed to be kept from mortal eyes, and so they enlisted the help of Crayfon Signate. Crayfon comes from a long and distinguished line of dimensional shunters, explorers into realities few of us would even dream about. Crayfon heard the citizen's plan, and he agreed to help. And he is with us today for the grand unveiling. A man came forward, small and slim, with close-cropped hair, and joined Ravel on the podium. I know him, Scapegrace whispered. We beat him up. We thought he was Silas Nadir. Crayfon Signate raised his arms and lowered his head. Stephanie frowned. The town began to flicker with new buildings superimposing over the old. The citizens of Roarhaven had a dream, said Ravel, to rise beyond the limitations set on them. They dreamed of a town strong enough to withstand any assault and big enough to house any number. They dreamed until their town was a town no longer. Sorcerers, friends, brothers, and sisters, I present to you... Rawhaven City! Signate gave a cry of effort, and the flickering buildings became solid. Towers and steeples raced each other skywards, overshooting the residential blocks, apartments, and houses and homes. The roads were broad and intricately layered, and the old main street was now little more than an alleyway. The old buildings were still there. But above them and around them there were all manner of improvements and modifications. When his speech had begun, Ravel had been standing in front of a squat, unimpressive sanctuary building. It was now nothing less than a palace, and it stood shimmering in the sun. Smaller than Mevelin's palace had been, perhaps, but just as luxurious, and it seemed to be occupying the exact centre of this new city like a vibrant, beating heart. 
Even the stagnant lake was different. Swirling bridges crisscrossed its sparkling surface. And on those bridges people cheered. People cheered in the streets too, thousands of them, men and women and children who hadn't been there moments earlier. And around the outskirts, a wall, complete with watchtowers and buttresses. This isn't a city, said Vex softly. It's a fortress. At Skullduggery's command, they moved backwards cautiously, keeping their faces hidden from the thousands who now surrounded them on all sides. Chapter 63 The Trap The relief was a tangible thing, heavy in the air, like a low-lying heat that wouldn't go away. Those who had fought under Mantis's command, sorcerers from all over the world who had never wanted to go to war in the first place, laughed and sang with the people of Roarhaven and the mages they had been trying to kill just days earlier. Grievances were forgotten. Grudges were dismissed. No one, it appeared, bore any animosity towards anyone else. No one except China. In one of the vast and empty rooms of this strange new sanctuary, she sat and watched Vincent Foe walk in, followed by his gang of mercenaries. They had been drinking and carousing with the best of them, but now their fun was over. You sent for us? said Foe. I did, said China. They stood in front of her, and Foe tried to smile. Listen, Miss Sorrows, we were hired to do a job. You can't take this stuff personally. I happen to take being hunted down very personally. Were the bullet, were not the finger that pulled the trigger. The Supreme Council, I know who pulled the trigger, Mr. Foe, and it's not even who you think. There were systems in place behind this war. Strings being pulled. I know exactly who ordered my death. Then that's who you should be angry with. She raised an eyebrow. How could I be angry? It's what I would have done in their place. You see, to the finger that pulled the trigger, ordering my death was a purely business decision. But you and your friends took to it with relish. Too much relish, if I'm being honest. We were hard. Step forward, please. Foe frowned. I'm sorry. There are five circles drawn on the floor in front of you. Each of you pick a circle and step into it. We're not going to. Mr. Foe, I'm sure I don't have to remind you that I am a personal guest of Grand Mage Ravels, and that he has instructed you to do whatever I ask. Foe's merry band of mercenaries glanced at each other uneasily, except for Samuel. Samuel just kept his eyes on China. Even as they all stepped into the circles, his eyes never left her. Thank you, China said, as she stood up and tapped the sigil on her elbow. The circles lit up, and their bodies went rigid, eyes bulging, fingers curled as pain seized control. I could kill you all with another tap on my finger, China said, walking between them. You dare to hunt me? You dare to make an attempt on my life? Do you even know who I am? Do you know the things I have done? I'm sure I cannot even begin to comprehend the audacity with which you thought that my life could be quashed by the likes of you. In all your years on this planet, not one of you has done anything to deserve the right to kill me. Not you, Mr. Foe, and not one of your pathetic, mewling little band of killers. Her finger hovered by her elbow. One twitch would be all it took, and the pain would rise so suddenly that their hearts would burst. Instead, she flattened her hand and brushed it over her elbow, and the circles stopped glowing and the mercenaries dropped, gasping to their knees. I am not in the habit of being merciful, she said to them, but you have your uses, as clumsy and thick-fingered as you may be. Mr. Foe, please look at me when I'm talking to you. Foe raised his head. Sweat poured down his face. Immediately China felt the need to shower. For the indignity I have suffered at your hands, you owe me. 
When I come to collect my favor, you will obey without question. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Fo said. You work for me now. Remember that. Leave me now. I have another appointment to keep. They dragged themselves away, and China allowed herself a moment of pleasure before shaking it off. She headed for the busier sections of the sanctuary, where mages walked and talked quickly. A pair of cleavers led her through to the round room. Ravel and Mist sat on their chairs, the black cleaver standing behind Ravel while the children of the spider stood around them. Ghastly's chair was, of course, empty. China, said Ravel. Thank you for joining us. I apologize for taking you from your work, but I think there's something you can help us with. You may have heard talk of some missing mages. She inclined her head in a nod. I've heard some gossip. Four mages have failed to turn up for their sanctuary duties. Their houses are empty. Their friends don't know where they are. We know where they are, said Ravel. We've been keeping it quiet so as not to spread panic. They're dead. And it's been more than four. Eight dead in the last week. All of them killed in the line of duty. Another eleven gone missing. Taken. Two of them were the mages sent to keep an eye on you. That's terrible, isn't it? I suspect that while the war between sanctuaries is over, there is another war being fought within these city walls. China could feel Mist's gaze on her, despite the veil that covered her face. The terror and the scourge were looking at her calmly. Only Sick and Portia had open hostility in their eyes. She didn't know how much they knew, but she knew how much they suspected. A lie here could land her in shackles, or worse. China gave them all a smile. The dead men, she said. Or what's left of them, said Ravel. This was more our style than leading an army across a battlefield, after all. Drop behind enemy lines, take the opposition out one by one, whittle down their numbers. Strike from the shadows, China said. Disappear into darkness. That's our motto, and that's our system. And now it's being used against me. I never realized how annoying it could be. Of course, the system is a lot more effective when you have a teleporter on your team. I'm assuming they have Fletcher back? You're assuming I know? Of course you know, Portia said. You're Skullduggery Pleasant's friend. You have a history. China locked eyes with her. The same could be said for Erskine. And look how that turned out. Ladies, Ravel said, we're not here to throw accusations around. We're not playing the blame game. You're standing in a circle of trust, China. We're all on the same side. Isn't that true? China thought about her answer before voicing it. Somewhat? Ravel laughed. That's why I like you, China. You're so hard to trap in a lie. When was the last time you spoke with Skullduggery? Erskine Ravel and the children of the spider in front of her. The black cleaver behind. The truth, then. Six days ago, China said. The day you unveiled your city, actually. Execute her! Sick growled, stepping forward. A slight turn of the head from Madame Miss, though, and he glowered and stepped back. Were they here for the speech? Ravel asked. I hope they liked it. Not nearly enough people have come and congratulated me on that speech. It took me ages to get it right. Skullduggery now. Skullduggery would have appreciated it. I wouldn't know what he thought, said China. I haven't spoken to him, or any of them since. Oh, that's a shame. Well, since we're on the subject, what did you speak to them about? They asked about your plans. I answered honestly. I don't know anything about your plans. They asked me when you would likely be alone. I said, you're never alone. You always have bodyguards around you. Such is the world we live in, Ravel said, shaking his head sadly. Were you of any use to them at all? I don't see how I could have been. Hmm. Well, apart from not reporting it to me immediately, I mean, you aided them in that sense. I suppose you could look at it like that. 
Mist spoke. And now, Miss Sorrows, where do your loyalties lie? China looked up. Where they have always lain, Madam Mist? With me? A spider scurried out of Mist's voluminous sleeve and across her pale, slender hand before disappearing from sight. I am going to be frank here, said Ravel. It's not looking good for you, China. You come to the sanctuary for, well, sanctuary, and we take you in. You have work you need to do. We give you the tools. Your little spies aren't speaking to you any more. We put you in a position so that they do. We've done so much and asked so little, and the first chance you get, you fail us by aiding the enemy. If I hadn't, they might have killed me. It wouldn't take much to convince Skullduggery that I'd betrayed him yet again. I suppose you're right, said Ravel. You did get his wife and child murdered, after all. Something I've always wondered about, actually. Why did you do it? I mean, I know it was to lure Skullduggery into the trap so that Serpine could kill him. But you could have sent anyone to snatch them up. You could have sent the Diablery. Instead, you went. Alone. You went up against his wife, alone. For someone who never exposes herself to any unnecessary danger, that's quite a risk you took. I was young, impetuous. In love? What an odd notion. Is it? We had plenty of theories throughout the years, but we always returned to that one. Back when he was alive, before the war started, you were in love with Skullduggery and he was in love with you. Ridiculous. I barely knew him back then. That's what Dexter said. But then we remembered that your brother had tried to take you with him when he stopped worshipping the Faceless Ones. You spent months with people who weren't lunatics, and one of these people was Skullduggery. It doesn't say much for our supposed love if I return to my old ways soon after, does it? Ravel gave a smile. You return to your old ways after Skullduggery met his future wife. Ghastly's opinion was that you were spurned. Ghastly Bespoke's opinions were not always right. It was his opinion, for example, that he could stand with his back to you and you wouldn't stick a knife in it. How wrong he was. Ravel's smile slipped. I'm not going to try to justify my actions. I killed Ghastly. There's a special hell for traitors, and that's where I'm going. But he had to die, as did Anton. I had to send a message to my supporters. They needed to see that I was as committed to this revolution as they were. Just as they had to spill the blood of their elders and fellow mages, I had to spill the blood of my brothers. Now we're all damned together. And if you manage to capture Skullduggery and the others? China asked. Will they also have to die? Ravel shook his head. It'll be shackles and a cell for them. You know me well enough to know that killing is, and always will be, a last resort. I may have done this terrible thing, but I haven't changed who I am. I'm not some moustache-twirling vaudeville villain. I'm still me. And who are you? You say I know you well enough. I don't know you at all. You used to be such a proud exponent of Caraval Juice's teachings. Where did it all go so wrong? Ravel shook his head sadly. My eyes were opened long before I started regurgitating Caravel's words. During the war with Mevelant, I was captured, tortured. After a few days, I told them everything I knew, but they didn't stop torturing me. They finally had one of the dead men in their grasp, and they were enjoying every single scream. Then one day I heard screams that weren't my own. And I thought, they're here. My friends are here. But when the door burst open, it wasn't Skullduggery or Ghastly standing there. It was the torment. Larrikin took my place in the dead men while I recovered, and I spent almost a year with the children of the spider. Do you know of the conditions in which they were forced to live? Squalor, and not because of the war, but because of the mortals. A child of the spider can't walk among us for very long without revealing how 
different they are. And these days it's even harder to hide. So that's what this is all about? China asked. Equal rights for children of the spider. Equal rights imply that they're equal to mortals. They're not. They're superior. We all are. My eyes were opened, China. Why should we live in squalor? Why should we hide who we are? Because that's the way it's always been? That's not a valid reason. So you orchestrated a war? I orchestrated a revolution under the guise of a war. Caraval Juice was wrong. We shouldn't just be the guardians of the mortals. We should be their leaders. The only reason you're still alive is because I know you share my views. You're so sure? One hundred percent positive. That doesn't mean I agree with your revolution. Of course you don't agree with it, said Ravel. You hate change. You want the world to remain steady and predictable. So does skullduggery. I've just done away with that possibility. The warlocks are hunting for Department X. They're going after the mortals. When we are forced to step in, when we defeat them, every sorcerer will be united under my rule. Then we take over. It's a new world order, China, and I'm giving you the chance to get in on the ground floor. So you need something from me? I need the dead men. I need Skullduggery and the others. I don't know where they are. But you can get a message to them. You can tell them I'm going to be alone and vulnerable at a particular time. China hesitated. You want me to lead them into a trap? The warlocks are close to attacking the mortals. To the best of our reckoning, we expect them to attack Dublin in a matter of days. We need to be ready to take them down. You said they had the wretchlings with them, and that's something we didn't anticipate. If anything goes wrong before they attack, if Skullduggery disrupts our plans, the warlocks might actually win. And then where would we be? Dead? said China. Dead, Ravel echoed. So, yes, I want you to lead Skullduggery and the others into a trap. We'll put them in shackles, put them in cells, and we'll deal with the warlocks. Once we've established our dominance over the mortals, the cell doors will be opened, and I'll turn myself in. China frowned. You're not going to lead? Me, Ravel said, and laughed. What would I know about running a world? Every country's sanctuary will absorb that country's government, and it'll all continue as before, just with people like us in charge. I'll confess to my crimes, be put away or go into exile, and my friends can live in peace. That's almost noble. Were it not for the manipulations and murders, Ravel nodded. Be under no illusion, Madame Mist said quietly. If the dead men fail to turn up, or if they are somehow ready for us, you will be killed instantly. I'd expect nothing less, China said. Chapter 64 The Trap is Sprung Ravel made a big show of shaking the hand of General Mantis right on the steps of the shiny new sanctuary. Mantis's army dissolved, Soldiers becoming sorcerers once again, independent and curious, and they explored Roarhaven while the city's people grinned proudly, both at what they had made and for the secret they had kept for all this time. The various elders of the Supreme Council, itself undergoing a slow dissolution, sent their warmest congratulations and made promises to visit soon. But there was tension in the air. Stephanie could feel it whenever she left Scapegrace's night cave. The Irish sorcerers who had fought under Erskine Ravel had seen the footage. They had seen Ghastly Bespoke and Anton Shudder being murdered by their own Grand Mage, and they weren't buying his lies. They met in small groups, talked quietly among themselves, their conversations dying whenever a Roarhaven Mage walked too near. But they weren't the only ones. Sorcerers from other sanctuaries, men and women, who had never wanted to fight a war in the first place, were asking questions about their own sanctuary's involvement. Upon closer inspection, facts and motivations didn't add up. The assassins, who had caused so many elders to be replaced, had either disappeared or had yet to be even identified. 
And then there was the big question, the question that everyone was asking. Where was Skullduggery Pleasant? They were saying the reason the shield around Roarhaven had been put back up when Mantis came through was because Grand Mage Ravel was afraid of what the skeleton detective would do once he got to him. They said that Ravel went everywhere with the children of the spider to protect him, and had the black cleaver as his own personal bodyguard. They said he couldn't sleep at night. How Stephanie hoped that was true. No one expected her to have feelings. She could see it in their faces. Vex and Saracen and the monster hunters were at least civil to her, and friendly enough, but Skullduggery and Fletcher ignored her. She tried not to show how much that hurt. She deserved it. Of course she did. She'd murdered Carol. She'd tried to kill Valkyrie. In their eyes, she was probably still a reflection, still a thing, still an it. When Valkyrie had first told her about Ghastly, Stephanie wasn't sure how she felt. She knew she felt something. There was something inside her, something that felt like Valkyrie's memories of heartache and loss. But Stephanie had shoved it aside, because she was able to do that. Shove it aside, deal with it later. But when she dealt with it later, she realized that what she was feeling was real. It was actual heartache. It was actual loss, and it was hers. It wasn't Valkyrie's. But nobody wanted to know about how much Stephanie grieved. Seven days after the war ended, she woke to discover that China had sent a message. She walked into the night cave living room to find everyone here, deep in discussion. They hadn't even bothered to wake her. This is our chance, said Gracious. Skullduggery kept looking at the message on his phone. So it would seem. Gracious frowned. You think it's a trap? I don't know. It's perfect. It's not too easy. But it's nothing we can't manage. It's ideally suited to us. So it is a trap. It may not be. So it's not a trap. Skullduggery turned to him. Gracious, I sincerely don't know. But if it is a trap... Then Shrine has betrayed us, Vex said. She wouldn't do that willingly said Skullduggery. But if they put a gun to her head, and we don't walk into the trap, they'll assume she tipped us off somehow. Ravel might very well throw her in a cell, but Madame Mist is not so forgiving. Saracen rubbed his hand over his mouth. He hadn't shaved in two days. You think they'll kill her? It's a distinct possibility. So what do we do? Skullduggery held up three fingers, and one at a time he ticked them off. We kill Ravel. We rescue China. We don't get caught. It's going to be tricky. Gracious, is there any way you can access the camera feed again? Gracious shook his head. They changed the access codes the moment they realized we'd infiltrated their system. But if Ravel's going down to the accelerator room, I think I can patch into the signals received by the engineer's audiovisual processors. I don't think even Nye thought about installing safeguards for that. We'll be able to see what the engineer sees, and hear what it hears. Excellent, Skullduggery said. We'll need every advantage we can get. I'm not going to lie to you. This is going to be dangerous. I can't make any of you come with me on this one. Questions? Everyone put their hands up. Sorry, Skullduggery said. I meant volunteers. Thank you. Gracious, get to work. The rest of you... Prepare. In two hours, we're going after Ravel. He didn't say anything about Stephanie staying behind, so she prepared alongside everyone else. Well, almost everyone. Scapegrace cornered her on her way back from the toilet. Let us help, he said. I've been training in the martial arts. Thrasher has big muscles. Grandmaster Ping is really good at Kung Fu. Please don't leave us behind. I want to be one of the good guys. You are one of the good guys, Stephanie said. But this isn't up to me. Skullduggery and the others, they need to see you in action before they let you come along. And we don't have time for that right now. But this is it, said Kate Grace. This is the big one. I, I need to do this. The Black Cleaver is my fault. 
I got Thrasher to pick up all the little bits of him after Lord Vile made him explode. I gave the bits to Nye as payment for putting our heads in new bodies. If it wasn't for me, Ravel wouldn't have the scariest bodyguard in the world and— Scapegrace, Stephanie said. It's okay. No one's blaming you. If ever there was a moment to prove myself, to show people that I'm not a joke anymore, that it's time to take me seriously, it's now. This fight you're going into is important to you. We want to be there. I want to be there. I want to fight alongside the good guys, and whatever happens, victory or defeat, life or death, I'm ready for it. It isn't up to me. But they listen to you. No, Stephanie said. They won't. She left him there and got back to the living room as a picture flickered into life on Gracious's laptop. The accelerator room. Empty, apart from the engineer itself. Everyone crowded around. Keep an eye on the walls, Skullduggery said. They need a large sigil on each one if they want to debilitate Fletcher upon arrival. Can't see any, said Vex. You'd better be sure, Fletcher said. I got hit with one of those things before and it is not fun. I couldn't teleport for hours afterwards. Skullduggery leaned away from the screen. The walls look clear. So maybe this isn't a trap after all. Maybe. Here they come. The engineer swiveled its head, and the monitor showed two mages walking in, followed by Ravel with the black cleaver behind his right shoulder. The engineer looked away for a moment as Clarabelle wandered by, and when it returned its attention to Ravel, the Grand Mage was peering directly into its face. Nye stood by his side, stooping over. The Black Cleaver, Sick, and two Roarhaven mages formed a loose circle round them both. Ravel reached out, tried wiping the smiley face from the engineer's head. As he did so, he turned the camera slightly and they glimpsed Portia, standing guard by the door. Saracen, Dexter, and Gracious. Take Sick and his two friends, Skullduggery said. Donegan, Portia is yours. The most dangerous person in that room is the Black Cleaver. Stephanie, the scepter is the only thing guaranteed to put him down fast. If he moves, turn him to dust. Ravel is mine. Fletcher, you stay away from any fighting. If this is a trap, you grab whoever is closest and get the hell out of there. Everyone clear in what they have to do? Okay, then. Get in position. Stephanie didn't even get to blink, and they were standing inside the circle of bodyguards with Ravel and Nye. The black cleaver was the first to spin, but Stephanie was already holding the scepter out, ready to fire. She was aware of the scuffles all around her, of the shouts and curses and threats, but she didn't take her eye off the cleaver as he stood there, his hands frozen halfway to his side. Fletcher was beside her, gently moving her as Vex dragged Sick past them, Sick turning purple in a sleeper hold. The scepter didn't waver, the cleaver didn't move. When Sick slumped into unconsciousness, Vex said, Clear. Behind her, Gracious said, Clear. Clear, from Saracen. Clear, from Donegan. Put down the scythe, Stephanie told the black cleaver. Back up against the wall. For a moment, the cleaver didn't move. Do as she says, said Ravel from somewhere to her right. The cleaver laid the scythe on the floor and backed up. Stephanie's mouth was dry. I have been held here against my will, Nye said, its voice wavering with fear. Shut up, said Skullduggery. Stephanie glanced at him. He had Ravel on his knees, gun pressed to his head. What's it going to be? Ravel asked. Assassination? Arrest? Or kidnap? Keep talking, Skullduggery said. I haven't made up my mind. Well, if these are my final moments, I'd like you all to know how sorry I am about Ghastly and Anton. Assassination it is, Skullduggery muttered, taking a step back to avoid the blood splatter. Hold on, Ravel said quickly. Just hold on a second, okay? I didn't want to do it, but I had to. I'm changing the world. In fifty years you look back on all this and, I don't know, maybe you'll see that I was right. I doubt that very much, Saracen said. Yeah, said Ravel. I thought it may have been a tad far-fetched myself, but what else am I going to say with a gun pointed to my head? Apart from if you surrender now, 
None of you will be harmed. Is this the part where you spring the trap? Skullduggery asked. Ravel smiled. So you knew? Of course. But you came anyway? Of course. See? That's why we're friends. I'm going to stand up now. You can shoot me if you want, but I'm standing up. Ravel got to his feet slowly. The gun stayed pressed to his temper. You're not going anywhere, by the way. You're certainly not teleporting out of here. Is that so? Fletcher said. And what's going to stop us? Ravel looked at him. Your hair is really cool. The pager on Fletcher's hand crackled, and he jerked back. Vex caught him as he fell. Don't worry, said Ravel. He's still alive, but he won't regain consciousness for a while. Just a little something extra I added to the pager. Voice activated. I had to pick a phrase that no one else would say to him. Ever. They're coming for us, Saracen said. Mages and cleavers. Dozens of them. Gracious. Pick up Fletcher, Skullduggery said. We're shooting our way out of here. No, you're not, Revel said, almost angrily. You're going to get yourself killed. Just surrender, okay? You've lost. Accept it. You'll be in a cell for a few months, and when you emerge, we'll be ruling the world. The way we were always meant to. The doors burst open. Skullduggery swung Ravel round and stood behind him. If any of us takes one single step, Ravel told the mages and cleavers who were flooding the room, kill us all. Skullduggery thumbed back the hammer of his gun. You're so eager to die? I won't let you ruin everything, Ravel said. I won't let Anton's and Ghastly's deaths be in vain. This will be seen through to the bitter end, with or without you and me. I should just kill you right now. You could, but then all of you would die, even Valkyrie there. You won't hurt to die, Skullduggery. I don't. I don't want any of you to die. Stephanie waited for Skullduggery to correct him, to tell him that she wasn't the real Valkyrie, but he stayed quiet. There was a voice from behind the crowd of cleavers. Let me through! Let me through, damn it! A moment later, a narrow man pushed his way to the front. Flint, said Ravel, and for the first time Stephanie detected a hint of surprise in his voice. Everyone, allow me to introduce Flint, our new administrator. What happened to Tipstaff? Stephanie asked. Tipstaff is enjoying some time off, said Ravel. He's spending most of it in a cell, but he's always been the solitary type. Not everyone understood why I did the things I did. Grand Mage, Flint said. We've spotted the warlocks. Ravel brightened. Perfect timing. Where are they? Dublin? No, sir, Flint said. They're here. They're outside the city gates. Ravel stared at him. But why? Why the hell have they come here? They're meant to be attacking the mortals. Looks like they're not as gullible as you thought, Skullduggery murmured, and released his hold. Everyone stand down, he held out his gun. Ravel hesitated, then took it. Cleavers, he said. Cuff them. The cleavers moved in. Stephanie allowed them to take the scepter away from her, and cold shackles closed round her wrists. Ravel turned to Nye. Doctor, keep Fletcher nourished and hydrated while he sleeps. Of course. And no experimenting, you understand me? Nye hesitated, then bowed. Of course. Ravel looked at Skullduggery, then spoke to the black cleaver. Bring them up to the wall. They've come this far. They may as well see the damn warlocks. Chapter 65 The Warlocks the cleavers herded them into a tight group and they followed Ravel through the sanctuary. The old familiar corridors, concrete and grey and utilitarian, now opened up into grand walkways of marble and stone. The ceilings, so low, so oppressive, blossomed into arches and domes. They passed a group of men knocking down walls between the old and the new, the drab and the splendid, and it was like peeking into another world which in a way was exactly what they were doing. They gathered on a platform. 
At Ravel's command, it sank smoothly into the floor, the gap sealing itself above their heads. They came to a stop at the mouth of a wide, well-lit tunnel and started moving again, forward this time. "'Bloody warlocks,' he muttered. Skullduggery sounded oddly pleased. "'After you'd gone to all that trouble to frame Department X?' "'Exactly,' said Ravel, exasperated. "'I mean, how many breadcrumbs do I have to drop to lead them to attack mortals? Everything worked out according to plan. Everything. Yet still they turn up here. What use is that? We need them to attack Dublin, for God's sake. We need mortals to see them, to fear them. We need the world to panic. Only then can we swoop in and save the day. And then take over, Vex added. Taking over is our right, said Ravel. This is the most painless way we can do it, for both us and the mortals. What? You'd prefer if our plans consisted of mass destruction on a global scale. I'm trying to do this with a minimum of hardship. You're all looking at me like I've enjoyed this, like I've enjoyed getting innocent blood on my hands or betraying my friends. If you really feel bad about it, said Stephanie, take off our shackles. Well, Ravel said, I don't feel that bad about it. He smiled, but nobody else did. So he sighed and held up the scepter. And where did you get this, may I ask? Have you been visiting alternate dimensions again? He examined it closer. There are other god-killer weapons. The sword, the dagger, the spear, the bow. There are more, too, if you believe the legends. But this, this is the one. This is the weapon that drove back the faceless ones. An army that carries the scepter before it is invincible. Stephanie looked him straight in the eye. So are you going to kill me? The only way you can use that is to kill me and claim ownership of it for yourself. You really think I'd kill you, Valkyrie? You kill Ghastly, and Shudder, and Caraval Juice, and who knows how many others? Ravel looked away. Yeah, well, I'm not going to kill you. Gracious was standing with his head tilted back, looking at the lights as they flashed by. We're underneath the streets? he asked. Yes, we are. Ravel said. The sanctuary is connected to all major points in the city by these tunnels. You should see some of the materials we've discovered in the dimension where all this was built. Rocks, minerals, metals. We have nothing like them in this reality. No humans over there, but plenty of weird animals and fascinating vegetation. We've had experts examining everything, and they've discovered some kind of basic intelligence in the plant life. Can you imagine that? Intellectual carrots— the mind boggles. What are you trying to do? Vex asked quietly. Are you trying to make friends with us? Are we shouting now? You murdered Anton and Ghastly, you son of a bitch. There's no coming back from that. Ravel looked away, and nobody said anything as the platform slowed to a stop. The ceiling opened up above them, and they rose into it and kept going upwards, picking up speed. Stephanie had to open her mouth wide and make herself yawn so that her ears would pop. Just when she thought the ride would go on forever, they stopped and the door in front of them opened and the wind rushed in. They stepped out onto a wall, so thick you could park two cars side by side and still have enough room to squeeze by. There were battlements on one side and a metal railing on the other, the side that looked out across the city. It was an impressive sight. Stephanie peered over the railing, straight down to the streets below, and a dizzying wave of vertigo washed over her. A cleaver nudged her onwards, and she caught up with the others as they walked. Skullduggery had once told Valkyrie the names of the various sections of the battlements. He told her to think of the walls as the gums of an old man. The gums themselves were called crenels, and the jutting teeth were merlons. Valkyrie had forgotten the lesson within minutes. Stephanie remembered everything. The wind up here was strong and cold, and it snatched Skullduggery's hat from his head. Ravel raised his hand, and the hat swung around and settled into his grip. He put it into Skullduggery's shackled hands, but Skullduggery said nothing. General Mantis didn't have to peer between the Merlons to look out over the surrounding land. It just stood there 
ridiculously tall, wrapped in that cellophane. Now that she was close enough, Stephanie could see its pale, hairless flesh beneath. It looked down at them as they approached, its face hidden behind that mask. Grand Mage Ravel, it said. Congratulations on capturing your enemies. If you wish to fling them from the wall, I know the perfect spot. Ravel frowned. I'm not altogether sure you're joking. The general is like that, another man said as he walked up, a woman by his side. Its sense of humor takes a little getting used to. Hey, Saracen. Regis, Saracen said, nodding to him. Hi, Ashon. Ashon, the woman made a point of ignoring him. You're probably wondering why I didn't call, Saracen said to her. I was going to. I really was. But then I lost your number. Then war broke out. And then my phone stopped working. I have to get a new one. Any recommendations? I was thinking about a... Ashon glared at him, and he shut up. Grand Mage, Regis said. We're setting up a vantage point for you, if you follow me. They left Manta standing there, and he walked over to a young woman. This is N.J., Regis said. She's chosen the language of magic for her discipline, and we have her studying under China Saros. Miss Saros is a wonderful teacher, N.J. said, eyes wide. She really is so good at this. I'll never be half as good as she is. That's what she keeps telling me. She's magnificent. Regis sighed. N.J. is a little enamoured of Miss Sorrows at the moment. Ravel smiled as N.J. blushed. Hey, don't worry about it. We've all been there, believe me. Most of us are still there, if we're being honest. But how about you put all your doubts out of your head for the moment and show us what you can do? N.J. nodded. Yes. Yes, sir. She took an ornate pen from a silver case and pressed it to one of the merlons. The tip of the pen began to glow, and it carved through the stone like it was made of butter. N.J. may have been nervous, but her hand was sure, and she completed the sigil without a single hesitation. Once it was finished, she repeated the process on the next merlon. She checked her work, blew on the pen, then put it back in its silver case. She pressed the first sigil, and it glowed and when she took her finger away there was some kind of transparent film attached to it. She drew the film all the way across the crannel, and touched it against the second sigil, where it held. The film shimmered in the strong wind, but through it the surrounding countryside was magnified. In the distance they saw people. "'That's them?' Ravel asked. "'How many are there?' Thirty, sir.' "'That's all? Where's Caravari?' We haven't been able to see him. Ravel shook his head. So they've come to make war on us with thirty people. He looked at Skullduggery. Thoughts? Skullduggery took his time before answering. Right now, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great if they all came in here and ripped you apart? Well, Ravel said, that's helpful. Regis, ask the general what it thinks. Something's happening, Stephanie said. The warlocks were clearing a space for an old man. He straightened both arms over his head and started making circular motions with his hands. White energy glittered around his fingertips. Is that Caravari? Gracious asked. No, said Vex. Caravari's younger, more physically impressive. What's this guy doing? Eshon, said Regis. Stop him from doing what he's doing. Yes, sir, said Eshon and took a rifle from its covering. Some warlocks can't be killed by bullets, Donegan said. These bullets are special, Ashone murmured, putting her eye to the scope. The man brought his hands apart slightly, teasing out a small circle of energy. Ashone pulled the trigger, and the man's head snapped back in a mist of blood. The circle stayed where it was, though, hovering in the air. A woman came forward, held her hands to both sides of the circle, started stretching it. Ashone adjusted her aim, fired again. The woman's body toppled over the man's. Another man came forward, stretched the circle even further, 
you could ride a bike through it now. Before Ashon could fire, another man calmly stepped in front of him, blocking her shot. And another man stepped in front of him, and another. This is ridiculous, she said, picking up the rifle and jogging to another vantage point. She fired again, and again. But the others protected the man as he spread his arms wide and stepped back. And the circle pulsed with light, and with every pulse it grew. You could drive a car through it now, a van, a truck, a bus, and still it pulsed, and still it grew, until it was wide enough to fit ten buses through. And then it stopped, and it hung there like a giant smoke ring. I don't get it, said Saracen. It dipped a little, dipped more, dropping closer to the ground. Upon contact, its curved edge started to flatten until it looked less like a smoke ring and more like a punctured tire, and then it settled and stopped deflating. Ravel scowled. Does anyone know what the hell that is? It's a portal, said Skullduggery. Figures emerged. Stephanie heard Regis mutter something under his breath, something that sounded like retchlings. She didn't know what a retchlings was but she didn't think she could count them as human. Some had hair, most hadn't. Some were big, some scrawny. All of them had boils or sores of some sort. They wore leather and fur, but their clothes were stitched into their rotting skin, and their rotting skin was stitched through their clothes. They bulged, like they'd been overstuffed, like their insides had yet to settle into place. Some of them, their faces twitched like every muscle was in spasm, while others had faces so slack it was like they had no muscles at all. One thing they all had in common, though, was a weapon. They carried their swords or their axes or their warhammers in their meaty fists or their skeletal hands, and they walked with a single hostile purpose. And they kept coming. A hundred. Two hundred. Five. A thousand. Two thousand. They kept coming, spreading out across the fields. Three thousand. Five thousand. When they were all out, the portal closed behind them. I make it around twelve thousand, said Dexter. Ravel grabbed Regis's arm. Get Mantis over here. I need him to take control of the city's defense. When Regis hesitated, Ravel's eyes narrowed. What? We'll find. Regis said, but your people won't. What are you talking about? The Irish sorcerers, said Regis. I have spoken to them. They don't trust you, not after what you did to Gasly and Shudder, and they won't fight for you. They won't just stand by and let Roarhaven be destroyed. I wouldn't be too sure about that. Well, what the hell do you expect me to do about that now? Explanations can wait. If I tell them to fight— He faltered. Damn it. He turned to Skullduggery. They'll fight for you. Saracen barked a laugh. You have some nerve! Ravel ignored him. Take over, Skullduggery. Take command. Mantis's people and ours will fight if you're the one giving the orders. Forget about me, about what I've done. There is a city here with sorcerers who aren't fighters, thousands of them, men, women, and children. The warlocks will slaughter them. You know they will. Skullduggery tilted his head. And after? What happens, happens. Skullduggery looked over at the twelve thousand wretchlings and held out his hands. Then you'd better take these shackles off, hadn't you? Chapter 66 The Siege at Roarhaven The Roarhaven sorcerers didn't bother with magic at that range. A long barrel and a bullet, that's all they needed to slow the advance. From up high on the wall, Stephanie couldn't see the blood. She just saw the wretchlings jerk, topple, and fall, one after another. There were others in among them, men and women whose hands were lighting up. Hot beams of energy burst forth, but while bullets passed through the shield without slowing, magic sizzled against the invisible barrier and went no further. A one-sided battle, if ever Stephanie had seen one. 
Suddenly the warlock's great numbers didn't mean so much anymore. If they couldn't get through the shield, where was the threat? She watched a skinny man down below shouting up at them. His words were lost long before they reached the top of the wall, but they didn't seem to bother him. He screamed and shouted and shook his fists and stamped his feet. Skullduggery joined her, looking down at him. That's a little odd, he murmured. Looks like he's doing the hacker, Stephanie said. Skullduggery motioned to Regis. Captain, if I could focus your attention on the gentleman having the tantrum. Regis peered over the side. What about him? The warlocks aren't known for being normal. That even so, this does strike me as unusual behavior. Regis grunted. I shall. See the guy kicking up a fuss? Take him out before he does anything weirder. You got it, chief, Ashon said, taking careful aim. A piece of wall exploded beside her, and she jerked back. What the hell? Energy beams hit the shield, sizzled, and broke through. He's taking down the shield, Skullduggery said, snatching Ashon's gun from her and lifting it to his shoulder. He fired, but a wretchling jumped in front of the shouting man, caught the bullet in the neck. Skullduggery fired again, and again, a wretchling sacrificed himself. The shouting man spread his arms wide and stomped his feet, and his words drifted above the gunfire. Stephanie heard a few garbled words of old magic, and then someone on the wall was shouting, It's down! The shield is down! The warlock's energy beams carved great scars into the wall. Smaller darts of energy flew like angry insects, poking against the battlements. A sniper who had leaned too far screamed, dropped his rifle, and staggered back, clutching his face. He fell to one knee, then toppled onto his side and went limp. When his hands fell, half of his melted face went with them. The sense of calm evaporated. They still had the high ground, and they still had their defences. But soldiers were now ducking as they moved, scurrying from one vantage point to the next. Those beams of white energy tore chunks from solid stone. Ashon had her rifle back, and she was popping up, taking a shot and then immediately ducking down again. Every time she popped up, it would be in a slightly different place. The warlocks had already identified her as a major threat. Her section of the wall was under constant bombardment. Stephanie glanced down in time to see the wretchling clear a space round a big man, maybe seven feet tall. His torso was glowing like it was being lit from within. He suddenly threw his shoulders back, and a whirling ball of energy shot out of his chest. It rose quickly, growing as it came. A few snipers tried taking shots at it. Elementals sent waves of air to shoo it off course. Neither of these had any effect. Vex let loose an energy stream of his own, but it hit the ball and passed through. And still the whirling mass of white rose towards the top of the wall, and it slowed and hung there. Back! Skullduggery roared. Everyone, back! The ball exploded with a deafening crack. The blast lifted Stephanie off her feet and flung her over the railing. Screaming, she started to fall to the city streets below, and a hand snagged her ankle, and she swung to the wall and slammed into it. She hung there, upside down, unable to even blink. The grip on her ankle was tight. Blood rushed to her head. She was pulled up, and a hand clutched her leg and kept pulling. And now the hands were on her hips, and she was pulled under the railing and back onto the wall. She turned over, shaking, expecting skullduggery or Dexter, instead finding a cleaver, just another anonymous cleaver. Thank you, she gasped. The cleaver picked up a scythe and went to help an injured sorcerer, and within moments she couldn't tell him apart from all the other cleavers. Rubble littered the walkway. A chunk of the wall was missing, and great clouds of dust rose like smoke. She saw Skullduggery looking for something. She waved to him, watched him visibly relax and then turn away, getting back to work. Stephanie got up, went back to the wall. Something hit the merlon beside her, spraying her with chips of rock, a metal dart buried in the stone, trailing a rope of white energy. She peered over the edge. More of these darts shot into the wall, fired from the hands of warlocks in a burst of white. Once attached, 
the warlock secured the other end to the ground, and the rope went taut. Stephanie ducked as a dart skimmed her cheek. She glanced again a moment later, saw dozens of these energy ropes in place. What were they hoping to do? Pull the wall down? Instead, the warlock stepped away, and the wretchlings ran forward. They jumped onto the ropes with their bare feet, and they kept running. Like overeager tightrope walkers, sprinting up the steep incline like this was a Sunday morning jog, the shout went out. Bursts of gunfire sent wretchlings falling, but there seemed to be a limitless supply, and by now the warlocks were keeping the snipers busy with their energy beams. Stephanie reached over her shoulder and took hold of the stick. It buzzed lightly in her hand. She took another look at the wretchlings. They were getting close. A few sorcerers were trying to cut the energy ropes with no success. Others still hit the ropes with their swords, trying to dislodge the dozens of wretchlings running up each of them. It was no use. And then the wretchlings were upon them. One of them scrambled over the wall in front of Stephanie. The first thing to hit her was the stench, rotting meat and putrefaction. The second was his fist, a blistered thing of mismatched knuckles. She used the stick to hit him back in a burst of blue light, then turned to the battlement as another wretchling crawled up. She jabbed him in the throat and then pushed, forcing him backwards. He screamed and vanished and she turned again, ducked a curved sword that whistled for her head. The wretchling came forward, slashing wildly, his face contorted with hatred. She blocked clumsily, giving ground, then lunged. But he sidestepped, the hilt of the sword crunching against her head. She fell, biting her tongue, the world spinning around her. But her mind staying alert enough to curse herself. She rolled, the sword slicing across her side, but unable to get through her jacket. The wretchling jabbed at her and stabbed at her, and finally it occurred to him that maybe he should try going for the part of her that wasn't swathed in black. Stephanie blocked a slash at her head and swung for his body. But the curved blade parried the stick and took it from her hand. She dived on him fingers clawing at his face. His flesh was clammy and soft, like ripe fruit. They staggered against the railing, and she bit his neck, gagged on the foulness, and jammed her thumb in his eye. He screeched and pulled away, and she shoved at the same time, and he flipped backwards over the railing, falling to the streets below. The wretchlings were everywhere now, their swords clashing with the sides of the cleavers. Sorcerers took them on hand to hand when they had to, but ranged magic was preferred. Stephanie wiped her mouth and returned her stick to its place between her shoulder blades, then took the scepter from her bag. Black lightning flashed, and a wretchling who was just scrambling over the wall turned to dust, and the wind snatched that dust away in a swirling mass. The scepter fired again and again, wretchlings exploding like two thousand-year-old clay pots being dropped from a great height. Three more wretchlings bursting dryly apart, and then from the clouds of dust came a fourth, running straight at her. He took her off her feet, and she lost the scepter before she even hit the ground. He kicked her, and she rolled, then scrambled, grabbed him, got her legs under her even as he was trying to get free, and she stood, heaving him onto her shoulders with a roar, and ran for the battlements. She hit them, and he toppled off her and over the top, his scream quickly fading. Strong fingers grabbed her, turned her towards the hot breath of a wretchling, who punched at her quickly but ineffectively. She looked down, realized he had a small triangular knife in his fist that was searching for weak points. She grabbed his wrist, held on, feeling the skin shift beneath her grip, but his other hand was on her face, fingers digging into her eyes. She turned away, and the fingers came after her. One of them strayed too close to her mouth, and she bit down, heard the crunch of bone, and felt the spurt of hot blood and then the wretchling was wrenched away from her. A sorcerer had him round the throat, was hauling him to the railing. The wretchling twisted into him, plunged the knife into his gut half a dozen times in less than a second, and the sorcerer stumbled back, and the wretchling pushed him, and he fell screaming to the city below. Stephanie grabbed her stick, ran at him. The wretchling blocked her swing and snarled, she spat a mouthful of his own blood back into his face and kicked his knee, and then she slammed her stick into his head. The sigils weren't glowing any more. It was out of charge. She hit him again and again, knocking him out the old-fashioned way. He collapsed, 
and she fought the urge to throw up. She pushed aside a dead cleaver and pulled a scepter from beneath his body, then returned to the battlements. There weren't as many ropes as before. As she watched, one of them went from white to grey, and then it faded altogether. The handful of wretchlings who were halfway up fell, howling to the ground. The other ropes started to fade. There were no more wretchlings climbing them. When the last rope had faded, the warlocks retreated, and a cheer went up along the wall. Victory! Stephanie took a look at the dead and the dying. She looked at lifeless sorcerers and lifeless wretchlings and still cleavers, and the damage done by all that white energy. Her hip bled from where the knife had nicked her. Her right shoulder was on fire, torn muscles from when she'd lifted that wretchling. She tasted blood. Some of it was her own. Some of it wasn't. The warlock's first attack, and they'd repelled it. Victory indeed. She was assigned a room with a bed and a shower. She washed, groaning with aches and pains, and when she was done she went down for something to eat. Skullduggery came to see her as she sat alone. Stephanie looked up, but didn't say anything, waited for him to start. I heard you served a few lives, he said. That's what we do, isn't it? It's what myself and Valkyrie do. You kill defenseless girls. She nodded. I'm not arguing with you any more. I'm sorry? She took another bite, chewed and swallowed. I get that you hate me. Of course you hate me. I've done terrible things. Not as many horrible things as Valkyrie, but still. But that's not why you hate me. You hate me because I'm not her. And it's fine, if you want to continue like that. Then whenever you hear that I've done something good or nice, you can pretend to be surprised, because everyone knows you think I'm nothing but the evil version of Valkyrie. But I'm not the evil version of Valkyrie. Valkyrie is the evil version of Valkyrie. And now that I'm real, now that I'm a real person, I'm not going to hurt any more innocent people. Can she say the same? I'm going to get her back. How? You have no idea, do you? You're terrified that the next time you see her you'll have to kill her, because you'll have no other choice. So you can say all the mean things you want. It doesn't bother me. You're just scared. Skullduggery's head tilted, and he looked at her for the longest time before turning and walking away. She woke to shouts and sat up in the dark, her hand finding the scepter and holding it out in front of her. The shouts continued, and she threw back the covers, jammed her feet into her boots. She searched around for her jacket, pulled it on, made sure the stick was in place. As she walked to the door, she pulled the bag over one shoulder. She stepped out, saw four figures walking up the street towards her, and she went cold. Wraiths. Chapter 67 Wraiths Horrible, freaky things came through the darkness, and the dark and stormy night pulled on his mask and prepared for battle. There were screams in the distance, and flashes of light and gunfire, then more screams. The dark and stormy night would not scream. The dark and stormy night was this city's protector. Was it the one it needed? No, but it was the one it deserved. He crept out from hiding approaching one of these sinister figures from behind, and then he leaped, wrapping an arm round the figure's throat. Even as he applied the stranglehold, he could feel the terrible heat from the figure's skin seeping through the thin fabric of his skin-tight top. But he ignored the pain and tightened his hold. Pain meant nothing. Pain was transitory. Pain would fade. Only justice was forever. Justice and a little bit of this pain. Oh, this pain, oh, this hot, hot pain, pushing everything else from his mind. But only a few more seconds. He just needed to hang on for a few more seconds. The dark and stormy night released the stranglehold and staggered away, yelping as he shook his arm to cool it down. The figure turned to him slowly, as if it had just noticed him. Back up! he screeched. Where is my back up? The village idiot thundered into view, head down and arms out, yelling a war cry. 
he crunched into the figure from behind and folded like a cheap accordion. Useless. Then Grandmaster Ping arrived. Ping, said the dark and stormy knight. You go low, I go high. I have a new strategy, Ping called out. Run away! And that's just what Grandmaster Ping did. The dark and stormy night stared at him as he vanished into the shadows. Then the figure obstructed his view, and he stepped back, cornered. His mouth was suddenly dry. All his dreams, all his stupid ideas about being a hero, about being one of the good guys, none of it meant anything. He'd failed. He was a joke. They were right to laugh. He pulled the mask away. If he was going to die, he was going to die as Vorian scapegrace. A proud man in a proud woman's body, not as some pathetic joke. The figure reached for him, and a golden stream of energy hit it, sent it staggering. Sheriff Decane and another man strode towards him. The other man fired again, hitting the figure in the chest, driving it back. And then Decane raised his hand, and a stream of purple energy burrowed a hole through the figure's head. It keeled over and didn't get up. Scapegrace let out the breath he'd been holding, his legs almost collapsing beneath him. Interesting, Decane said, standing over the figure's body. You can hurt it, but I can kill it. His companion nodded. Must be something to do with the power level of your energy. I'll spread the word. He took off, and Decane looked at Scapegrace. You again. It might be best if you stayed indoors tonight. We got a wraith infestation to deal with, and we can't afford to have civilians running around. It's a surefire way to get yourself killed. Scapegrace nodded quickly. Okay. You might want to pick up your boyfriend while you're at it. He's not my boyfriend. Well, whatever he is, he can't just lie around in the street like that. It's a public safety issue. Scapegrace hurried over to Thrasher, kicked him in the side. Thrasher groaned, opened his eyes. Master? Get up, Scapegrace commanded, and take off that ridiculous mask. Thrasher did as he was told, as Decane's radio crackled into life, and the voice of the man who had just run off came through loud and clear. Multiple wraith attacks just north of your position, he said. I'm dealing with one of them, but there are three kids being chased along Amrita Street, and a woman with blue hair is cornered by the fountain. Over! Decane held the radio to his mouth. I'm taking Amrita Street, he said. Out! Wait, Scapegrace said. The woman with blue hair. That's Clarabelle. She's our friend. You have to help her. But Decane was already running. Sorry, he said. Kids come first. Scapegrace watched him go and turned to see Thrasher looking at him. Master? Scapegrace didn't know what to do. Thrasher was looking at him with that big, stupid face, and Scapegrace didn't know what to do. He swallowed. We help Clarabelle. They sprinted to the top of the street and turned right, towards the fountain in the square. The moment it came into view, Scapegrace wanted to run the other way. But then he saw Clarabelle. She had climbed into the fountain itself. Around her, three wraiths were closing in. Scapey! she yelled. Gerald! Help! We're coming! Thrasher yelled back. Scapegrace looked around, scanning their environment for a weapon, or an idea, or some kind of plan. He couldn't find anything. Master! A shout bubbled up from somewhere within him. Hey! he screamed. Hey, Race! Hey! Come get us! Thrasher joined in jumping up and down and waving his ridiculously muscled arms. One of the wraiths noticed them, started walking over. Now what do we do? Thrasher whispered. We lead it away, Scapegrace said. Look how slow it moves. It's walking. We can run. It'll never be able to... A breeze rustled through the square, and the wraith came apart like smoke, solidifying again right in front of Scapegrace. Scapegrace screamed as the wraith reached for him, and Thrasher lunged, his big fist clunking off the wraith's pale, angular cheekbone. 
the wraith barely noticed, yet Thrasher staggered away, clutching his hand, his knuckles burning. Scapegrace kicked at the wraith's knee, but missed, and a supporting foot slid out from under him and he fell. The wraith looked down at him, then raised its head. Scapegrace craned his neck, the world upside down, and saw someone walking towards them. He rolled over. The black cleaver approached. Thrasher grabbed Scapegrace's arm and dragged him out from under the wraith, hauled him to his feet as the black cleaver pulled out his scythe. The wraith observed the cleaver like he was a species it had never encountered before. Behind it, the other two wraiths abandoned their pursuit of Clarabelle and started walking over. The cleaver moved, his scythe flashing, and the first wraith's hand fell to the ground. There was no blood, no pain, and the wraith looked at its stump without emotion. The cleaver whirled, taking the wraith's right leg off of the knee. The wraith fell, tried to get up, and the black cleaver took its head. But even that didn't stop it. While the black cleaver turned to face the other two, Scapegrace stepped forward, kicking the disembodied head away from the wraith's grasping hand. It wasn't that long ago that he himself had been a head, but he didn't feel bad about what he'd just done. Let the wraith put itself back together on its own time. The remaining wraiths became smoke that blew apart, coming together again on either side of the black cleaver as he spun, ducking under their attempts to grab him. The scythe caught the crescent moon and sliced through the throat of one of them. It lurched, its head lolling back, held in place by a flap of pale skin. The last wraith caught the cleaver's arm. Scapegrace heard the snap of bone, but the cleaver didn't even flinch. He rammed the top of his helmet into the wraith's face, broke its leg with a single stump and drove it to its knees, and wrenched his arm loose. Then he gave a little jump back, as he brought his scythe up and over, and the blade embedded itself in the wraith's head with a solid thunk. Scapegrace and Thrasher watched in awe as the black cleaver pulled his scythe free and the wraith crumpled sideways. There was a scream somewhere off to their left, but without a word the black cleaver was gone. Clarabel hurried over. The water from the fountain had drenched her, but she didn't seem to notice. You rescued me, she said, her big eyes bright. Well, said Scapegrace, it wasn't really us. You rescued me, she insisted. You really are my friends. Of course we are, said Thrasher. The wraiths were slowly turning to smoke, and that smoke was linking up with its missing body parts. Scapegrace didn't want to be around when they solidified. We should go, he said. Clarabel clamped a hand over her mouth as they hurried away. I've never had friends before, she said. Not really. I had one. We grew up together. Everyone thought we hated each other. But I just assumed that she was imaginary, and she assumed I was imaginary, so we never spoke to each other when there were other people around. Thrasher hesitated. Sounds reasonable. But she died thirty years ago said Clarabel. So I've had thirty years without a friend, and now, now I have two of the best friends in the whole world. I'm the luckiest girl ever. Roarhaven was full of empty buildings, just waiting to be filled by an influx of sorcerers who wanted to be part of the first capital city of sorcerers. Scapegrace led them into one of these buildings, closed the door behind them, and barricaded it. We'll wait here, he whispered. Maybe by morning they'll be gone. Caravel, what were you even doing out here alone? There's a war on. We were told to stay indoors. I was looking at houses, Clarabel said. I was told I could choose one to live in. Because I work for the sanctuary and everything, I don't like any of them, though. None of them feel like home. I don't think this place will ever feel like home. Why don't you just live with us? Thrasher asked. Clarabelle's eyes widened. Could I? Scapey? Could I live with you? Scapegrace peered out through the window, making sure the wraiths hadn't followed them. Sure, he said. 
Why not? Clarabel hopped up and down, but Thrasher managed to get his hand over her mouth before she started squealing. When she was done, she whirled, grabbed Thrasher in a hug. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. My two best friends ever. Gerald, my dear, sweet Gerald, you risked everything to save me. You have the heart of a lion. Thrasher beamed. You think so? I do, she whirled again. It's Scapy, my dear Scapy. When I looked up and saw you running towards me, I just knew everything was going to be all right. I knew you'd save me. You're my hero. Scapegrace blinked at her. He was her hero. He stood a little straighter. His chest didn't need any puffing out, but he puffed it out anyway. He was her hero. Oh, master, Thresher said, his eyes wide. Shut up, said Scapegrace. Do you know what this means? Be quiet. It means you didn't have to learn Kung Fu. You didn't have to put on a mask. You didn't have to be the dark and stormy night. Master, you were a hero all along. Yes, Scapegrace snapped. I got that. I realized that myself. But now you've taken a moment of personal triumph and validation, and you've ruined it by making it obvious. Thrasher's face fell. Oh. Stand over there and don't speak for the rest of the night. Thrasher turned and slouched towards the corner. Idiot. Chapter 68 Black Smoke, White Flame The wraiths were gone by morning, but the dawn brought with it a fresh bombardment. Those floating balls of energy drifted to the wall and did their damage there or beyond. Watchtowers fell. Majors and cleavers were killed by the blasts or more likely falling masonry. A few explosions rocked the city itself, damaging houses and other dwellings, though casualties here were not as high as they could have been. After the night of horror they'd just witnessed, most citizens of Lorehaven were moving towards the sanctuary and away from the wall. An exact death toll had yet to be calculated. The wraiths had retreated before the sun came up, but there had been reports all morning of people missing as well as dead. Stephanie remembered a time when she didn't need sleep. As a reflection, all she'd had to do to regain her strength was to step into the mirror, and she'd emerge like a freshly charged battery. But now that she was a person, eating and drinking and sleeping took up so much of her time, she felt sure she was doing it wrong. She ate breakfast and checked the scepter. The black crystal was still glowing as fiercely as ever, and she wondered if it ever needed to be recharged. Her stick did. It hung between her shoulder blades, solid and heavy and reassuring, but utterly devoid of magic. It had saved her life, though, and she wasn't about to throw it away simply because it didn't keep its stun effect for long. Bane and O'Callaghan were comparing bruises when she found them and together they went to the top of the wall. Skullduggery was already up there with Vex and Saracen and General Mantis. Everyone moved hunched over. The warlock's aim was improving. They've been at this for hours, Vex said as another explosion rocked the wall. How long before they get bored, do you reckon? Before or after the wall topples over. We need to take the offensive, said Saracen. We need to get our people down there. General, Skullduggery said. Tell the others your suggestion. Mantis swiveled its gas mask towards them. I thank you. Some of you may have noticed that our enemy leaves itself vulnerable when it attacks. Its number is split into three. The retchlings are closest to the wall, twelve thousand of them. Beyond them, warlock energy throwers, twenty in all and behind them Caravari has been glimpsed sitting on the hill with approximately fifty wretchlings and a further twenty warlocks. That is our opportunity. You want to go after him? Gracious asked. Three cloaking spheres ought to conceal my troops, Mantis said, nodding. 
I am sure Grand Mage Ravel has one or two secret exits from which we could leave the city. We would then move around behind them, attack from the rear, and either kill or capture Caravari. Vex frowned. And if you noticed, the attacking force will return and you'll be wiped out. If the attacking force notices, that will be your signal to open the gates and charge at the wretchlings. Without Caravari to issue commands, they will find themselves fighting a battle on both sides. Stephanie didn't know if her words would be welcomed here, but someone had to say it. There are more of them than there are of us. Surprise is a sharp weapon to wield, Mantis replied. But you need not engage them fully. You would just have to sow enough confusion to allow us to slip backwards, still under cover of the cloaking spheres. Then you would return to the safety of the wall and leave our enemy confused and standing in the middle of a field, not knowing which way to turn. In order to be ready at the gates, we'd need to drastically reduce our numbers on the wall, said Vex. The wretchlings could swarm us. I did not claim this plan to be without risk. If it goes wrong, Saracen said, you'll be out there alone. We won't be able to get to you, and warlocks aren't known for taking prisoners. Death comes for us all, but I do not believe we will fail. A few days ago, Mantus was the enemy, alien and unknowable. Today it was a friend, and Stephanie didn't want to see it risking its life on something so dangerous. What does his highness say about this? Vex asked. Ravel doesn't get a say, Skullduggery responded. On this wall, I'm in command. Mantis has a plan, and it's a good one, and I'm inclined to agree to it, unless anyone here has a reason why I shouldn't. Stephanie could see it in their eyes. They wanted to object, but they didn't have a choice. Okay, then, Skullduggery said. General... Prepare your people. Mantis gave a sharp salute and left them where they crouched. It's suicide, said Donegan. Maybe, said Skullduggery. But if it works, this battle is over. And if it doesn't, we're down half our number. Skullduggery looked out over the battlements. Fortune favours the bold. He who dares wins. The only easy day was yesterday. Signa in Ferimus. Take whichever slogan you like the most and lean on it. That's how you get through decisions like this. Stephanie, stick. She frowned, took the stick from her back and handed it to him. He gripped it and the sigil started glowing again. He handed it back, fully charged, without saying anything. The morning passed without any more deaths. The bombardment slowed, as if the warlocks were getting tired. When the warlock had attacked Valkyrie and Skullduggery in that alleyway eighteen months before, he'd used up so much power that he'd tried to eat Valkyrie's soul in order to get his strength back. Stephanie didn't like to think about what the warlocks outside the gate would have to do to get their energy up again, but she certainly didn't want to see it. She found a spot against the wall where she could sit and no one was going to trip over her and she closed her eyes and tried to doze. She woke to find a camera being shoved in her face. She recoiled, slapping it away. The cameraman adjusted focus as he hunkered down, and before she could rip the camera from his hands, another man joined him. She recognized him, the journalist, Kenny Dunn, and suddenly it all slipped into place. His annoying little investigation, Ravel's documentary crew. Of course they would find each other. Of course they would. Hi, Valkyrie, Kenny said. She couldn't be bothered to correct him. Remember me? You questioned me about Paul Lynch's murder a year and a half ago. Skullduggery pretended he was a cop. Detective Inspector me? Remember that? I'm Kenny Dunn, and this is Patrick Slattery. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking to us. Talking to you about what? Stephanie asked holding her hand in front of the lens and turning her face away. Seriously, stop filming me. 
Valkyrie, this is your chance to set the record straight. This is your chance to tell your side of it. Side of what? Of everything, said Kenny. Of everything that's going on. We've been here for days, in among these people, and we don't understand them. We can't. They're all hundreds of years old, and yet they look better than we do. They can do magic and shoot laser beams from their hands and throw fireballs, and and we can't wrap our heads around any of that. But you, you're one of them. But you're also one of us. You don't know anything about me, she said, and stood up. They stood with her. I know plenty, Kenny said. These people call you Valkyrie. But I know you as Stephanie Edgley, eighteen years old, from Haggard in North County Dublin. Recently left school and is considering college. According to your old teachers, you're a bright girl who holds herself back for some reason. Your classmates liked you, even though they viewed you as a little weird. The anger rose in her throat. You talk to my friends? A few of them, said Kenny. Don't worry, I didn't make it obvious. I'm a journalist. Getting information out of people is what I do. She grabbed her bag, went to walk off. Go pick on someone else, would you? I'm not picking on you, Stephanie. I'm trying to tell your story. She turned to him. What's this for? A documentary. The Grand Mage believes that the normal world will find out about sorcerers soon enough, and we want to use this documentary to answer questions and allay fears. That's what Ravel wants. Yes. He's lying. He's a murderer and a traitor, and he wants to take over. Everyone in Warhaven does. They want to rule the mortals because they think the mortals are inferior. But I've seen what that's like. I've been to a world where sorcerers rule the planet and the mortals. The normal people like you are slaves. That's all they are. So this little documentary of yours, Kenny, will be used to calm them down while Ravel gets things organised. You're going to help him take over the world. The Grand Mage explained all this to us, Kenny said, shaking his head. There's been a huge misunderstanding. He doesn't want to take over, he wants to coexist. He says once the warlocks are defeated, he'll talk to you and make you see that. See them, she said, pointing over the wall of the warlocks. They were meant to attack Dublin. Ravel's been planning this for years. He set the mortals up. But it's all gone wrong. And instead of attacking the poor defenceless mortals, the warlocks are here, attacking us. Stephanie, you don't have all the information. I sat down with the Grand Mage and talked about... He lied to you, Kenny. Hasn't anyone ever lied to you before? Then why are you fighting alongside him if he's so bad? Because the warlocks have to be stopped. That's what the Grand Mage said. That's all he wants. No, it isn't. But none of this will make it into the documentary, will it? You'll either edit it out or Ravel will. So what's the point of talking to you? Because this might be your last chance to tell your family you love them, Kenny said gently. If you have a message for them, I can make sure they get it if something happens to you. Stephanie leaned forward. My family know I love them. If I needed a documentary to tell them that, then I don't deserve the opportunity. Resisting the urge to take the camera and hurl it over the side, she walked over to where Skullduggery was standing as N.J. conjured up another magnifying window between the battlements. When N.J. saw Stephanie, she smiled. Hi. Stephanie grunted. I was in the sanctuary earlier, N.J. said, apparently unaware that a grunt was meant to indicate an unsociable attitude. Fletcher's awake. The doctors say he'll be able to teleport in a day or so. Stephanie frowned. You know Fletcher? Oh, yes, said N.J., and then her smile faltered. I mean, not well, we're not close or anything, we're just friends. Not even good friends, just ordinary ones. Ordinary friends. I have a boyfriend. Well, I don't. But if I did, I mean, it's not that... N.J., Skullduggery said, could you please stop talking and finish what you're doing? Yes, N.J. said, blushing. Sorry. A moment later, she was done. There, she said. Sorry again about the babbling. Sometimes I babble. I don't mean to, but I babble. I do. I'm trying to stop. Or at least cut down. It's not easy. Once I babble so much... N.J., Stephanie said sharply. Thank you for your help. You can go now. Go check in Fletcher. There's a good girl. 
Enje nodded, smiled, and ran off. Skullduggery peered through the magnifying window. I see you were talking to Kenny, he said. Stephanie didn't look at him as she answered. They're making a documentary. That's what they think they're doing anyway. It's just propaganda that Ravel's going to use. What did you say? Nothing much. He probably thinks you're her. Yeah, I got that. But don't worry. So long as you're around to constantly remind me that I'm not good enough, it shouldn't go to my head. Has Mantis reached them yet? Save yourself, Skullduggery said, stepping to one side. Stephanie peered through the window. She could see nothing different. Caravari and his warlocks were still on that hill with those wretchlings, still focusing on the wall. She moved slightly, just in time to watch a sentry being yanked backwards and vanishing. They're there, Stephanie said, whispered, actually. Skullduggery nodded, looking through the window with her. Mantis's invisible army had sneaked right up on the hill without being noticed. Another sentry was lost to sight. Any moment now, the army would charge. Any moment. Warlocks and wretchlings vanished as a wave of invisibility swept over them, leaving only empty tents. From where Stephanie stood, there was no hill that seemed more peaceful. But down there, she knew, within those bubbles of invisibility, a battle was raging and people were dying. Blood was being spilled. Limbs were being shattered. Lives were being ended. A fireball burst outside of the bubble. A stream of white energy emerged from midair, high above the hill, fading to nothing the further it travelled. A stream of purple energy carved a furrow in the grass. So far, the warlocks attacking the wall hadn't noticed that their commander and his company had disappeared. How long will it take? Stephanie asked. Skullduggery turned his head fractionally. To subdue fifty wretchlings and twenty warlocks? I don't know. The warlocks would be Caravari's personal guard. So the best and the toughest, then? He didn't say anything. They stayed there, watching the hill while the slow bombardment of the wall continued. Stephanie lost track of time. She started looking around, shifting her position to look through the magnification window at the wretchlings. She found them fascinating, artificial creatures, just like she had once been. Something's happening, Skullduggery said, his voice low. She looked back at the hill as, one by one, the cloaking spheres collapsed, revealing the dead and the injured and the captured. Oh, no, said Stephanie, and her insides went cold. From where she stood, she had a wonderful view of the hill, and could clearly make out General Mantis and its soldiers on their knees and surrounded by warlocks. That evening, Stephanie watched the wretchlings drive stakes into the ground, all in a line that stretched from one side of the field to the other. The prisoners were brought forward, and each one was chained in place. Mantis itself was chained to the stake directly before the gates. Stephanie saw Regis stand there as well, and Ashone. She was hurt. She could barely stay upright. The warlocks stood behind the line, watching the wall silently. Caravari stepped between them, until he was the only one out in the open. He was pale and bald and tall. Taller than Mevolent had been, certainly. Maybe ten feet tall, with scars that crisscrossed his muscles. He looked at the wall, maybe counting the cracks and the gaps, maybe calculating how much longer it'd stay up. He didn't say anything. He didn't shout up threats or insults. He didn't wave any flags or make any gestures. When he was satisfied, he walked back through the line, the warlocks parting from him. Moments later, white energy started to glow in the hands of his soldiers. Get ready, Skullduggery called. Snipers, take aim. Try not to hit any of our own. But the barrage didn't come. Instead, the glowing energy started to flicker, become white flames. Stephanie felt the alarm that rippled along the wall, but she didn't understand it. She didn't understand it until the prisoners began burning.
There were horrified cries beside her as the screams reached them. The prisoners strained against their bonds, but there was no escape. Mantis writhed on its stake like an insect in a frying pan. Rifle, Skullduggery said. Then, rifle! He snatched a gun from someone, put the stock to his shoulder and fired. Mantis jerked back and sagged against its chains. Skullduggery shot the next man over, then the next. Then he shot Regis, caught him in the chest, stopped his screaming. Ashon was rolling on the ground, trying to stamp out the flames. It took two shots to end her agony. By now, the other snipers along the wall had taken up the responsibility. Each shot took the life of a fellow soldier, and gradually the screaming grew less, and then stopped altogether. The bodies continued to burn. Black smoke rising from white flames. Chapter 69 Quiet Moments Night fell. The energy throwers roamed the streets, waiting for the raids to come back. Stephanie stayed upon the wall. She couldn't sleep, not after what she'd seen. Her insides were knots sliding in acid. Her mouth was always dry, no matter how much water she drank. Fear, she supposed. This was true fear. She didn't like it much. Losing Mantis and its army like that, that was a blow. That was a serious blow, and not just to their numbers. There were no smiles upon the wall, no jokes, no matter how bleak. Losing Mantis had robbed them of their humour. This was probably what hopelessness felt like. She looked north, out over the dark countryside. Dublin was north, and north of Dublin, haggard. Her family, lying in bed, asleep, no idea that their fate was being decided out here under the sickle-bladed moon. She wanted nothing more than to be in her own bed in her own room, and not for the first time. She wondered how Valkyrie could have done this for all those years. There was nothing brave about it, nothing noble. Valkyrie had chosen magic and danger over her family, and that was something Stephanie could not understand. She wouldn't be here if she had any other option. You're really not her, said Fletcher. She turned. He stood there, pale in the moonlight. I'd never have been able to sneak up on Valkyrie, he said. I'd have had to teleport right behind her. But she'd have known. Whether she'd hear something, or feel it in the air, or just sense that someone was behind her, you know, that way sometimes you just know you're being watched. Or maybe you don't. Maybe it's a human thing. I'm human, Stephanie said. If you cut me, do I not bleed? If you poison me, do I not die? And if you wrong me, shall I not have revenge? Fletcher looked at her. Did you just make that up? She smiled softly. It's Shakespeare. Kind of. I changed it a little, paraphrased. Oh, that's right, said Fletcher. You've got full access to all your memories, don't you? She nodded. Everything I ever read, or Valkyrie ever read, or heard, or saw, or did, it's why I'm so good at exams. Are you feeling better? He shrugged. Still shaky, but I'm okay. Woke up a few hours ago, and no one would tell me what was going on. I have to admit, I didn't think Ravel would still be in charge. Well, apparently it's complicated, said Stephanie. It's all about seizing the right time. If it were me, I'd just go right up to him and turn him to dust. Yeah, you're good at that, aren't you? His voice was tired and lacking venom, but his eyes were still full of hurt and anger. I did what I did so that I could live, she said. It was self-defense. It was murder, and it was attempted murder. You tried to kill Valkyrie. She never loved you, Fletcher. That's got nothing to do with it. Stop treating her like she's perfect. He laughed. Oh, I know she's not perfect. I know she's... You know she's selfish, Stephanie cut in, and vain and egotistical, and you know she's uncaring. But look at you. 
you'd go back to her in an instant if she asked. Even if you knew that she was just with you for something to do, you'd fall in love with her all over again. You've forgiven her for cheating on you. You've forgiven her for treating you like an annoying, lovesick puppy. I really don't need to be insulted by you, Fletcher said, and started walking away. I would never cheat on you, she said, before she could stop herself. Fletcher stood still. She looked at his back. Her face was burning. She was blushing. She tried to fight it, tried to regain control and push down this horrible feeling of embarrassment. But every push made the feeling spill over even more. Fletcher turned. I don't understand you, he said. You're not... Don't say I'm not real. Don't say I'm not human. But you're not, he said, almost angrily. You came out of a mirror. You're a stand-in. You're a... a weak imitation of the real thing. Good, said Stephanie. I'm glad I'm a weak imitation. I wouldn't want to be a good one, because then I wouldn't care what you thought. I've grown, Fletcher. I'm more than I was. You're a killer, he said, and Stephanie darted forward, grabbed his arm before he could leave. And I regret it, she said. I'm sorry I did it. I'm sorry I had to do it. Feeling bad doesn't make it okay. But feeling bad is new to me. Feeling anything is new to me. I still don't know how to deal with it. It's scary and ugly and makes me feel sick most of the time, but... Fletcher, please, don't treat me like a thing. Then how should I treat you? After everything you've done? How should I treat you? She looked at him, into his eyes. Like a girl, she said, and kissed him. He shook his head. You're not... You're not her. No? She kissed him again. I'm me. The breeze picked up, and the smell of rotting meat wafted to them. Ratchlings! Someone bellowed. They're coming! Her heart lurching in her chest, Stephanie ran to the parapet. The darts were being fired, trailing white ropes. And now the wretchlings came, emerging from the gloom running up those ropes like demented acrobats, knives and swords and war hammers in their hands, swarming like ants over dropped food. She whipped her head round to Fletcher. The energy throwers are in the streets. We need them up here. Get as many as you can. Fletcher nodded and vanished. Stephanie pulled a scepter from her bag, took aim, and black lightning cleared four wretchlings from the nearest rope. But there were more behind. There were always more. She leaned out to get a better shot, only noticing the floating ball of energy at the last moment. She turned away, squeezed her eyes shut, heard the explosion as the blast picked her up and tossed her away like just another piece of rubble. She crunched to the ground, rolled three times and came to a groaning stop. Skullduggery stood on the battlements, sending great gusts of wind to knock the wretchlings from their ropes. Every few seconds he'd have to dodge to one side to avoid an energy stream from down below, but then he'd get right back to it. A handful of other elementals on the wall followed his example. Some of them weren't so effective. Others weren't so good at dodging. Despite their efforts, the first wretchling came over the wall, and others followed. Stephanie blasted one of them to dust and got to her feet. Three came at her. She got the first two, but the third grabbed the scepter pushed it back while his other hand closed round Stephanie's throat. He had boils all over his face and a dagger in his belt. She pulled the dagger out and stuck it into his side. He made a sound like an angry cat and pushed her back further. She clawed at his face, bursting the boils, then slipped her finger into his mouth, her nails scraping by his clenched teeth. Curling her finger, she raked it out, felt his cheeks split open in a spray of blood and pus. He howled, recoiled, and she jammed the scepter against his jaw, and it flashed, and he exploded into dust. A flurry of movement, and she ducked, spun, ran, retchlings right behind her, their hands snatching at her hair, at her jacket, pulling the stick from her back. Too many to fight, their blades too close. 
Skullduggery! She roared, running for the ledge, unable to stop. And they grabbed her, and she jumped, and they all went over. Stephanie plummeted. Below was darkness sprinkled with streetlights. The wind whipped away the screams of the wretchlings before they reached her. She turned over as she fell, watching them fall with her, their eyes wide and mouths open, terror etched on their faces, their eyes fixed on the ground below. And then someone else was falling between them, the skull betraying no emotion as gloved hands found her, and she slid into his arms and Skullduggery looped up, leaving the wretchlings to continue the descent while Stephanie held on for dear, sweet life. He set her down on a rooftop across the street from the wall. Her legs were shaky, and every nerve was jangling, and all she wanted to do was collapse. But she narrowed her eyes as he hovered over her. Am I missing something? You've done enough, he said. Go back to Haggard. I can help. We're going to lose. No, we can use the accelerator. Start boosting magic. And when that happens, there's going to be a lot of unstable people looking to do violent things. Whether we win or lose, Roarhaven isn't safe. But I have the scepter. And someone's going to kill you for it. Stephanie, go home. You can't help us any more. If we fail, you'll need to protect your family. No, I can't. I don't have time to argue. Valkyrie, please, for once in your life, do what I say. She looked up at him. I'm not Valkyrie. His head dipped, the brim of his hat cutting across his brow like a frown. And then he rose higher. Good luck, he said, and flew back to the wall. Chapter 70 Supercharged They kept coming, a never-ending stream of wretchlings. By morning the dead were three deep up on that wall, and then their focus shifted, and they stopped trying to get over the wall and just came through it. The gates opened with a great splintering crack, and wretchlings and warlocks swarmed in, and the sanctuary mages met them. Magic was tossed to and fro, and men and women went down screaming. But up close, it was battle the old-fashioned way. Blood and blade and grunts and spittle. Vex hated the old-fashioned way. A wretchling with a face like a battered shovel came at him with a sword in his fist. Vex knocked the sword to one side, tried to swing his own. But there were too many people around, too much jostling for space. He almost apologized for the delay. Hold on there like a good fellow and I'll kill you the moment I'm able. Nice weather for it, eh? Suddenly his arm had space and he jabbed out, puncturing the wretchling's chest and shoulder and throat with the tip of his blade. Someone shoved him and he knocked the wretchling to the ground. Vex stood on him, kicked him, stabbed him a little more until a warlock barreled through roaring curses in some language Vex neither knew nor was interested to learn. Still too tight to really swing, Vex could only bash the opposing sword with his, making sure it didn't get too close. The crowd around them surged in all directions at once, and Vex found himself pressed up against the warlock with his hands trapped below him. The warlock had one arm pinned to his side, the other crushed against his own chest. They head-butted each other while they waited for a space to open up. The warlock had a great big beard. Vex bit the beard and pulled back, and the warlock roared in displeasure. The beard tasted horrible. Vex slipped on something and went under, cursing, suddenly lost in a forest of legs and boots that threatened to trample him into the ground. He tried to rise, got a knee in the face that knocked him sideways, finally reached up and grabbed hold of someone and dragged himself towards the light. He broke the surface, pressed the point of his sword under the bearded man's chin, and thrust skywards. The sword jarred a little when it hit the underside of the man's skull, and he pulled it out again. The fighting was spreading out a bit, now that the sudden, illogical eagerness for death and dying had abated. Energy crackled in Vex's hand and he blasted a warlock who was about to do the same to him. A wretchling leaped over Dime Avery, 
who was rolling around in the dirt with a warlock, and came at him with a swing that would have taken his head off if he hadn't blocked. Their swords clashed again and scraped off each other, screeching like fingernails on a chalkboard. Vex pushed him back, hacked at his arm, cleaving through muscle and bone. The wretchling's sword fell, still gripped by his hand, and Vex slashed downwards into his throat. The wretchling died standing, then toppled backwards, ripping Vex's weapon from his hands. A sword caught him across the back, would have cut through to his spine were it not for Ghastly's clothes. He turned, grabbing onto the warlock who powered into him. They went down in a tangle of arms and legs. God, this one was heavy. Vex tried pushing him off, and it was like pushing a wall of muscle. He poured his magic into his hand and unleashed it into the man's ribs, and the warlock grunted and rolled sideways. His clothes were armored too, though, and he got to his feet a fraction of a second behind Vex, and he still had the sword. He stepped in and swung, knocking Vex back. Vex pushed a wretchling into the warlock's next swing and grabbed his dagger as he died. He slashed at the warlock's throat, missed, and the warlock went low and took his leg out from under him. Vex rolled to avoid the sword that clanged off the ground next to his ear, wondered if the warlock's boots were armored. He plunged the dagger into his foot, got a screech in return. Obviously not. Vex threw himself between the man's legs, ignoring the sword strikes his clothes absorbed. The warlock started to hop about, trying to get at him, but Vex stayed on his knees, scurrying about underneath, keeping his head tucked below the warlock's groin. Not the most dignified of ways to fight a battle, perhaps, but since when had dignity ever kept a man alive? Someone dropped a war hammer, and he dived at it, swung without looking. The hammer crunched into the side of the warlock's knee. The knee caved in sideways, and the warlock screamed, toppled, landed on his elbows, still screaming. Vex stood. The warlock screamed up at him, and the war hammer met his face and brooked no argument. He turned to another warlock, who backed away. His eyes focused on something behind him. Vex risked a glance, found himself staring along with someone else. Six sorcerers hovered in the air, smiling. Vex recognized two of them. They had not been able to fly the last time they'd met. The accelerator-boosted mages sent columns of air rippling towards the enemy, so fiercely that they snapped bones and ruptured skin. They threw fire like napalm, and Vex had to scramble to avoid being caught in the inferno. Flesh melted and dripped to the ground as the screams rose to the skies. The six sorcerers landed and strode towards the enemy, each one of them keeping the smile on their face. Wretchling and warlock fell before them, and suddenly the unceasing tide through the gates slowed to a trickle. A wretchling jumped on one of the sorcerers, but increased strength seemed to be among the gifts the accelerator bestowed. The sorcerer laughed as he held the wretchling by the throat, legs kicking uselessly. He didn't even seem to care about the dagger in the wretchling's hand, at least not until it was buried up to its hilt in his neck. The wretchling was dropped, and the sorcerer fell to his knees, gurgling blood, a look of surprise on his face. Smiles faded on the faces of the other five sorcerers. A warlock caught one of them full on with a beam of energy. It took her head off. The remaining four roared in anger and swept forward in a bloody swathe of destruction. But the enemy had their measure now. They could be killed, and so they were. But as the last of the six sorcerers fell, another ten appeared in the sky above them, and none of these were smiling. Someone grabbed Vex from behind, and he whirled. But when his elbow crunched into flesh, he was standing on top of the wall. Fletcher, sorry, he said as the kid went stumbling. Saracen caught him, made sure he didn't fall. It's okay, Fletcher said, both hands to his face. I really should have expected that. Once he was sure he hadn't busted Fletcher's cheekbone, Vex joined Skullduggery and the monster hunters at the parapet, looking down. Each supercharged Roarhaven mage was dying, but they were taking down dozens of wretchlings before they went. Can't believe Erskine used the accelerator, he said. He knows it'll turn them nuts. 
As long as they're directed at the warlocks and not us, I'm not complaining, Gracious muttered. Then he frowned. Of course, it's only a matter of time before he does direct them at us, isn't it? Ravel will send them after us the moment the tide turns in Roarhaven's favour, Skullduggery said. By the looks of things, that could be any time in the next few hours. So we need to strike now, or rather, I do. Saracen looked at him. What? I need you all to stay here. One of us won't be missed, but any more than one and the alarm will be raised, and I'll never be able to get near him. So you're going up against Ravel alone? Donegan asked. Him and Mist and all their cronies? I won't be alone, Skullduggery said, and it's our best chance to catch him unprepared. Saracen shook his head. Splitting up again. How many times do I have to tell you what a bad idea that is? The dead men work best when we stay together. There is no dead men, Skullduggery said, sounding almost surprised that no one else had realised it. Ghastly and Anton have been murdered. Ravel's betrayed us. Valkyrie is gone. The dead men have had their last stand, and we've fallen, Saracen. The three of us are all that remain. The sounds of war faded for a moment as that quiet, simple fact settled into Vex's mind. They'd lost members before, but never so many, and they'd never lost one to betrayal. He looked at Saracen and Skullduggery, his friends, his brothers, and although they had history that would hold them together forever, he could feel the bonds between them start to loosen and fall away. Suddenly Saracen Rue looked old and tired, and Skullduggery Pleasant came into focus as what he really was, a genius a killer, a tortured soul, and the only true dead man among them. Chapter 71 In the Sanctuary China stepped over the sorcerer's unconscious body and sat at the desk, the monitors before her arranged like a shrine to voyeurism. Rooms, corridors, entrances and exits, all of them displayed in glorious, pixel-perfect definition. She found a card, wrote down the unconscious sorcerer's name, Susurus, and the password she'd got out of him, My Dog Rex One, and left. In here, deep in the sanctuary, she couldn't hear the explosions at the wall. She couldn't hear the fighting or the screams or the battle cries. She could see the tension on the faces of the people she passed, though. Everyone walked quickly. Everyone spoke urgently. These were Roarhaven mages, people who had been part of Ravel's plan from the very beginning. It amused her to see them panicking. It made her smile. She checked her watch. It was a delicate thing, thoroughly unsuited to what was to come. But she had to make do with what she had available to her. Gone were the days when she could afford the luxury of choosing a specific watch for a specific purpose. Ever since Eliza Scorn had destroyed her apartment and most of her belongings, China had been forced to adopt a more practical approach to life. She acquitted herself well, as one would expect, but that didn't mean she liked it. As the appointed minute clicked into being, Skullduggery Pleasant walked round the corner, holding a carved wooden stick. The face he wore was grave and humorless, the kind of face a person wouldn't want to examine too closely. Without even acknowledging his existence, China turned and started walking. He fell into step beside her, and they made their way to the cells. When Ghastly and Anton Shudder had been murdered, these cells were quickly filled by the sorcerers who tried to fight back. Once the warlocks attacked, however, most of these sorcerers were released so that they could fight under Skullduggery's command. Most, but not all. Skullduggery let his facade melt away and opened the first two cells they came to. Tipstaff, he said. Mr. Weeper, would you care to lend a hand in exacting a little justice? Staven Weeper emerged first. Young and a little too earnest for China's liking, he had nonetheless tried to attack Ravel on three separate occasions for what the Grand Mage had done. That earned him a few points in China's book. 
and so she did her best to ignore the way he mewled like a kitten when he saw her. Tipstaff, the ex-administrator, stepped out and nodded to both her and Skullduggery. Ever the professional, he got straight to the point. By justice, he said, I assume you mean bringing Erskine Ravel to task for the crimes he has committed. You assume correctly, Skullduggery said, but we'll need your help to do it. Weeper looked suddenly worried. Uh, my magic isn't really combat-based. We know, China told him. We won't need you to fight. Then I'm your man, Weeper said immediately. Or I'd like to be, if you'd have me. Because I love you. I love you so much. If I were married, I'd leave her for you. I'm not married, but I'd still leave her. Just say the word. Focus, Stephen. Yes, sorry. I love you, sorry. You must get that all the time. Sorry. Hush, boy, Tipstaff said. Detective Pleasant, Miss Sorrows, what do you need us to do? The terror and the scourge are being kept busy overseeing the boosting process in the accelerator room, said China, which leaves Ravel and Mist protected by Sick and Portia and the Black Cleaver. We need you to find them. Then call me with their location. She handed Tipstaff a card. That name and password will get you into the security room. Tipstaff gave a curt nod. We won't let you down, Weaver said. I vow to you, upon my very life, that I will succeed or die trying. There's really no need for... If I die, think of me fondly, Weaver said, his lower lip trembling. Tipstaff sighed and walked off towards the security room. Weeper dragged himself after him. That must get annoying, said Skullduggery. You have no idea, said China. They walked the opposite way, deeper into the sanctuary, avoiding large groups of mages if they could help it. No one stopped them. No one asked what their business was. Everyone was too concerned about the battle outside. I was on the wall earlier. China said. Not for long. I just wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I did see a little bit of fighting, however. I'm sure you're coming to a point, Skullduggery said. Naturally. The reflection that prefers to be called Stephanie. Such a curious thing. It reminded me of a black-clad Pinocchio, battling side by side with the boys, just like the real Valkyrie would be doing, were she not an evil world-breaker. Annoyed, are you? Skullduggery asked. That this little slice of information got by you? Somewhat, China admitted. All it would have taken was one sensitive who knew Valkyrie's face to have had a vision. I don't like being the last to know. In fact, I despise it. You can't know every little secret, China. But I want to. Do you know where she is? Valkyrie. If I knew, I'd be there right now. Instead, you have her doppelganger to occupy your time. Not any more. I sent her home to be with Valkyrie's family. Her? Sorry? The reflection. Stephanie. It's her her. Skullduggery didn't respond. There's nothing wrong with it being a her, China said. Especially now. And maybe Valkyrie would even be proud to know that some part of her is still capable of fighting the good fight even if she herself has fallen to the darker side of her nature. Her phone buzzed, and she answered. The Grand Mage and Elder Mist have just entered what would appear to be the new Hall of Remembrance, said Tipstaff. Sick and Portia have remained outside. And the Black Cleaver? China asked. We can't see him, said Tipstaff. We can see you, however. There was a brief scuffle, and then Weeper came on with, Hi, China! before Tipstaff regained control. Apologies, he said. As I was saying, we can see you. Continue down this corridor, take the second right, and then a lift. The entrance to the hall will be around the next corner. China hung up. We're close, she said, leading the way. They followed Tipstaff's directions, slowing as they approached the final corner. China pulled her hair back into a ponytail and Skullduggery took off his hat, 
laid it carefully on the ground beside the carved stick. They rounded the corner. At the far end of this corridor was a heavy door. Halfway between the door and the corner, Sick and Portia stood. What are you doing here? Sick asked, a sneer in his lips. The fighting is outside. Skullduggery didn't answer, and neither did China. They just kept walking. Portia's eyes narrowed. Sick, I think we're being betrayed. I think they mean to betray us. Finally, said Sick, his face lighting up. I've been wanting to pull them apart for ages. Portia and Sick stood side by side. China walked right up to Portia, and Skullduggery walked right up to Sick. Portia smiled, knees bending, getting ready to fight. At the last moment, Skullduggery darted across, smacked her in the jaw, and took her off her feet. Sick appeared frozen for a moment, and the sigils on China's knuckles flashed into his line of sight right before she broke his nose. He went stumbling, howling in pain. China kept close. She couldn't afford to let him regain his senses. Her fist crunched into his side, smashing ribs. Letting him regain his senses would mean letting him turn into a giant spider. Another punch, this one to the belly, forcing the air from his lungs. And letting him turn into a giant spider was not on the agenda. He tried to grab her, and she battered his arm away and drove an elbow into his temple. Not today. Sick went sideways, his face a bloody mess, his equilibrium shot to hell. She glanced back at Skullduggery, but he was already following Portia around the corner. Portia was not looking like her usual composed self. She looked positively disheveled. That's what China liked about these kinds of people, and she'd seen plenty of them in her time. Young, strong, vibrant, and cocky. Sick came at her, and she smashed his face into the wall. It was so satisfying, making them hurt. She tapped the sigil on her palm and planted her hand over his face. She felt the power snap through him, and his whole body jerked wildly, and he collapsed. She looked down. So, so satisfying. She allowed herself a moment to imagine how satisfying it was going to be doing the same to Eliza Scorn. She closed her eyes, relaxing. When she opened them, she walked to the corner and stopped. Portia was on the ground, motionless, her eyes closed. Unconscious or dead, China didn't know, didn't care. But walking up the corridor was the black cleaver, scythe ready. Skullduggery walked towards him, the carved stick lighting up in his hand. The cleaver moved in, straight for the kill. Skullduggery deflected the blade, and the cleaver whirled with a kick that Skullduggery avoided. The scythe flashed, sweeping in again and again, and Skullduggery blocked and moved and parried. The stick flashed whenever it struck the cleaver's reinforced uniform, its effects muted but noticeable. The more Skullduggery hit him, the warier the cleaver became, until he focused his efforts on taking the stick out of the equation. The scythe's handle smacked against Skullduggery's hand, and the stick dropped, went skittering across the floor. Immediately, Skullduggery grabbed him and slammed him against the wall, and the cleaver had to drop the scythe to free up his hands. They pushed away from the wall, and the tempo of the fight increased, both fighters getting the measure of the other. The cleaver, much like Tanith Lowe, was agile enough to jump and spin and throw extravagant, unexpected kicks, whereas Skullduggery was the down-to-word fighter he'd always been. Elbows and headbutts and grabs— he left the fancy stuff to other people. Always had. The cleaver caught a punch and drove his forearm into the back of Skullduggery's elbow. There was a sound, somewhere between a crack and a pop, and Skullduggery stumbled, his sleeve flapping. The black cleaver looked, almost in surprise, at the half an arm it now held in its grip. Skullduggery fell to his knees, groaning in pain. The cleaver dropped the arm and picked up his scythe and China stepped round the corner, her sigils glowing. But as the scythe swung down, a wave of darkness burst from Skullduggery, hurling the black cleaver into the far wall with enough force to shatter every bone in his body. China stepped back out of sight, but kept watch. The shadows hovered over Skullduggery's hunched form, surrounding him like a shell, pulsing softly. 
A tendril wrapped round the broken piece of his arm and pulled it slowly across the floor, dropping it at his knee the way an eager dog might drop the day's newspaper. Without looking up, Skullduggery threaded the arm through his sleeve, and it reattached. His gloved fingers flexed, and he got to his feet, moving like a weary man. Even though he had no lungs and no need for breath, he inhaled deeply, and as he did so, the shadows were pulled into him, disappearing into his chest. China ducked back, trying to process what she had just seen. The sudden silence tugged her from her thoughts. She dragged Sick to the corner and flung him as far as she could. His head smacked off the ground, and she followed him, making a show of smoothing down her hair. Skullduggery looked over, and she gave him an easy smile. He nodded back and picked up his hat. "'You're not finished here,' said a voice behind her. She turned. The terror and the scourge stood there, thick black liquid running from their eyes, nostrils and mouths, seeping over their skin, their clothes, through their hair. Their limbs jerked, lengthening, hands becoming talons. They reared back, giant spider legs bursting from their torsos, and then dropped forward to land on all fours. Are all eights, really. They chattered as they grew, a third eye opening on each of their heads, becoming giant black spiders with rapidly hardening armored shells. Skullduggery walked up to them, handing China the black cleaver's scythe as he passed. He held Valkyrie's stick in his hand. Smiling, China accompanied him. Chapter 72 Rescue Watching Fletcher Wren fight was an incredible experience. The boy had no skills as such. He couldn't throw a punch to save his life. But he had talent, and talent went a long way. Vex did his best to keep track of him, and it wasn't easy. Appearing and disappearing in and around crowds of wretchlings, turning up with all manner of weapons, baseball bats, sledgehammers, iron bars, and tasers. Vex even saw a few axes in there. He got knocked around a fair bit. A few times he even got jumped on. But he would always vanish and then arrive back without his assailant. Moments later, those same assailants would drop from the clouds, screaming all the way down. Fletcher teleported to the top of the wall to get his breath back, and Vex frowned. Up close, the boy looked remarkably pale. "'How are you feeling?' Vex asked. Fletcher gave him the thumbs up as he panted but Vex shook his head. You're exhausted. You need to rest. I'm fine, he said. Just give me a second. Fletcher, look at me. You need to rest. Using magic is the same as any other physical activity. It drains you. If you go back down there in this condition, you'll make a mistake and you'll wind up dead. Fletcher looked like he was about to argue, but he was too weak to start. There, Saracen said, pointing through the magnifying window. Caravari! Vex hurried over to him, scanning the ground outside the city walls. He saw him then, Caravari, in among all the wretchlings and the warlocks, but looming over them, a bald-headed mass of muscle and ferocity. Right, said Vex. Well, okay. In the flesh he's a bit bigger than I'd expected. Gracious. You're the strongest of us. Care to have a go? Gracious took a moment to peer through the window, then shook his head. God, no. No way. You see the size of him? He'd step on me. But you're really strong. To be honest, he looks like he's more Donegan's type of opponent anyway. I'd hate to keep him all for myself. I don't mind, said Donegan. No, no, I insist. I really don't mind, though. Or we could tell one of our super sorcerers to do it said Saracen. Vax looked at Fletcher. Sorry to do this to you, but do you think you can take us down there? No problem, Fletcher said, wiping the sweat from his forehead. Everyone hold on to each other. They linked up, and Fletcher teleported them into the streets, and suddenly they were surrounded by chaos and shouts, screams and roars. Hey! Saracen called, 
running up behind three Roarhaven mages who were practically glowing with newly boosted power. Caravari's out there. He's the big one. Take him out, and these guys won't have a leader. The three mages turned, and Vex muttered a curse. Only two of them were from Roarhaven. The third was English, and the last time Vex had seen him, he was strangling Caius Cavaller to death. Grimm's eyes found him, and he smiled. He barreled past Saracen, shoved Fletcher out of the way, and grabbed Vex, lifting him off his feet. I was hoping no one would kill you, he said. Wanted the pleasure of that all to myself. Gracious jumped on Grimm from behind, wrapped an arm round his throat, and there was a surge from the gate, and then the wretchlings were everywhere. Vex fell, saw Gracious and Grimm go down, had to scramble up to avoid being trampled himself. He fired an energy stream into a warlock's face and smashed an elbow into a wretchling's jaw, and all the while he was being carried back in a wave of snarling movement. And then, from that wave, a monstrous shark. Vex tried to twist away, but Grim had him. Up this close, he could see the madness in those eyes. Vex poured magic into his hand, but Grimm took hold of his wrist, crushed it. Vex's scream evolved into a string of curses as he staggered free, two wretchlings now hacking into Grimm with their blades. Vex didn't expect them to last long, but Grimm tore through them faster than he'd even anticipated. Vex tried to run, but one of Grimm's friends caught him, turned him as Grimm strode forward. He sneered and pulled back his fist for the killing blow, and then for his next trick, he turned to dust. Vex blinked. He what? Black lightning hit the sorcerer behind him, and Vex fell to his knees, eyes widening, as Stephanie Edgley emerged from the fighting, scepter in hand. She fired again. Two wretchlings exploded into dust, and the third super sorcerer took to the skies. But lightning found him, and fried him and reduced him to a grey swirling cloud that the breeze took deeper into the streets of Roarhaven. Stephanie grabbed Vex's arm, helped him stand. He held his injured wrist close to his chest and managed to smile. I thought you'd gone home. No one would lend me their car. Where's Skullduggery? Gone after Ravel. Alone? Apparently not, Vex said and looked around them. Fighting everywhere. No way out he muttered. Stephanie hefted the scepter in her grip. Good, she said. Chapter 73 War Despondent War is hell. That's what was going through Kenny's mind as he followed Slattery through the chaos. War is hell, and it's scary, and how on earth is anyone supposed to know what side they're on? He saw magic people fighting other magic people, and some of them threw fire, and others had light coming out of them, and there were these things that looked like badly stuffed monster men running about snarling at everyone. Everywhere there were explosions, and gunshots, and screaming, and energy beams, and swords, and those people in grey with the sides. It was a blur of confusion, and panic, and fear, and exhilaration, but mostly fear. Kenny saw someone he recognised. A girl in black. Valkyrie! he shouted, and grabbed Slattery's arm, pointed. Slattery nodded, his camera moving with him. Kenny was sweating, and his eyes were wide, and he knew he had a terrified expression on his face, or as Slattery had never looked so calm. He envied him. They moved along the outskirts of the fighting, keeping Valkyrie Kane in sight. The closer they got, the more faces Kenny recognised. Ravel had given him their names. Dexter Vex, Saracen Rue, Donegan Bain, Gracious O'Callaghan. They looked bloody and battered, but they fought off those misshapen monster men like it was just another day at the office. Kenny found a place to crouch, out of the way of the chaos, and he pulled Slattery in beside him. They watched Valkyrie Kane fire black lightning from a golden stick, and a monster man turned to dust as it ran for her. He heard Slattery say, Whoa, under his breath, and despite himself, he started grinning. This was amazing stuff. 
This was beyond amazing. This was going to change the world. Someone was fighting his way towards them, surging through the battle, tossing monster men and sorcerers alike out of his way. He burst through, and Kenny stared. He must have been ten foot tall, bare-chested and bare-armed, veins standing out like cords against his skin, and all the more terrifying for it. It was a mountain of a man, with a bald head and hands made for crushing. You're a very, said Dexter Vex, and whatever he said next was lost amid the racket and the screams. The big man, Caravari, walked into the middle of the group, seemingly unconcerned that he was surrounding himself with the enemy. More words were spoken, more words lost. Kenny only hoped the camera was picking them up. They'd do their best to isolate them in post-production later. He had a feeling whatever was being said was important. Gracious O'Callaghan suddenly jumped forward, the small man going up against the mountain. But when his fist connected, it shook Caravari, drove him back a few steps. Dexter Vex raised his left hand, and a beam of energy crackled into Caravari's shoulder, sending him spinning. Valkyrie missed with the black lightning, but Donegan Bane caught him in the back with another energy blast. And then O'Callaghan again, jumping high, slamming a fist into the bigger man's jaw, and Caravari fell. Kenny realized he'd been holding his breath. He let it out. Was that it? That was it. The big man was beaten. Good guys win again. Caravari reached out and grabbed O'Callaghan's ankle and flung him into Valkyrie. They went down and she lost the golden stick. Bane fired off another blast, but Caravari rolled out of the way, came up on one knee. The veins that covered his body suddenly pulsed, and a ball of energy shot from his hand into Bane's chest, taking him off his feet. Rue jumped in, swinging a sword that Caravari dodged, and Vex joined him, his right hand cradled across his chest, his left hand crackling. Kenny saw Slattery moving up behind them, and his eyes widened. How the hell had he got all the way over there? Vex fired, and the energy stream hit Caravari, rocked him but didn't drop him. Rue's sword opened a gash on Caravari's leg. Kenny waved frantically at Slattery. He was too close. He was going to get spotted. Slattery saw him but ignored him, moving around for a better angle. Cameraman. They believed the lens was a shield, protecting them from harm. He was going to get himself killed. Muttering curses, Kenny moved forward. He stayed low, keeping his eyes on the clearest route to Slattery, ignoring the fight going on right beside him. O'Callaghan was back in the action, and Bane was running in, but Kenny kept his eyes fixed straight ahead. He could marvel at it all in the editing room when it was all over. First he had to get there. He went to grab Slattery's arm, and a stray beam of energy sizzled through the cameraman's chest, killing him instantly. He fell backwards, dead with his eyes open, a look of surprise on his face. Kenny stared down at him. This was confusing. This was... He looked up, feeling the need to call a halt to everything, to point to Patrick Slattery, to tell them that something had gone terribly, terribly wrong. But all around, people fought and died, and none of them felt the need to call a time out. He didn't quite know what to do. What was the protocol at a time like this? He was vaguely aware of the possibility that he was in shock. Kenny picked up the camera, turned it, and filled the lens with Slattery's body. Then he stood up straight, turned the camera towards Caravari. As he watched the fight, Something was building in his chest. It wasn't fear any more. Not really. It was just an urge. An urge to get away. To just run. He looked into the viewfinder. He saw O'Callaghan hit Caravari, and Caravari blast Rue. Caravari's veins pulsed again, and another ball of energy barely missed Vex, exploding against the wall behind him. And there was Valkyrie, searching for the golden stick, and Caravari saw her and fired another ball of energy and exploded, and Valkyrie Kane was gone. 
Kenny took his eye away from the viewfinder. She was gone. Vaporized. Dead. Valkyrie Kane. His subject. The girl who risked her life to save the world. The girl who gave her life. Kenny turned, and he ran. And he kept on running. Chapter 74 The Thick of It Stephanie fell to the ground, and Fletcher released her, went tumbling, vanishing, and reappearing as the residual energy crackled through him. She looked up to see a forest of legs. Someone crashed into her, a sorcerer fighting a wretchling. They were all around. She was outside the wall, and they were all around. Fletcher called her name, and she reached for him, but he teleported and didn't come back. Right then. Out here all alone. A wretchling ran at her, and she jumped up. Instead of retreating against the swinging axe, she charged into him, twisting her hip and flipping him, and they both went down and went rolling. Stephanie's fingers curled around an open wound on his face, and she tore downwards, splitting the skin, and he screamed, and she tore the axe from his grip and buried it in his head. She saw the blood and jerked away. Killing with the scepter was easy. It was all black lightning and dust. It was clean. But this, this was messy and horrible, and she didn't like it. Too much could go wrong. She needed the scepter. She looked up. She could see the gate from where she was. But between the gate and where she stood, there was a war being fought. She took the mask from her pocket, pulled it on, threaded her ponytail through the back. She pulled on the gloves and zipped her jacket up to her chin. Then she tugged the axe free and ran for the gate. She swung the axe into a wretchling's legs as she passed, took an arm off another. One of them burst through the fighting. She blocked his sword with her gauntlet, and her axe bit into his neck, almost took the head off. He fell awkwardly, tearing the axe from her hands. She picked up his sword, used that to chop and stab her way through. There was a ring of cleavers, their sides a blur, their grey uniforms spattered with blood. Wretchlings ran at them and died. Then suddenly, a stream of yellow energy cut through two of them like they weren't even there. A warlock strode forward, building up to another blast. Stephanie altered course, squeezing past two fighting women. And as the warlock raised his glowing hand, she brought the sword down on his wrist. The hand fell, and light spilled from the wound, and Stephanie slashed at his midsection, and more light spilled. The warlock fell to his knees, and Stephanie turned as a screech rose up behind her, almost avoided the blade that crunched into her head. The world spun, and she went sprawling. The screeching wretchling kicked her, kicked her again, then brought his sword down into her chest. It hurt. Not as much as the blow to the head, and definitely not as much as it would have done were she not wearing these clothes. But it hurt nonetheless. She'd lost her own sword when she fell, so she scrambled up empty-handed as the wretchling swung at her. She caught the blade under her arm and stepped in, grabbed him, and kicked him at his knee. He screeched again, in pain this time, and she kicked that knee twice more before she felt it splinter. He fell back, and she ripped the sword from his hands. Through a gap in the fighting, she saw the warlock. The cut to his midsection had healed, and the injury to his wrist had closed over, leaving him with a stump. His mouth was widening, his teeth long and dark, and his eyes were on her. Stephanie turned, started hurrying for the gate. A wretchling stumbled into her, realized she was the enemy, and swung. She blocked, the impact juddering up her arms. But when she blocked the return swing, she lost her sword. She immediately lunged into him, biting at his neck as they staggered into someone else. She found a dagger in his belt and pulled it out, jammed it up into his armpit. His strength began to fade, and she tripped him, fell on top, withdrew the dagger, and used his face to push herself to her feet. He grabbed her ankle, and she kicked him, and he let her go. Before her, a sorcerer and a wretchling held each other in headlocks and lurched about like an exhausted four-legged spider. 
the point of a spear whistled by Stephanie's face. She felt the shifting air flow through the eye hole of her mask, and a retchling pulled it back, tried stabbing her again. She ducked behind the four-legged spider, and the retchling followed, cursing her, jabbing with the spear. The fighters around them closed in, and the retchling was swallowed by the surge, and Stephanie left him to it. She slashed at an arm to move it out of her way, almost tripped over a screaming man, and looked back to see the warlock barreling towards her. His left hand closed round her jacket, and he picked her up and slammed her to the ground. He knelt on top of her, mouth widening as it opened, those teeth longer and darker than they had been a moment before. She'd cut off his hand, weakened him. He needed her soul to grow strong again. The warlock lowered his head to bite and stopped. He pulled back, looked at her weirdly, and she took the opportunity to plunge the dagger between his ribs. Warm light spilled from the wound, and he jerked away, and she stabbed him again and again and pushed him off. She rolled on top of him, went to stab his chest. His good hand grabbed her wrist. She snatched the dagger into her other hand and sank the blade into his throat. He gagged. She got up. He rolled onto his side, light shining from every wound. Then the light faded and turned to blood, and the blood leaked out of him as he died. She got to the gate, squeezed through, but tripped, went stumbling, and hands reached for her, pulled her up right into the snarling face of a female warlock. Stephanie cried out as the warlock lifted her, then slammed her to the ground. Punches came next, rocking Stephanie's head from one side to the other. When the warlock realized her punches were having little effect, her fingers scrabbled at Stephanie's neck and she pulled the mask from her head. She threw it into the crowd of fighters and Stephanie tried to heave her to one side. That was her mask. Ghastly made that for her. She started to rise, but the woman punched her and this time there was nothing to disperse the impact. The fist crunched against her cheek and her teeth rattled. She fell back, her thoughts disconnected from the world around her. The warlock opened her mouth wide, wider, wider, those teeth small and sharp, that mouth getting big, bigger and bigger, and Stephanie sat up, thrust her fist into the warlock's mouth, punching the back of her throat. The warlock gagged, recoiled, her eyes bulging, but Stephanie went with her, kept her fist in there, driving her back, snarling as they rolled. Now she was on top, and she put her weight behind it, and curled her hand and jammed it down the warlock's gullet. She grabbed something. She didn't know what. Her fingers tightening round it, and she yanked, twisted it sideways, and the woman's eyes rolled in her head, and she stopped struggling. Stephanie yanked her arm out, taking a few teeth with it, and she hauled herself up and ran back to where her friends were battling Caravari. She broke through a wall of bodies. Caravari had them beaten. Saracen lay on his side, unconscious or dead. Stephanie didn't know which. Donegan was against one wall trying to stand. By the way he held his ribs, she could tell they were broken. Dexter was staggering away from Caravari, and Gracia stood, covering his retreat. He was battered and bloody, but his fists were raised. That all you got? he called out. Caravari struck him, and he flew backwards hit the wall and dropped. He took a moment in the dirt to feel sorry for himself, then pushed himself up into a sprinter's start. Stephanie watched him take a couple of deep breaths, and then he bolted, ran straight at Caravari, who hit him again, and again he flew backwards. Suddenly Fletcher was at Stephanie's elbow. You're all right, he said, panting for breath. I thought you were... I thought you'd been... Fletcher... The scepter. Where is it? Help me look for it. He shook his head. He looked weak. I'll handle this, he said. I'll tap him. Drop him from the sky. Fletcher, no. She grabbed him, but he took her hand, removed it from his arm. Stephanie, I'll be back in a second. He teleported to the spot right behind Caravari, but he swayed like he was dizzy, and the back of Caravari's hand smashed into him. Where are your heroes? Caravari asked, walking up behind Vex. Where is Ghastly Bespoke and Anton Shudder? 
or skullduggery pleasant. Where are the men you send to take down men like me? His fist came down on Vex's shoulder, and Vex cried out, dropped to his knees. Stephanie looked away, her eyes searching for the scepter. And where is Erskine, rather? Caravari asked loudly. Your great and glorious leader. Ravel's no leader of ours, Vex answered. No? Then why do you protect him? Send him out to me. I know his secrets. I know what he was trying to do. Let me look upon the face of the man who started all this. I want to see him. I want to look into his eyes as I crush everything he has built. Stay right here, Vex said, trying to stand. I'll go get him. Vex's legs gave out and he collapsed. Ravel! Caravari shouted. Show yourself! He picked up a fallen sword and crouched, letting the blade rest on the back of Vex's neck. Show yourself or I'll start taking the heads of your friends. He looked around, waiting for a reply, then shrugged and looked down at Vex. You need better friends. He's not my friend. Obviously. Caravari raised the sword. Stop! Stephanie shouted, running forward. Caravari looked at her. I was wondering what had happened to you. If you kill him, Stephanie said, you'll never find Ravel. We'll hide him away. You'll never get to him. Where is he? Don't hurt anyone else, and I'll take you to him. You have three minutes to bring him to me. No, you'll have to come with... Three minutes! Her argument died on her lips when she glimpsed the scepter, half hidden by a dead retching, a mere arm's reach away from where Caravari crouched. Okay, she said, walking forward, trying to keep her eyes locked onto Caravari's, trying to get him to focus on her. I can call him from up here, or Dexter can. And who is Dexter? The man whose head you want to take. Oh, said Caravari. Dexter! Is that true, Dexter? Can you call Ravel from up here? Vex didn't respond. In annoyance, Caravari raised the sword a little higher. No! Stephanie cried, darting closer. Stop! I can do it. Just let me do it. No tricks, girl. Or I take your head, too. No tricks, I promise, Stephanie said. In his jacket, there's a black box. If you give that to me, I can use it to signal Ravel. Caravari's free hand patted Vex's jacket, and Stephanie waited for him to glance down. Just glance away from her. That's all she needed him to. Caravari looked down at Vex, and Stephanie dived. She rolled, and Caravari's sword cut the dead wretchling in half, and Stephanie fumbled with the scepter as she kept rolling, and she fired and missed as she got to her feet and fell back as Caravari flung the blade. It missed her by a hair's breadth, and she tripped and reeled and he came for her, smacked into her, lifting her off her feet as easily as she'd swat a fly. She hit the ground and rolled and came up and backpedaled, and Caravari grabbed another sword and threw it, and it hit her shoulder and spiraled away and she toppled. But as she toppled, she fired, and Caravari dived out of the way of the black lightning. She fired again, but he grabbed a corpse, used it as a shield. It turned to dust, and he grabbed another, threw it, and Stephanie had to scramble to avoid it. A shadow fell over her, and she turned, and his huge hand closed round her throat and pinned her against the wall, and she jammed the scepter under his chin. They froze. Caravari's eyes flickered down to the black crystal, then back up to meet hers. All I have to do is squeeze, he said. All I have to do is think, she replied. I am not the monster here, girl. Ravel had my people killed. He is responsible for all of this. I know. Then let me kill him. I would. But how do I know you'll stop there? 
You've moved against the sanctuaries. You'd probably expect them to retaliate. Best thing for you to do from your perspective would be to wipe them out while you have the chance. Then what happens to the mortals? I have no interest in mortals. But I do. I want them to live normal lives. You jeopardize that. Then it appears we are at an impasse. If I kill you, you kill me. If you kill me... Black lightning flashed, and Caravari turned to dust, and Stephanie rubbed her throat. I kill you. Stephanie looked around, chose Fletcher to run to first. He groaned as she made him sit up. The left side of his face was badly swollen. His eye was closed and blood ran from his burst lips. If he was lucky, the only thing that was broken was his jaw. Look, said Vex. Stephanie looked around, then followed his gaze upwards, and her insides went cold. Vex pulled Fletcher to his feet. Fletcher, listen to me. I know it hurts. That's going to hurt a lot more in a few minutes. I know you're tired, but you have to teleport one more time, okay? You have to teleport us back up to the wall. Can you do that? Fletcher nodded, his eyes glassy. Stephanie and Vex held on, and Fletcher took a moment. He swayed again, then furrowed his brow. Just when Stephanie thought he wasn't going to be able to do it, they were on the wall. Vex put Fletcher sitting down, then joined Stephanie at the parapet, looking up. Valkyrie stood in the sky, below the clouds, looking down at them all. No, not Valkyrie. Darkus. Valkyrie was gone now. Only Darkus remained. Chapter 75 Uneven Odds A thousand questions rattled inside Stephanie's head. She chose the simplest one. What is she wearing? She's dressed like a bride of blood tears, Vex said. The wind whipped at her clothes. It must have been freezing. Darkus didn't seem to notice. How long has she been up there? Stephanie asked. I don't know, Vex said. She just drifted down out of the clouds like she wanted a better look. God knows how long she's been watching. Below Darkus, the fighting continued. The Roarhaven mages killed dozens of warlocks and wretchlings, and the warlocks and wretchlings eventually took each one of them down. The mages who flew only looked downwards, never up. The warlocks who fought only looked at their enemies, never beyond them. What's the range on the scepter? Vex asked. I... I don't know. You might not get a better shot. She's not moving. Stephanie looked at him. You don't want to try and talk to her? She's too dangerous. We take the shot when we have the shot. Maybe we should let Skullduggery know. You know as well as I do that he's not going to make the right decision. I don't want to kill Valkyrie. I want to save her. But we don't have a choice. Kill the girl, save the world. It's a simple equation. I take full responsibility for this. Do you hear me? Do it. That's an order. Stephanie raised the scepter and hesitated. She's very far away, and this thing doesn't come with the targeting system. If I miss, she'll come down here and kill us. That's probably what she's going to do anyway, said Vex. May as well give her a reason. Lightning travels at 3,700 miles per second. By the time Stephanie registered the black crystal flash, the lightning would have already struck its target. She took a deep breath and aimed, and just as she was about to fire, Darkus turned her head and looked right at her. Oh, hell, Stephanie breathed. But instead of attacking, Darkus waved, and then, like she was diving from an invisible board, she arced up and swooped down and sped towards the earth. She hit the ground with such force that Stephanie could see the shockwave that threw back warlocks and wretchlings and mages alike. Darkus stood slowly in the clearing, the battlefield suddenly quiet as both sides appraised this new player in the game. A wretchling stepped forward, 
Darkus allowed him to approach. His sword glinted in the sunlight. He sprang at her, and she killed him. Stephanie didn't see exactly what she'd done, but it involved a lot of blood, and it was over in a flash. A warlock tried next. He raised his arm, and she raised hers. His hand lit up, and a beam of white energy hit Darkus's open palm. He stepped forward, curling his body, putting everything he had into it. Darkus just stood there. When the beam failed and the warlock sagged, Darkus flicked her hand and his body came apart. One of the flying Roarhaven mages thought this was hilarious. Stephanie could hear his laughter, the laughter of a fool who saw victory because he was too dumb to recognize defeat. The warlock's head came to a rolling stop near Darkus. She picked it up, threw it. It went straight through the laughing mage's chest like a cannonball. A floating sphere of white energy drifted to Dark S as she stood there. She observed it, reached out to touch it. Stephanie was pretty sure she saw her smile, and then it exploded so brightly that she had to look away. When she looked back, Darkus was still standing there. Stunned silence. Every moment that passed, Stephanie expected to hear a battle cry as either the warlocks or the mages took the fight to Dark S. But no. No battle cry. In the end, it was Darkus herself who instigated the slaughter. Stephanie stepped to the magnifying window just in time to see Darkus gently sweep her arm to one side, her fingers curling. She suddenly snapped her arm back, and a line of warlocks split apart, limbs twisting in the air. Warlocks and wretchlings ran at her then, and she danced through them, ignoring their swords and their magic, her wounds healing even as the blows landed. Her hands were her swords, her fingers her daggers. She moved impossibly fast, spinning and whirling. Bodies and body parts went flying over the heads of the warlocks and mages who swarmed her. And swarm her they did. Stephanie watched as they piled on top of her, a mountain of men and women. For a moment she thought they might even succeed. But then she heard the screaming, and a moment later the mountain blew apart. A Roarhaven mage staggered to his feet in the stillness that followed. He sent a torrent of flame straight into Darkus's face. The flames swirled around her, but they were darkening, and when she sent a handful back to him, they were black, and they enveloped him and he burned where he stood. Stephanie had seen black flames like that before. It wasn't her memory. It was Valkyrie's. But she owned it nonetheless and she knew it as well as if she had been standing in Cassandra's steam chamber herself. In the vision, it was those black flames that had killed Stephanie's family. Warlocks and mages and retchings alike tried to run, but the unnatural fire leaped from Darkus's hands and spread through them like they were dry trees in a forest. She rose up off the ground, her arms outstretched, orchestrating the flames with her fingers. The fire swirled, and surged and roared, and wretchlings burst apart before the fire even reached them, their rotten bodies unable to cope with the heat. Warlocks and Roarhaven mages died screaming, and still the black flames spread. Stephanie watched, fascinated. She's going to kill them all, she said. Vex didn't say anything, and Stephanie felt something else stirring within her. Behind the fascination... Beneath the admiration, there was something else, a feeling growing more powerful the more she saw. It was fear. She realized. It was horror. She was looking at the end of the world, and it was wearing her face. Chapter 76 China's Final Act Every sanctuary had a hall of remembrance. Some were simple affairs, with photographs and portraits of deceased sanctuary operatives lining the walls. Some were more imaginative, with floating head projections appearing when a certain floor panel was stepped on. The hall of remembrance in Roarhaven was as lavish as China was expecting. A large room with a massive wooden pillar in its center, reaching from floor to ceiling and shaped like a volcano. 
Upon that pillar were carved hundreds of names. Erskine Ravel and Madame Mist were carving even more when China and Skullduggery walked in. Do you mind coming back later? Ravel asked without turning. He was wearing his elder robes. There are quite a few names we have to add to the list of fallen sorcerers. Once we're done here, we can talk. There won't be any talking, said Skullduggery. Ah, I see, he said. I wondered which one of us would be the first to move against the other. He put down the carving tool, scanned the pillar, and pressed a name. A full-body image of Anton Shudder appeared to his left. He pressed another name, and Ghastly Bespoke appeared. Their images were so solid that China half expected them to start moving and talking. Pretty good, aren't they? said Ravel. Very lifelike. Some of them aren't so good. Some of the conversions from old photos and paintings haven't worked out so well. But all in all, I'm happy with what we've done to honour their memories. He paused. The moment the first mage stepped out of the accelerator. I should have sent him to kill you. But you didn't, said Skullduggery. No, I didn't. Too distracted. You must think we're going to win then, right? If you expected me to move against you at any moment— the battle must be tipping in our favour. Is it? With these boosted sorcerers of yours, Skullduggery said. Maybe. Good, said Ravel. Good. Bloody warlocks, eh? Why couldn't they just have attacked Dublin like I'd planned? Skullduggery's voice was cold. You killed Ghastly and Anton for nothing. Ravel gazed back at him, and didn't say anything for a bit. When he did finally speak... He sounded so incredibly sad. You don't understand any of this. That's the worst thing. You, all of you, you think I'm another serpine or scarab. You don't see that what I've done is necessary. You don't believe me? Turn on the damn TV. Look what the mortals are doing to themselves. Look at what they've done to the world. They're bleeding the planet dry. They're poisoning the air, the land and the sea, and they know exactly what they're doing. But their politicians are so corrupt and compromised that nothing is being done to stop it. They focus again and again on the little things that divide them, and not the big things that unite them. They need to be governed. We need to step out of the shadows and take control. In the long run, they'll be happier. They'll be slaves. You keep on using that word. Ravel said, getting angry. You keep on using it. I've never used that word. None of us have. Because that's not what we're after. We don't want to rule. We need to govern. That's not our job. It should be. Think of what could have been avoided if someone like me had done this a long time ago. There would be no extremism, no fundamentalism, no terrorism, no hate crimes. People could be whatever they wanted to be. And as long as they didn't hurt anyone else, they could live in peace and happiness. But we had to stay out of sight, didn't we? Let them decide their own fate. We policed our own people and we trusted the mortals to do the same. We succeeded. We beat Mevolent. We beat his generals. But the mortals? They failed. So they've had their chance. Now we take over. No, Erskine, said Skullduggery. We don't. When the warlocks are beaten, we'll return to how things were before. Ravel shook his head. It's too late for that. Who's running the sanctuaries now? My people. Shoot me. Kill me. It makes no difference. It's bigger than me now. It's bigger than you. Bigger than all of us. The revolution cannot be stopped. There may be people like you running the sanctuaries. But the sanctuaries themselves are made up of people like me. The only way your plan would have worked is if the warlocks attacked the mortals. Then the sorcerers would have united and taken them down in full view of the world's media. But the warlocks are about to fall, thanks to your own sorcerers. Ravel smiled. You're so smart. So, so smart. And yet even you can overlook the obvious. The warlocks were just one option. Katana... And Sean and Doran, they were another. You see, 
All we need is a threat. All we need is someone big enough and powerful enough to burn mortal cities to the ground. And now we have that. With Valkyrie. Skullduggery remained very, very still. Darkus is in all the visions now, Bravo continued. All the sensitives are seeing her, clear as day. I was told about it last night. The girl with the scepter? That must be Valkyrie's reflection, am I right? You'd said it had evolved. I had no idea quite how much. Impressive. Valkyrie won't be used by you to— Skullduggery, come on, don't be ridiculous. Valkyrie is gone. You don't get to tell me what she will or will not do, and you can forget about any self-righteous anger on your part. You protected her. You knew what she was, what she would become, and you hid her from us. You allowed her to blossom, and because of that, now she's the one we'll need to kill. You won't be killing her, said Skullduggery, taking off his hat. You won't be doing anything. Ravel undid the clasp and let his robe fall. Underneath, he was wearing a suit that Ghastly Bespoke had probably made for him. So what's it going to be? he asked. Bullet to the head? Or are you going to beat me to death? I don't know, said Skullduggery, walking towards him. I'm just going to see what happens. Skullduggery lunged, and Ravel slipped by him, kicking his leg out and grabbing him when he stumbled. He threw Skullduggery against the pillar, and every carved name that Skullduggery brushed against brought a still figure into the hall. China lost sight of Madame Mist in the sudden crowd. As Skullduggery and Ravel fought, more and more dead sorcerers were appearing. China moved around them, searching for the woman in black. Her elbow passed through the arm of a maid she had once known, without any sensation at all. These images may have looked solid, but they had no more substance than a hologram. And then Madame Mist burst through, hands curled into claws. China staggered back, trying to fend her off, but Mist's strength was astonishing. She caught China with a backhand that took her off her feet and sent her sliding along the floor, through the legs of a half-dozen dead mages. As she slid, she glimpsed Skullduggery and Ravel, hanging on to each other and trading elbows and hammer fists. She got up, tapped the sigils on her arms, and flung them wide, catching mist with a wave of energy that sent her stumbling. The sigil on her palm, lighting up, China rushed in. But Mist knocked her hand away, and so China slammed into her. They hit the floor, separated, and once again China lost sight of her. Then the images started to fade, and one by one they began to disappear. China saw Mist, out of the corner of her eye, coming for her. She knocked her fists together, lighting up the sigils on her knuckles. Strength flooded her body, and when Mist reached for her, China grabbed her wrist and twisted, locking Mist's arm straight and forcing her to her knees. The sleeve of Mist's dress bunched up near her shoulder, exposing the pale skin of her arm, and with her free hand China struck the back of the elbow. Mist shrieked, and the elbow shattered and shards of bone ruptured the skin. But instead of a spray of blood, there was a swarm of spiders. They were already on China's hand, moving quickly up her arm. China pulled away, snagging Mist's veil and taking it with her. The woman's face was pale, her lips dry and cracked. Tiny spiders moved beneath her skin. Mist turned her head, and black spiders started crawling from her nostrils and her ears and squeezing out from behind her staring eyes. She opened her mouth, vomited out more of them, the torrent hitting China in the chest. China slipped and fell and covered her face with her hands, but the spiders were already there, trying to get past her tightly pressed lips, scuttling over her screwed shut eyes. They were in her hair, in her clothes, crawling all over her, and still they came, the weight pressing down. She couldn't see and couldn't breathe. She tore handfuls of spiders away from her face but it was like clawing at a landslide. She tried to get up, squashing them beneath her, but slipped on the mess and fell again, grunting on impact, her lips parting slightly. And then the spiders were in her mouth. She kept her teeth locked together, but they were there, filling her cheeks, surging down her throat, and she was choking now and going to die. 
The least she could do was take mist with her. Her hand went to her chest, her middle finger pressing through her clothes to the point of her sternum. She traced it down, following the tattoo that she could feel glowing to life, as all of her other tattoos started glowing also. The tattoo swerved left, and her finger followed, then swirled and cut across, and she felt the heat rise from within her. And as she finished tracing the symbol she had cut into her own skin so long ago, the heat burst from her. It incinerated her clothes, her shoes, the scant makeup on her face, and the light polish on her nails. And it incinerated the spiders, too, burned them all, outside and in, turned them to ash, and turned the ash to vapor. She opened her eyes and her mouth and sucked in air that turned superheated and scorched her throat and lungs. She stood, the ground melting beneath her bare feet. She looked at her arms, looked down at herself. She glowed. Her body was a furnace. She could feel her eyes starting to boil. Madame Mist was struggling to stand, dismayed at the loss of so many of her spiders, clutching her ruined arm, so pale and so frightened. China reached out with both hands, clamping her fingers round Mist's shoulders. Mist tried to scream, but she was dead before she could make a sound. China let her go, and she crumpled, a smoking, charred, blackened thing, not even recognizable as a corpse. China allowed herself a single moment of satisfaction, of something approaching smugness, and turned and saw Skullduggery looking at her. What have you done? he said. She could barely hear him over the roar in her ears. Ravel was on his knees, his hands shackled behind his back. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I'm sorry for what I did to your family. He shook his head. Turn it off. Whatever you're doing. Deactivate it. She gave him a smile. She wondered how it looked through the heat haze. There is no off switch, I'm afraid. And don't come any closer. Nothing can withstand its power. I added this tattoo once I learned that you had returned from the dead. It was Mevelin's idea, actually. A last resort. He helped me craft it. If ever you had found out what I had done, and you'd got your hands on me, I was to use this to kill both of us. That's insane. Not really. Burning myself alive from the inside was a far less scary thought than what you do to me. China. Shut up, Scudluggery. You talk too much. Has anyone ever told you that? Shut up and listen. I'm sorry for the part I played in the murder of your child and the woman you loved. I neither deserve nor expect your forgiveness. I don't even want it. Her mouth was dry. It was getting harder to speak. I deserved this. I deserve the pain that's going to arrive any second now. I'll get you to a doctor. It won't do any good. Then we'll bind you. With what? I'll melt any shackles that get close. For God's sake, there has to be something I can do. I can't just watch you die in front of me. Turn away, and you won't have to. No, he roared, then stepped back, standing straight. No, he said again, calmer this time. You did terrible things hundreds of years ago. So did I. I'm no hypocrite. I can't hate you any more than I can hate myself. She laughed despite the pain that was building. Skullduggery, darling, you do hate yourself. Nonsense, he said. I love myself. I think I'm hilarious, and you're not going to die. Do you know why I like you, you dear, sweet man? Because while you may not have ever loved me, you have never bored me, either. That's a rare quality, and one which I have always found most attractive. I need you, China. Oh, I have longed to hear those words. I need you to help me get Valkyrie back. Followed by those. 
I wish I had more time to think of something suitably pithy to leave you with, but unfortunately the pain is becoming quite distracting. Goodbye, Skullduggery. Of course, even on the brink of death, things still refused to go her way. Darkus walked into the hall, successfully stealing China's big moment away from her. China almost laughed. Valkyrie! Skullduggery started. It was lifted off his feet by an invisible hand and slammed back against the far wall. China's eyesight was failing, so she couldn't be sure but for some reason Darkus seemed to be dressed like a bride of blood tears as she walked up to Ravel. You killed my friend, Darkus said with Valkyrie's voice. Yes, I did, said Ravel, standing. I didn't want to have to do it, but a change had to be made, and I— He was your friend, too, Darkus interrupted. But you killed him. Look at you, he said. Look at your power. Look at the things you've done. Why should you have to live in a world run by mortals? Why should any of us? We're stronger than them. We're better than them. Join us, Darkus. You're one of us. China's insides were cooking themselves. Her strength was almost used up. It was all she could do to stay standing. And her eyes... Her pale blue eyes, her beautiful pale blue eyes, were already sizzling in their sockets. But even so, she could see the look on the face of Darkus. I'm one of you, Darkus repeated. Is that what you think? You look at me like we're equals? The gap between you and a mortal is far less than the gap between you and me, Erskine. To someone like me, a mortal could be viewed as an insect, but a sorcerer? A sorcerer is only a slightly bigger insect. Ravel looked at her, his face unreadable. Do what you came here to do, Darkus. I'm not going to beg for my life. I don't deserve your mercy. What mercy? But no, death is too good for someone like you. You know what isn't too good for you, though? You know what's just right? Pain. Lots and lots of pain. Darker smiled, and a small ball of light started to glow between her eyes. It moved slowly down, glowing through her skin, moving down her throat. It did a little twirl when it reached her clavicle, and she giggled, and then it moved under her clothes and off to one bare shoulder and down her arm to her hand, to her fingertip, where it stayed, pulsing gently. Darkus tapped Ravel's forehead, and the little ball of light transferred to him. He jerked away, panicking, as it pulsed and pulsed again, and faded. Ravel frowned. Darkus smiled. Ravel's shriek caught China by surprise as his body snapped back. He fell sideways to the floor, convulsing. Agony, said Darkus. Constant agony for twenty-three hours a day. No painkillers or sedatives will do anything to alleviate what you're feeling. If and when your body compensates, if you find that you're starting to get used to it, the pain will increase. One hour a day, It'll stop. You can eat, drink, sleep if you can. But mostly you'll just dread the agony returning. Darkus looked up, forgetting all about Ravel as he kicked and thrashed on the ground. She looked at China. What have you done to yourself? She asked softly. China took a step forward. And another. If she had to die... The least she could do was take Darkus with her. She held her hand out. Darkus came to meet her. The closer she got, the clearer she got. It was Valkyrie's face. Those were Valkyrie's eyes. China took her hand back an instant before Darkus could clasp it. Darkus smiled. 
You are an interesting woman, China Sorrows. In your last moments, you might have a chance to stop me and save the world. And you hesitate. China tried saying Valkyrie's name, but her tongue was frying in her mouth. Who am I to you? Darkus asked. Who was I? The daughter you never had? The sister you always wanted? Was I a friend? A plaything? A chance at redemption? China's vision failed. She could feel her eyes about to burst. Darkas's voice in front of her. You know who you were to me? A mystery. An enigma. A rare and beautiful creature. To be admired and... Oh, China. You are magnificent. Two words. China wanted to say two words. She only wanted to say, I'm sorry as she reached out through the darkness, found Darkus's arm, and closed her hand round it. Oh, dear, she heard Darkus say. Did you really think that would work? China tightened her grip, but she had no more strength, and her knees were about to buckle, and she stepped back, and then there was something cool pressing against her chest. It's going to be okay, she heard Darkus whisper. The darkness shifted to gloom, and then brightness, and she had eyes again, and she could see Darka standing there, her left hand sucking the heat from China's body. It filled Darka now, making her glow, incinerating her clothes, burning through the gold bands in her hair, turning the arm bracelet to ash. The necromancer ring burst open as it disintegrated, the shadows curling and twisting madly. China stepped back, repelled by the heat. But in an instant it was gone, absorbed, and Darkus stopped glowing. The twisting shadows latched onto her, flowed across her strong arms and her broad shoulders like oil, down her chest and her belly and her long legs, covering her body like a second skin. China remembered the young girl who had walked into her library six years earlier and compared her to the young woman who stood before her now. That dimple, those eyes, that smile. So similar, so incredibly different. Skullduggery approached slowly. Valkyrie, he said. Darkus turned to him. She's gone. She's not even a quiet little voice in the back of my mind any more. I won't tell you how easy it was to take over. You don't want to hear things like that. Let me talk to her. There is no her any more. There's only me. There are no tricks you can pull to change that. You've used them all up. Skullduggery tilted his head. Then what do you want? I've seen the visions. I've seen you kill and destroy. I've seen what you do to Valkyrie's family. My family, Dark has corrected. And I've seen that too, remember? But I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt anyone. I just want to live. If you're really not a threat, come with me. Let us run some tests, so you can figure out how to stop me, imprison me. No thanks. I'm out and I have no intention of going back in. But I'm not your enemy, Skullduggery. I'm still the same girl I always was. Just, you know, don't stand in my way. What happens if I do? She smiled as the ceiling melted above her. I don't know, she said. But won't it be fun finding out? She rose up through the ceiling and was gone. Chapter 77 The Sacrifice For a city that had just come into being, Roarhaven had its fair share of ups and downs. Its glorious unveiling, its citizens so excited, its gates ready to open to tens of thousands of new sorcerers flooding in from around the world. And now look at it. Quiet, subdued, anxious. Its outer wall, originally so imposing, so strong, was now a smoking, cratered, fragile shell. 
Its people no longer strolled with confidence through its broad streets. Now they hurried, their eyes furtive and darting, wary of the cleavers who were no longer under Erskine Ravel's control. Every single one of these people knew of Ravel's plan. Even the children knew. Their parents told them stories of what was to come as they tucked them in at night. They were all complicit in Ravel's crimes. They all shared his guilt. What the hell do we do now? Vex muttered. He stood with Saracen on the steps of the sanctuary. The bodies had been cleared from the streets and the blood had been washed away, but the memories left strains everywhere he looked, and the people, the few to pass within sight, kept their heads down, like they didn't want to be noticed. How about we build up another shield, said Saracen. But this time it's to keep people in, not out. We charge everyone here as accessories to the murders of Ghastly Bespoke and Anton Shudder, and we turn Roarhaven into a prison. See how they like it then. Bex didn't say anything. He didn't say how much he agreed with this idea. The Bentley pulled up and Skullduggery got out joined them at the top of the steps, and they all walked into the sanctuary without uttering another word. Vex didn't like when Skullduggery went quiet. Bad things tended to happen. It took them longer than necessary to get to the accelerator room. The corridors were different in this new palace. The rooms were switched around, and everything was so much bigger than before. They passed the medical wing, where Dr. Sinekdosh was now in charge, and picked up the monster hunters along the way, who already had their bags packed for Tokyo. Fletcher Wren had offered to teleport them straight there, and possibly help out if he could. He didn't want to go back to Australia. Not yet. They eventually got to the accelerator room, and the engineer swiveled its head to them as they entered. Good afternoon, it said. Is there something I can help you with? When Skullduggery didn't respond, Vex spoke up, grateful for the opportunity to tackle problems that could be solved. One or two things, actually. These mages whose magic has been boosted, some are dead, some are in shackles, some are on the run. How long will they stay at this power level? By Dr. Rote's calculations, no more than five weeks. Donegan made a face. Five weeks? These people are bordering on insane as it is. Is there any way to, I don't know, de-boost them? Not that I am aware, the engineer said. Their power levels will begin to fluctuate after the first two weeks, however. If you can catch them while their power has dipped, they would be easier to apprehend. Wonderful, Saracen muttered. So there's nothing you can do? or the accelerator can do to help us? Vex asked. Regretfully, nothing. Vex sighed. Okay, then. In that case, the fourteen days are up, so we'd like you to shut the accelerator down now, please. Of course, said the engineer. Which one of you shall be contributing? Skullduggery looked round. I'm sorry? Oh, yes, the engineer said. I lacked a piece of information when we last spoke of this. Very well. I shall explain. It is quite simple. The accelerator can be powered down without incident for up to four weeks from its initial activation. We have obviously missed that deadline. After that, the deactivation requires a substantial sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? A soul the engineer said. Willingly given. Saracen frowned. What? The chosen person steps inside the accelerator thusly. The engineer stepped onto the dais and turned to face them. Death is instantaneous and, one would imagine, painless. Upon their death, their soul is released. The engineer mimed something flying from its chest and is then used to close the rift between this reality and the source of all magic, thus deactivating the accelerator. Gracious crossed his arms. He did not look impressed. Someone has to sacrifice himself. 
That's a tad drastic, isn't it? As far as off switches go. Is there any way to bypass it? Vex asked. Is there a plug we could pull? The engineer stepped out of the accelerator. There is no bypass. There is no plug. It must be a soul, willingly given. How would the accelerator know if it's willingly given or not? I would know, said the engineer. It is only with my permission that the soul can be used, and my creator was quite specific in his requirements. He said this machine must only be activated as a last resort. He reasoned that only a noble person of pure intent would go through with it once he was warned of the price that must be paid. But you weren't here to warn us, said Saracen. So that's your fault. Indeed it is. But that does not change the fact that it must be a soul willingly given. Well, Donegan asked, anyone here willing to sacrifice their life to shut this down? Gracious took one step backwards. I have uh, a lot of online subscriptions that depend on me. How long have we got to decide? Skullduggery asked. When is the accelerator going to rupture? Twenty-three days, eight hours, three minutes and twelve seconds, said the engineer. Vex stared. So, not only do we have Darkus on the loose, he said, and not only do we have nineteen supercharged sorcerers running around and virtually every sanctuary on the planet in a state of chaos, but now we have twenty-three days to decide who's going to kill themselves to save the world? How the hell are we meant to manage any of that? We'll manage it the same way we manage everything, China Sorrows said from behind them, and they turned to her as she stood in the doorway, as beautiful as always, with extraordinary amounts of style and good grace. We don't even have a council of elders any more, said Saracen. How will we coordinate? Who's in charge? From now on, we won't be needing a council, China said. I think we've gone as far as we can with that approach. Wouldn't you agree? And as for who's in charge, I'd have thought that would be obvious. Vex frowned. You? Unless you can think of someone better suited to the task. Maybe yourself? Or Saracen? Or Skullduggery, perhaps? If any of you would like to take on the overwhelming responsibilities of the post and forgo a life of freedom and adventure, please be my guest. Vex didn't say anything. Neither did Saracen or Skullduggery. China smiled. That's what I thought. Any other objections? No? You're quite sure? Very well, then. I hereby accept, with great reluctance and humility, the post of Grand Mage, and I swear to only use my newfound powers to protect the magical and mortal communities of Ireland, and possibly to extract some small bits of personal vengeance against those who have wronged me in the past. She clapped her hands. There. It's settled. All right, gentlemen. First order of business is tracking down the supercharged sorcerers. Mr. Vax... Mr. Rue, they are your responsibility. I'm sure the monster hunters will lend their assistance when and if you require it. China looked at Skullduggery, and her voice softened. Detective Pleasant, you have one task, and one task only. Find Darkus. Stop her if you can. Kill her if you must. Chapter 78 After the War Stephanie's parents had been relieved to have her home. It wasn't that they didn't think she was a good driver, they said. It was just that whenever she got behind the wheel, they started to worry. It was silly, they knew it was, she had her full license, she was as good as anyone else, and they knew she was a sensible girl. But hey, worrying was a parent's job. Stephanie couldn't understand how Valkyrie had come to the conclusion that her folks were ready to hear the truth. They worried enough about the most ordinary, mundane things in everyday life. If they knew about the magic and the fighting and the danger and the death, they'd never sleep again. But she was home, 
and that was the only thing that mattered. She'd survived. She'd done her bit to stop the warlocks, to stop Ravel, and her family were free and happy and safe, at least for the moment. While her mum made them lunch, Stephanie played with Alice in the living room. She sat on the floor, adjusted the bag strap on her shoulder, and dumped out a tray of building blocks. Alice went at them with glee, flinging them over her head. They hit the wall, the mirror, banged against the new patio door that had been put in to replace the one Valkyrie had smashed through. Careful now, Stephanie said. You don't want to break anything, do you? Alice cackled, threw the last block, and Stephanie grinned, grabbed her and started tickling. Alice howled with laughter and Stephanie rolled onto her back, blowing raspberries into her sister's neck. She eventually let go, and Alice clambered off, then sat on the ground beside her. Stephanie stayed where she was, looking up at the ceiling, and when she found her mind drifting back to the events of the last few days, she caught herself. Valkyrie was gone, and Stephanie had inherited her family. She had what she'd always wanted, and she wasn't going to waste a moment of her new life by thinking about death and destruction when she didn't need to. Alice was unusually quiet. Stephanie turned her head and her heart lurched. Her bag had fallen open, revealing the scepter, and Alice's little fingers tapped against the black crystal. Stephanie moved without thinking. Snatching the bag away, she whirled to her knees. Alice burst out crying, and Stephanie stared, wide-eyed. Despite her racing pulse and the surging adrenaline that made every nerve-ending jangle, Stephanie picked up her sister and held her close as she stood. Oh, I'm sorry, she said, talking softly. I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to scare you. She hadn't even needed to. Alice was descended from the last of the ancients the same as Valkyrie, which meant she could touch the black crystal without dying. Stephanie hadn't dared to touch it herself. She didn't know if that rule applied to reflections, no matter how evolved they had become. Here, she said, lifting the bag a little higher so that Alice could reach into it. This is the scepter of the ancients. See the crystal? You can touch it if you want. There you go. The crystal was made by the faceless ones, these horrible old gods, and anyone who touches it turns to dust, apart from the ancients, apart from you. You're a very special girl, Alice, but I promise to do everything I can to make sure that you have a normal life. I won't let you turn out like Valkyrie did, I swear. Kiss? Alice looked up at her with her big eyes and tilted her head forward so that Stephanie could kiss it. When Alice moved her head back again, Stephanie glanced behind her, saw Skullduggery Pleasant standing in the back garden. She put Alice down, let her run around collecting the building blocks, and she climbed the stairs and went into her bedroom. She closed the door behind her and opened the window, then stepped back. Skullduggery sat on the sill. There's a problem with the accelerator, he said. The way his head was turned, the way his hat fell, all she could see was his jaw. Shutting it down won't be quite as straightforward as we'd hoped. It'll require a sacrifice. She nodded. I'm sure you'll be able to handle it. I'll think of something. Ravel was transported to prison this morning. They tried to sedate him, but nothing works. Right. The children of the spider went with him, and seven others. The investigation into who else knew about his plan is ongoing. Okay. We decided not to go after his people in the other sanctuaries. We know they were a part of it, and we'll be using that against them to ensure we're never attacked again. There are people now. Well, said Stephanie, that works out well for everyone. Skullduggery nodded. The warlocks have gone into hiding again, and we have teams of cleavers rounding up any remaining wretchlings. They won't get far. We have perimeters set up from... Skullduggery? Stephanie cut in. What do you want? He raised his head, looking at her. 
We don't know where Darkus is, he said. We don't know where she vanished to after Africa, and we don't know where she's gone now. Stephanie patted her bag. That's why I'm carrying the scepter around with me everywhere I go. Do you think she'll go after her family? Stephanie hesitated. No, she said. But she might come after me. That's what I thought. Stephanie, I need your help. We have to find her. We have to bring Valkyrie back. Valkyrie's gone. I don't believe that. Stephanie went to her desk, turned on the radio to mask their voices. It doesn't matter what you believe, because you don't know what it was like living with Darkus in your head. Valkyrie knew that one more slip would be all it took. She doesn't have the strength to survive. A big part of her doesn't even want to. You're lying. No, I'm not. She loves that power. She loves becoming Darkus. It's so incredibly freeing for her. Then help may stop her. But you don't want to stop her, do you? If we find her, if I have the chance to kill her, will you let me? Skullduggery turned his head slightly away from her. If I can't get through to Valkyrie, then yes. Not good enough, Stephanie said. You tried talking to her, it didn't work. If you try to talk to it again, Darkus will kill us both. We won't have time for your way and then my way. We'll only have time for one way. So, if I help you and we find her and I have a chance to kill her, will you let me do it? Skullduggery didn't answer for the longest time. Then he said, Yes. Stephanie nodded. Okay, then. You've got yourself a partner. Chapter 79 The Package Kenny was done. He'd already cleared the research out of his apartment. The walls were now bare, the floors were uncluttered, and there was suddenly space on the table to put a coffee cup. He'd cleaned out his hard drive, wiped his browsing history, deleted every related file that existed online. And then he took Patrick Slattery's footage and photographs, and he destroyed every last bit. Almost every last bit. He did a little editing. It took him a few hours. It wasn't pretty, and the seams were obvious and amateurish. But he got it done with what little skills he possessed, and then he destroyed everything that remained. He lit a small bonfire at the back of his building and every few minutes he'd add something else to the flames as he stood there. It occurred to him that he was watching his career go up in smoke. He was okay with that. He had reached a point that so few journalists reach, and he'd found himself with a choice to make. Reveal the truth and watch the world change, or hide it forever and let the world continue to spin. Before the Battle of Roarhaven, He'd wanted to change the world. The people deserved to know, he reckoned. The story needed to be told. But should a story be told simply because it's there? Should a truth be revealed simply because it's uncovered? He'd taken it upon himself to expose this hidden culture of magic, and he hadn't looked any further than that. But now he knew. If these sorcerers were forced to go public, people would get hurt. People would die. Normal people would rise up with their guns and tanks and bombs, and sorcerers would fight back with their energy beams and fireballs, and more people like Patrick Slattery would die. Slattery had had a wife. Kenny didn't even know her name. He'd never spoken to Slattery about anything other than the story. Slattery's wife would never know what had happened to her husband, and that burned through Kenny's soul. There was nothing he could do about that but there was something he could do about Valkyrie Kane. Over the last year, he'd got to know her in a way. She'd been a normal girl, plucked from her ordinary life, thrust into a world of magic and death and terror. She had fought the forces of darkness, and she hadn't asked for rewards or recognition or parades in her honor. She had fought because she was a good person, a decent person, a hero, and she had died a hero's death in a blinding flash of light. That was all Kenny had needed to see. 
That was all he could stand. He'd found a car and he'd fled, leaving the fighting in the rearview mirror. If the world was going to be overrun by terrifying, powerful beings like that Caravari, Kenny wanted to be with his own people when it all went down. He got home, watched the news, waited, slept, waited again. And then he figured that Caravari had been stopped, and that the world had been saved, that Valkyrie Kane's sacrifice had not been in vain. He knew then that his career was over and he only had one more thing to do before he quit being a journalist forever. Valkyrie Kane was a hero, and those closest to her deserved to know that. When the last bit of evidence was burned, he got into his car and he drove out of Dublin City. He got where he needed to go, and he sat there for two hours. Finally, he lifted the package from the passenger seat and got out. Stomach churning, he crossed the quiet road, walked up to the front door and knocked. He waited. He resisted the urge to turn and run and forget about this. And he waited. Finally, the door opened. Hi, Desmond Edgley said. Can I help you? That was Skullduggery Pleasant, Last Stand of Dead Men, by Derek Landy, read by Stephen Hogan, produced by ID Audio for Harper Audio. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.